Alex Bale eight new mini theories. Secret alien jellyfish invasion happening in Bikini Bottom. Mr. Krabs has been replaced by a fake imaginary doppelganger. Larry the Lobster is secretly a Bikini Bottom drug lord kingpin. And many, many more mind-blowing reveals in these eight final SpongeBob mini theories. Uh, I originally posted these theories as a part of my giant four hour long final SpongeBob conspiracy compilation, but some people said it was kind of annoying to skip through the old content just to find the new theories, so I'm reposting just the mini theories here for your convenience. And also to milk these theories for every cent I can. Hello. Hello. W I like money. I worked hard on these mini w theories. Milkish. I think I deserve that. And hey, hey, after you're done, still go check out. I ain't gonna lie. He eating on that four hour joint. Yeah, facts. 1.3. He eating on this one too. Hey, I ain't gonna 000. lie. I ain't gonna lie. We about to eat on this four hour joint too. What you mean? What you mean? What you mean by that? Okay, all right. Check out that compilation because the old <laughs> theories have a ton of new content in them too. Please enjoy the final SpongeBob theories I will ever post and stick around till the end to hear what other shows and movies I will be covering next. Thank you. Let's begin. So, here's a question I've been asked from the very start of making these Spongebob theories. How is there fire underwater? It's probably one of the most obvious contradictions in this show, and the creators will usually go out of their way to draw attention to the fact that it doesn't make any sense. At least it's warm around the fire. Hey, if we're underwater, how can there be a... Whoever sent this obviously has no idea about the physical limitations of life underwater. Might as well throw these in the fire. So finally, I will give the people yeah. my answer to this infamous age-old question, how is there fire underwater? It's just a cartoon. It's just a, yeah, I'm not just, kidding, that's that's actually my answer. SpongeBob- They literally just made fun of it. So no. It's just a cartoon. Y'all don't appreciate this hug. What are we doing, uh, trying to laugh? Uh, could be this week. When we gambling? Could be later. It's not the real world. We've it's a cartoon. It has its own cartoon logic where absurd things like fire being underwater can happen. But that doesn't mean there's nothing here to theorize about. Just okay. because it's cartoon logic doesn't mean it's not still logic. If you pay close attention, you can see that there is a consistent internal logic and rules to how this cartoon world really works. And I think how Spongebob cartoon logic works is best explained in the season 3 episode, Idiot Box. In this episode, Spongebob and Patrick spend the day playing inside of a box, but Squidward keeps hearing impossible sound effects coming from it. SpongeBob? Yeah. And how what are they creating these sound there? effects? How are you two making those noises? Imagination. Yeah. With their imagination. Yeah. Wow, and this is key to understanding how the sp Did you just hit your toe, bro? Yes. You just hit your toe, bro. Ah. Oh. <laughs> he wanted to. He wanted to give one of the SpongeBob Whoa. curses sounds. Oh. <laughs> Wait. Do we got it? Here we go. Three, two, one. <laughs> That's all you need to get out. Uh, no, nah, it hurt. Bro. Okay. I'm. A, I'm cool. We you can cool. Think, right, get through man, it. Man, man. SpongeBob it world really works. This episode tells us that anything that is imagined in Spongebob can physically come to life. We can see this imagination rule in every single episode of the show. The most obvious example of this is when a character is thinking and a thought bubble appears above their head. But in Spongebob, these thought bubbles are real physical things. Other characters can see and physically yeah. interact with them. Wait, wait, hold on! My pen is out of ink. Plankton! You'll never get me formula. Not even Talking in a flashback. Ah! You getting bullied through a thought bubble is crazy! Because things imagined in Spongebob come to life. And this goes far beyond just thought bubbles. It explains how characters are constantly getting new props and costumes out of nowhere. Where did Spongebob suddenly get this hat and sign? Where did he get this glove or all of these costumes that instantly appear and disappear? It's because Spongebob is imagining all of these props. Uh, okay, this can okay, be used okay. to explain almost every single absurd gag Simple. in this show. Wait, Patrick, you're supposed to let me win, remember? Oh yeah. <laughs> Patrick is imagining himself getting beat up here. Said it's gonna be a good one, just wait and see. SpongeBob is imagining the sun talking to him and burning his bedroom. And SpongeBob and Patrick are imagining that fire is able to exist underwater. And if you still don't believe- Stuff like this 
had our imagination going crazy. Nah, facts. You be jumping up, ah, fly, ah. That's why my ah. imagination ain't never cut off, bro. Because mm, you just had it in multiple variations. Yeah. And then now, I'm dreaming about people. Okay, yeah. They woke. You really let that TTS wake you up like that? I was like, she's here. <laughs> she came back. Oh, damn. Believe me, damn. look what happens when Patrick questions the logic behind the fire. Welcome in, hey, JD. If we're underwater, how can there be a... The moment they start doubting the logic of the fire, mm. it disappears because they're no longer able to imagine it. Imagine, yeah. This rule also seems to be limited okay. by how imaginative each character is. Squidward, who never even got the idiot box to work, rarely ever manifests any imaginations. While Spongebob, Probably, arguably bro. the most imaginative character in the show, has created living characters like Doodle Bob and Bubble Buddy using his imagination, both of which oh. have ended up continually reappearing throughout the entire show. Bubble Buddy even went on to create an entire oh, bubble town full of geez. bubble citizens all stemming from Spongebob's imagination. This theory also explains why Mrs. Puff gets trapped in so many delusions. They are literally manifesting around ah. her because of her imagination. Okay, okay. But Makes what's the sense. point of explaining all of this? Even if you didn't know the exact mechanics of it, you probably already understood that random stuff can just appear and disappear in a cartoon. I'm not really telling you anything groundbreaking. But once you fully understand this idea, it adds a whole new context to so many things in this show. One of the most interesting being how dreams seem to affect the world, specifically okay. SpongeBob's dreams. In season one sleepy time, SpongeBob dreams about finally getting his license, but then he crashes and Mrs. Puff takes his license away. And this is exactly what happens later in the season two episode, No Free Rides. Mrs. Yep. Puff gives him a license, instantly regrets it, and after SpongeBob crashes his car, Mrs. Puff takes his license away. So did SpongeBob's dream predict this event, or did his imagination literally cause it to happen? Okay, you're not convinced yet? Don't worry. This is far from the only instance of this happening. In okay. Season 2 Procrastination, Spongebob oh, dreams good, about his pineapple burning up. down, which happens later good in up. Season 9 Gary's New Toy. In Season 5 Roller Cowards, he dreams about crashing on a Glove World roller coaster. And then it happens in Season 10 Don't Wake Patrick. Even dreams we don't see come true. In Squids on a Bus, Squidward becomes a bus driver for the day, and Spongebob says this. I've always dreamed one day I'd board a bus and see you dream. Driving it. Now, I already know. I ever wonder just how, just how, uh, I think your uh, right uh, it is, just how calculated they actually were. Like, how much of this is coincidence? Mm -hmm. is and how I've much is it actually all the time. calculated? I think about it all the time. Because it's like maybe some stuff was coincidence. Which is why it don't exactly line up, but then they took advantage of the fact that it was a coincidence yeah. and made it calculate it later. Yeah. So that's why, yeah. But you're gonna say, SpongeBob's a they very long know. running show. A lot of these basic plots were bound to happen eventually, right? You know, it's like how The Simpsons can predict the future. But. In Season 4's Fear of Krabby Patties, Spongebob dreams about everyone in the Krusty Krab turning into giant killer Krabby Patties. <laughs> that is a very weird and specific plot, and yet that's still exactly what happens seven seasons later in Krabby Patty seven Creature seasons. Feature, when Mr. Krabs feeds people experimental Krabby Patties and turns everyone into giant mutant Krabby Patty monsters that try to hunt Spongebob down. It seems like all of Spongebob's dreams eventually manifest into real life because of the unlimited power of his imagination. Okay, that's all pretty interesting, right? But you want to know something really crazy? While researching this theory, I discovered something insane. Honestly, it, it may be one of the craziest discoveries I've ever found in this show. Are you ready? In the season 6 special, Truth or Square, all of the characters get trapped inside of the massive ventilation system beneath the Krusty Krab. There's an entire network of tunnels and air ducts underground. <laughs> At a certain point, Mr. Krabs gets separated from the group. A crossroads! I'll go this way, and SpongeBob, you lead him down that way! That was stupid, Mr. Krabs. That was dumb. SpongeBob then takes a break to tell the story of when Mr. Krabs told him the Krabby Patty secret formula. This reminds me of the time Mr. Krabs confided okay. in me the Krabby Patty recipe. Appreciate the sub. Mr. Krabs called me into his office. Ghost hood. And then 
something really strange happens. After the story, we cut back to the group, and Mr. Krabs is somehow back with them after previously being separated. I I'm serious, there there's no scene of them being reunited. Never He's just reunited. gone and then back somehow, and it's never explained in this episode. I mean, what was even the point of wasting time and money animating them split up if they were just gonna immediately bring Mr. Krabs back without any explanation? I'll go this way, and Spongebob, you him down that way. You could literally remove the scene of Mr. Krabs separating from them, and the episode would make total sense. But, wait a second. Look at how Spongebob's story ends. You can never tell another living soul. Wait, wait, hold on! Plankton! You'll never get me formula, not even in a flashback. Spongebob. Imaginary Mr. Krabs from inside of the Thought Bubble he grabs Plankton bubble, and bro. throws him down a vent. Thought. And when we cut back, Mr. Krabs is suddenly back sitting with the group. The obvious explanation is that this isn't the real Mr. Krabs. This is still the imaginary Krabs from SpongeBob's story who came to life. And the real Mr. Krabs is still somewhere lost inside of the Krusty Krab vents, and they never switched back. The Mr. Krabs they escape with is not the real Mr. Krabs. And every time we see Mr. Krabs after this season 6 episode, he's actually a fake imaginary doppelganger. And the real one is still trapped beneath the Krusty Krab somewhere. It's Do you got proof of this? Do you got proof of this? Right? Do you have proof of this? If you have proof of this, Alex, you're the GOAT. I'll keep going. If you have, I don't, proof will be nuts. You know, I don't really have much else to say. <laughs> proof will be nuts. If you have proof of this, he's insane. You want to come sit? No, I don't think. Oh. Uh, you already even pop out. Yeah. It looked like another car was pulling up. Uh, some it's the re- um, yeah, proof would be, proof would be. The reason why Mr. Krabs in later seasons has become such a one-dimensional character, going from someone who was cheap but still genuinely cared about his employees and family to a one-note cartoon villain, it's because he actually. That's how SpongeBob sees him. He was replaced by a flat, oh. imaginary imitation of the original. And I know what you're gonna say. There, there's no way SpongeBob would imagine him to be that way. Well, think That's again. Show me what you got. Look at me. I'm Mr. Krabs. I love money. Every night I tuck me all in and tell it a bedtime story. Oh, what's that you say? Me daughter Pearl needs an operation? I'll do it myself and save a nickel. That'll do, SpongeBob. The fact that SpongeBob is dumb and smart as hell at the same time. I don't think that's smart. I think that's more so like... Well, like aware, yeah. like like hyper aware, yeah. Because like, if somebody's really as dumb as SpongeBob in real life, they not that hyper aware. To, well, I don't to, think to be like to be, to like Patrick is dumb. Well, okay, 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 okay. He's dumb, not stupid, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Patrick <laughs> is, is stupid. stupid. Yeah. <laughs> and that is the imagination theory. Seven more okay. mini theories left. Woo! Great job. Uh, just a heads up, some of these new mini theories kind of build off of my old Spongebob conspiracies. So if you've never seen my television theory, I recommend watching that first. So there's this viral image that's gone around the internet that points out a really funny detail about this show. There seems to be a frightening number of miniature dead human skeletons in yeah. Spongebob. And it's a really funny observation, but it's also really strange because why are there a bunch of mini dead human skeletons in Spongebob? <laughs> like, the animators already have a generic design for a fish skeleton. Why are they going out of their way to make these human skeletons? They're obviously much more detailed and harder to draw. And this is something we see in both early and modern Spongebob. Yeah. Well, I think the television theory actually provides a pretty good ex- Oh, the camera crew. Oh, it's the camera crew. Explanation for this. We know there's tons of human scuba divers secretly filming the show, yep, and it even yep. looks like some of them are fish sized. And we know there is shrinking technology in this show. So, like I've already said, I think it's fair to assume. 
And they truth been. be told, Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy. Are they really mermaids? Because when we saw the mermaids, they look nothing like yeah. Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy. Are Two they just humans that wanted the fame, so they... No. Humans shrunk themselves down to better film these characters undetected. Which explains why we see so many tiny Let's human skeletons. Away. They're the crew members who sadly passed away during mm -hmm. the filming of Spongebob. They are deep underwater after all, it's not the safest place for humans to be. Yeah. And that's about all I had to say about this topic. It's not Good actually deal. that interesting. I probably wouldn't have even bothered making this separate mini-theory if it wasn't for a very interesting piece of Spongebob history that was really recently made public. The original Spongebob Pitch Bible, what? the document created by Steven Hillenburg in 1997 to pitch the show to Nickelodeon, was okay. just recently finally made available to the public. And it is full of fascinating early ideas and concept art for the show. But what's interesting to me That's is that much like the show itself, the Pitch Bible is presented like a fictional in-universe report from a team of deep sea divers discovering Bikini Bottom for the first time. An afternoon ascent into the deep crystalline gulf which wow. plummets from the island's coral base reveal the natural wonder which had so long eluded the eyes of mankind we had indeed found sponge boy which was wow. the original name for spongebob there before us Ooh, glistening so in the glow of our dive lamps sat a submerged treasure unlike any other in the world we were afforded a first-hand glimpse into the character of sponge boy and his world it's crazy that even the pitch bible for this show has lore if this doesn't prove the television theory i don't know what does but yeah, that's there's kind of, that's something insane, in this Bible that I always thought was a little strange. On page 12, there's a dedication section. It describes one of the first expeditions to Bikini Bottom taken by a deep sea diver named Bucky Leavitt, using a new and untested diving suit, which ultimately imploded from the undersea pressures. Bucky died making the only known map of Bikini Bottom. It is to Bucky and his pioneer spirit that we dedicate research and twin what name bucky is that the real name of the narrator mm, good question all my new folks welcome in in this research. It's kind of a strange thing to include in a pitch for a kid show, of all things. The story seems to be inspired by Benjamin Leavitt, the inventor of the suit shown in this photo, but there's no record of him ever dying during an expedition. So it seems like this story about Bucky was completely made up just to add more lore to the show. So it then begs the question, if he is a character in this universe, where, where is Bucky's body? Could he possibly be one of the human skeletons we've seen throughout the show? Well, we know Bucky died in his old prototype diving suit, so I think his body would probably still be inside of it. So the real question is, do we know of any diving suits in Bikini Bottom? And yes, we do. We see it almost every episode. SpongeBob's television. SpongeBob's TV is clearly supposed to be an old diving suit helmet, but it's strange because it's so small compared to diving suits we've seen worn by other humans. So either this diving suit is from a shrunken human, or it's been compressed down to a smaller size by the pressures of the sea, just like Bucky's. We even see SpongeBob's TV design was a part of the original pitch bible. I think there's a very good chance that this is supposed to be oh. at least the head of Bucky Leavitt. I think every time SpongeBob is watching TV, he's actually staring directly at a dead human skull. And if you don't believe me, in season 10's Whirly Brain, SpongeBob and Patrick fight over the TV and actually pull it apart. And for the very first time ever, we get a look inside. <laughs> It's an extremely fast moment, but if you go frame by frame, you'll see that inside of Spongebob's TV is what looks like a human skull. And that is Skeleton Theory. Rest in peace, Bucky. That's insane. That's a good one. That's a very good the frame, but you would have to frame by frame that. That yeah. means a lot of this shit is very much on purpose. Yeah, it has to be. It's intentional. A lot of it very... Hey, who? Man! Nah, this is... I, <laughs> I can't fathom I, won't, I ain't gonna lie. I want more for the crab theory, but that one's good.
That that's creepily good, actually. Uh, this is the only mini theory that's just like a straight up part two of one of my old theories. So obviously, if you haven't seen the original Mrs. Puff theory yet, then it probably won't make too much sense. So, there's been a lot of new evidence that's come out about Mrs. Puff since I posted my theory. Some I already added to the main theory, like her real name being discovered, so go watch that if you haven't already. But, I saved some really cool discoveries and new ideas just for this mini theory. Like, in Lighthouse Louie, I missed this the first time, but if you look closely in her pile of junk, you can actually see a dead police officer's corpse! Oh my god! Ah! Ah! Actually, no, this, this is just uh, an obstacle from her training course. But, I bet you didn't know, in Camp Coral, we see her dispose of the real Mrs. Puff's dead body! Ah, ah, ah. Uh, also no, this is just a pinata that looks oh, like okay. her. Okay, but, but they're clearly trying to mess with us at this point. <laughs> Before I get into the actual new discoveries, I want to talk about some alternative ideas I've come up with for some parts of the Mrs. Puff theory. As I've already said, I'm not the biggest fan of where I took the third part of this theory. I really wanted there to be this big reveal about why the prison is forcing Mrs. Mrs. Puff to teach Spongebob, when, in reality, it just makes so much more sense that, like in doing time, every time Mrs. Puff sees Spongebob in jail, she's actually just hallucinating. Good day, class! I must be having a nightmare! You know, there's just way more direct evidence in the show to support this, as opposed to this convoluted warden theory. And it's further supported by my new imagination mini-theory from earlier in this video. We know the show exists in a world where things you imagine can easily come to life. And Mrs. Puff is constantly imagining her fear of Spongebob or the guilt from her past mistakes. So it makes sense that she would get trapped in her own delusions so often. But there's always been this big loose end in my theory that I've always wanted to find a way to wrap up. We know Mrs. Puff prematurely gave a license to one of her previous students in New Kelp City, and that led to the city being destroyed. Local consensus places the blame on this negligent, selfish driving instructor. But who was Mrs. Puff's original student before SpongeBob? And while we haven't gotten any new evidence about this, I think I've got two strong candidates for who it could be. One of the best comments I got from the Mrs. Puff video was the idea that the original student was actually SpongeBob's cousin, Stanley S. Squarepants. Hi, Squidward! I'd like you to meet my cousin Stanley. We're related. There's two of them! Stanley is a That's character creepy. we meet for only one episode in season five. He's SpongeBob's cousin from out of town, and he's extremely accident prone even more than Spongebob. Now, we don't know what town he's from, That's how he would destroy a whole city. from but okay. we know his Uncle Sherm sent him away because he was too destructive. So, he totally fits the idea of Mrs. Puff's former student that probably destroyed New Kelp City. It would also add another layer to why Mrs. Puff is so tortured by Spongebob specifically. He would literally look and act exactly like her former student. There's two of them! So yeah, I think this is totally plausible, great comment. The only thing that kind of holds this theory back is the lack of any actual concrete connection between Stanley and Mrs. Puff. Like, unfortunately, they're never in the same episode. But I think I have another possible candidate for this mystery student. Someone who we the actually in see in The one I was in jail in the car with her is with Mrs. Puff. In the Mrs. Puff theory, I theorized that the entire episode doing time was all imagined by Mrs. Puff, and everything we see, even small details like her changing prison uniforms, are symbolic for what's really going on inside of her head. But if that's true, then what does this random other prisoner that keeps showing up symbolize? Hey there, Puff Mama. What's today's grub? Hi, oh, Donna. It's too. chilly. I wouldn't have thought much about it if it wasn't for this very interesting moment where she returns at the end of the episode. Ah! Oh, oh, it's just my imagination again. So what's for dinner tonight, Puff Mama? Chili? Ah! I think this could be implying that Donna is Mrs. Puff's original That's student. It. We see her driving Mrs. Puff's boat in a free fall crash, just like her old student probably also did. And then she literally gets replaced by SpongeBob. So what's for dinner tonight, Puff Mama? Chili? Ah! Huh? 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 Ah, 
Forget it. Just like how he actually replaced her original student. So yeah, I think both Donna and Stanley are pretty good candidates for the original student. Stanley is a bit more thematically fitting, but Donna actually has some direct evidence in the show. So yeah, I, I could see it being either of them. But that's all just tying up loose ends. The real reason I decided to cover Mrs. Puff again in this mini theory is because of two major new developments in recent Spongebob episodes. The first is in the season 13 episode, Arbor Day Disarray. In this episode, Sandy gives everyone trees she grew, okay. and we get this scene between Mrs. Puff and her tree. I love talking to someone who knows how to keep a secret. <laughs> I can finally tell someone what really happened when I pulled that job in Shell City. What really happened when I pulled that job in Shell City? They're still adding more mysteries to solve about Mrs. Puff. It sounds like Mrs. Puff did some kind of heist or maybe has some connection to Shell City from the SpongeBob movie. And if you remember, oh, I th her husband was there. theorized that Shell City was the place Mr. Puff, her former dead husband, oh, was being shit. held. They end up setting oh, off the smoke shoot. detector, which activates the sprinkler system and brings all the dead fish back to life, including a very familiar looking puffer fish hanging from the ceiling. Mr. Puff is alive. So, is it possible this job is somehow her. related to Mr. Puff? Well, before we get into that, there is one more new development we need to talk about. In the season 14 episode, Hysterical History, for the very first time ever, it we actually do history. get to definitively see Mr. Puff when he was alive. Bikini Bottom's own titan of industry, Mr. Puff, ran the first successful boat assembly line. Of so did. this episode <laughs> is just a bunch of flashbacks from Bikini Bottom's history, and we learn that Mr. Puff was actually a wealthy businessman who ran a boat factory. And Sandy later confirms that this is all actually true. This isn't just a story SpongeBob made up. Now, Mr. Puff looks and sounds a lot like Mrs. Puff. Speed up, line number five! And the other flashbacks in this episode seem to be about ancestors of our main characters. So maybe this is actually supposed to be just a relative of Mrs. Puff, not her dead husband. But remember, Mrs. Puff is not originally from Bikini Bottom, and we know her last name isn't really Puff. It's yeah, yeah. Blowfish. So this is most likely her former husband, Mr. Puff, before he died. And unfortunately, this does seem to disprove my Mr. Puff theory, because he clearly looks very different than the pufferfish we see in Shell City. But yeah. even if this pufferfish wasn't Mr. Puff, I don't think I was wrong about Mr. Puff being at Shell City. The fact that he's shown as a dried up, hanging pufferfish with googly eyes is way too similar to be a coincidence. And then there's the fact that they just confirmed Mrs. Puff has some sort of history with Shell City specifically. I think Mr. Puff was abducted and taken to Shell City, but the reason why we don't see him in the Spongebob movie is probably because he was already sold to someone else by that point, meaning he was unfortunately never saved by Spongebob. So that leaves us with one final question. What, what was mean? the job Mrs. Puff pulled at Shell City, and what does it have to do with her husband's death? Well, my first guess is that this job was some sort of rescue mission to save Mr. Puff from Shell City and she no. failed, but listen to how no. she talks about it. Like I can finally tell someone what really happened when I pulled that job in Shell City. Whatever happened at Shell City, she's happy about it. In fact, yeah. it's kind of a sinister, nefarious happiness. What really happened when I pulled that job? She's not devastated that her husband was lost forever. She's happy about it. I never yeah, really considered this before, free. but could Mrs. Puff actually be responsible yeah. for her husband's death? Did Mrs. Puff kill her husband? I mean, we know Plankton sold Neptune's crown to Shell City. I just wanted to say thanks again for selling me the crown. I sold it to a guy in Shell City. So it does seem possible to arrange for this kind of thing to happen. And Arbor Day Disarray ends with Mrs. Puff's tree ratting her out to the police. <laughs> Hello, police department? I got a lead on that Shell City job. That's insane. 
I gotta and I go. Never tell you what it is. Why would the bikini bottom police care about something she did at a human gift shop? I mean, they didn't care when SpongeBob stole from there. The only explanation is that she wasn't stealing from humans, she was, she was giving them something oh, oh. or someone oh. from bikini bottom, Mr. Yeah. Puff. Mrs. Puff arranged for fishermen to kidnap and kill her husband. That's what really happened at Shell City. But why? Well, other than Mr. Puff kind of seeming like a jerk who mistreats his employees, he's also very wealthy, which yeah, means that when he that died, in a way that shirts. can't be traced back to Mrs. Puff, as his wife, she would inherit oh. his money. Which explains how Mrs. Puff, who That's previously had to abandon her entire life and start over from scratch in Bikini Bottom, could afford to open a massive yeah. boating school. Maybe this was her plan all along. Get close to some rich jerk, marry him, and then have him killed to inherit his money. These little breadcrumbs Fish they've given us. <laughs> oh, and that also kind of explains why like, she was so open to Mr. Krabs. Because Mr. Krabs is pretty much the richest one in Bikini Bottom. Mm. Up to this have told us so much more about Mrs. Puff's past. But also, maybe, just maybe, her future as well. Mr. Puff was portrayed as a greedy, unethical capitalist who only cared about money, even at the expense of his employees. And does that remind you of anyone else in Mrs. Puff's life? Unhand that penny or the arm comes off! Keep on trickin', Spongebob! How could you trade Spongebob for 62 cents? You think I could've gotten more? If she yeah, did it to Mr. Mr. Puff, who's to say she's not planning Hello. to do it again to Mr. Krabs? Maybe this is the entire reason why she's dating him. Let's just hope Mr. Krabs isn't planning on getting married anytime soon. The, the, the imaginary doppelganger Mr. Krabs, that is. And that is the Mrs. Puff theory part Yay. two. Okay. Incredibly excited because we get to talk to the voice of Wait Karen today, Jill Talley. I love like trying to make sense out of SpongeBob. My adorable nephew called me up and he just was like, hey, Jill. Jill, do you know about this? What what do you make of this? Like, what do you think about this Mrs. Puff? And I didn't know what he was talking about. It, it was like a fever dream because I wasn't aware of all the conspiracy stuff. So all I'm hearing on the phone is <laughs> criminal past clues. And I'm going, what is he talking about? I said, I'm going to look into it, Frankie. I'm gonna so then I went online and I started looking at it and it was oh, fascinating. Wow. I was oh, going yeah. in. I was going, I want to know too. Hey, Alex, that's cool. <laughs> Hell. Okay, this next part isn't actually a new mini That's theory. Cool. It's actually just yeah, me debunking motion. the popular Krabby Patty is crab meat theory that people keep commenting about just because it annoys me. <laughs> but don't worry, there's still going to be eight new actual theories in this video. This is okay. just a little bonus. So, that's what I taste like. so a lot of people think that Krabby Patties are actually made of crab meat and Mr. Krabs is going around killing all the crabs. I hate to break it to you, it's special sauce, and his special sauce is his special sauce. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. These are new theories, Crabs gang. and we Bikini Bottom. This is the comment I will get for the rest of my life. It's crab meat. Actual, Actual crab? crab? I mean, why else would Mr. Krabs be the only crab in Bikini Bottom? Uh, except for his mom and his dad, yeah. and his nephews. Okay, okay, but there's no crabs outside of his family, except for this guy, and this doctor, and this kid, and these two crabs, and this circus guy. But, but besides them, there's no crabs in Bikini that. Bottom. Okay, even if there is not like a lot of crabs, there's equally not a lot of sponges or starfish or pufferfish or squirrels in Bikini Bottom. Bikini Bottom is like 90% generic fish. But then why is it named the Krusty Crab? Uh, cause, cause the owner's a crab and that's his last name. But even if we ignore that, it's like, wh wh why would Mr. Krabs advertise his dark secret as the name of his restaurant? But then why is the Krusty Crab shaped like a crab trap? 
Okay, this is actually the one good piece of evidence in this theory. I think it's a little ambiguous whether it's supposed to be a crab trap or a lobster trap. So I did some digging and Patchy actually calls it a lobster trap in a SpongeBob DVD bonus. The Krusty Krab looks like a New England style lobster trap, but now it just traps the pocket change of Bikini Bottom's hungry denizens. They also find a very similar looking building in Camp Coral and call it a lobster trap. Oh no, we've walked into a real life lobster trap! I could maybe see this evidence kind of working, but you'd kind of expect if this was their secret intention, they would like call it a crab trap, you know? But what about the scene where Mr. Crab eats one and he says that it tastes like him? So that's what I taste like. This is supposed to be the smoking gun piece of evidence that's all over TikTok, but nobody actually shows the clip with context. Mommy, my Krabby Patty tastes funny. Well, no wonder. It's all old and dried out, like that man right there. Now put that thing where it belongs, ah. in the garbage. <laughs> la, 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 la. Well, little Patty, ah, we're two thanks. of a kind. Yeah. We've both lost our luster. <laughs> Mm. He's saying, so that's what uh, I taste oh. like. Mr. Krabs says the patty tastes like him because the lady called the patty old and dry like him. And he's been feeling insecure about what? his age. It's funny say that to me, that's crazy. <laughs> it oh, really, it's old and dry like him. <laughs> Me? <laughs> Me? Age of this episode. Like, I'm not saying the Pearl's mom theory is the best theory ever, but it's better than this shit. Come on. <laughs> So, if there's one thing I'd probably change about my evolution theory, it would be the second part about the war. After the war, Crab stayed After secluded in a deep depression that seemed endless. I think there definitely was a war in Bikini Bottom, but I don't think it was between evolved and primitive fish anymore. There is just way more evidence that the war Mr. Krabs fought in was actually a war between fish and humans. What? And I think this concept for a human oh, war has been secretly present in the show from the oh, very the start. Yeah, Every single building yeah. in Bikini Bottom is made out of some sort of debris from the human world. Now this is a reference to how marine ecosystems in real life often form around things that yeah, fell from the yeah. surface. But the Smart. debris isn't always just random objects or pollution. A surprising amount of the buildings feel like they're from the aftermath of a massive war. There are a ton of buildings made out of sunken ships, but there's also anchors, submarines, lobster traps, bait and tackle boxes, undersea mines, there's even a building made out of a dead bucket of fish. If you really look at the show's aesthetic, it gives the impression that Bikini Bottom is an Adventure Time style post-apocalyptic wasteland where a massive war between humans and fish took place. Mr. Krabs Navy Convention Center is literally a giant torpedo. We get further confirmation of this as early as season one hooky when a bunch of humans start fishing in Bikini Bottom, pay close attention to how Mr. Krabs reacts. They're back! They're back, I tell you! I saw them with real eyes! They're back. back. Mr. Krabs has dealt They're with back. this before, probably because these were the same hooks from the war he fought in. From humans' perspective, they're just fishing, but for the citizens of Bikini Bottom, this was a brutal Emotional war. And listen to what he says about what happens if the hooks catch you. They cook you, and then they eat you, or worse. <laughs> what could be worse than that? Gift shops. <laughs> You'll end up in gift shops. This gives a whole new context to the Shell City gift shop we see in the Spongebob movie. Wait a second. Those fish are fighting. dead. All these dead fish are victims from the human war. Look, the gift shop in Hooky even has a very similar sign to the Shell City gift shop. Yeah. Among the dead fish in Shell City, we specifically see the same type of royal seahorses King Neptune uses. Which makes sense because as King of the Sea, he would probably be the one commanding Leading the army war, to go yeah. fight the humans. Movie Neptune even talks about Shell City like he has personal experience with it. Fight for 
Crown is in the Forbidden Shell City! No one who's gone to Shell City has ever returned! I guess this could also mean Mr. Puff was a victim of the war, but I kind of yeah, nah, prefer okay, the idea but... from my new yeah. Mrs. Puff mini theory. Yeah. We also we see giant it. hooks right all there, over Mr. Crab's wall of memorabilia, along with other human fishing tools. There's even a picture of the Bikini Bottom Museum ship before it was sunk in the war and later turned into a museum. Mikey, There's also Aaron, this picture Terry, of some a new human llamas pirate. with hats episode by Flimco that you guys should react to one day. And before you say anything, no, this is not patchy. It's probably just someone he fought in the war. Listen, I still definitely think these pictures could be Pearl's mother, and she's still the source of the Krabby Patty meat. But instead of Mr. Krabs killing her, she was probably just a casualty just of the human yeah. war, and Mr. Krabs just found her dead body and adopted her orphan daughter. There's also the Hook Museum, which with this context looks much more just like a straight up war museum. Now, these are smaller hooks, so I initially thought maybe Maybe this was just a museum of hooks made by evolved fish to catch primitive fish like clams. But listen closely to the audio Mr. Krabs is listening to. The three pronged jig hook was first sighted in local waters more than 100 years ago. The hook was first sighted in local waters more than 100 years ago. This is definitely a museum of human hooks, and we now know this war has been going on for at least 100 years. There's also tons of movies and TV shows in Bikini Bottom based around around the horrors of hooks. <laughs> Tonight's frightening feature. That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> The idea of this human war is everywhere in the right, show, it and it's played a big role in shaping the culture of Bikini Bottom. The but here's amazing. the strange thing about all of this. The Bikini Bottom we see today is not at war. The only time we see humans fishing in Bikini Bottom is in this one single episode, and Mr. Krabs even says they're back. They're back! As if this is not a normal occurrence. This implies that the humans previously stopped attacking for some reason. So what ended this great human war that lasted for at least a hundred years? Right well, we clearly to... humans and fish have a much more peaceful relationship now. The entire SpongeBob SquarePants show is made by humans with the help of certain fish, oh. including Mr. Krabs who used to fight against them. What if the reason why the war ended was because of this show? The original yeah. human research team that was mentioned in the Spongebob Pitch Bible showed the world that Bikini Bottom had extremely in intelligent life and proved yeah. that instead of killing the fish, they could peacefully profit off of them by making their lives into a TV show. Spongebob doesn't even know it, but I think he might be the reason why a hundred year long brutal war between humans and fish has come to a peaceful end. And that is the human war theory. Oh, one second. Don't know, order me some food. So, in 2021, Nickelodeon released a new spin-off show all about Patrick, called yeah. The Patrick Star Show. Hi! I'm Patrick Star, and I live with my parents! This is my dad! This is my mom! This is my sister! This is my grandpa! And this is my show! And I was really interested in it because it seems to kind of acknowledge the fact that it is a TV show, with Patrick actually being filmed and putting on a show as part of the plot of each episode. Coming to you from the Star Family home, it's time for the Patrick Show! And here's your wide awake host, <laughs> but line, girl. it's weird. It's supposed to be a prequel when Patrick was still living with his family, but the Patrick's parents and sister characters that were established in the main show have been replaced by completely different people in this spin-off. Okay. This has been a long-running mystery about the Patrick Star Show that many people have asked me to talk about, but a storyboard artist for the Patrick Star Show actually addressed these contradictions in a very funny Twitter thread where he offers many different possible explanations for why Patrick's family looks different. These range from
from Patrick just perceiving reality differently, to him just assuming whatever starfish is closest to him is his family, to some kind of crazy timeline manipulation. But my favorite is just that they were recast by the in-universe showrunners, and Patrick's too dumb to notice. Also, casual television theory confirmation, no biggie, we're used to it at this point. Now, I watched a good amount of this show when it was first coming out, and there wasn't really too much here for me to analyze, except for one very interesting character, Grandpat, and it ties directly in with my Neptune theory. Grandpat is allegedly Patrick's grandfather, even though we've never heard about him until now. Mom? Dad? Who's this guy? I'm your grandfather, Grandpat! Must we do this every morning? He's sort of a generic- That's Mundal. That's the voice of Mundal from fucking Chowder. And, um, that's the voice of, uh, Gaspacho. Gaspacho. That's Gaspacho, not Mundal. That's Gaspacho. Father, Grandpat, must we do this every morning? He's sort of a generic, cranky old man character uh -huh. who's apparently uh -huh. somehow uh -huh. been alive since prehistoric times. Back in my day, we were food. It was way back in the Patrolithic period of early cave stars. But he's not really that notable or interesting oh, of a character, say, or bro. that's at least what I thought, until I noticed something strange in the episode Squidina's Little Helper. Sounds like we're doing a puppet show. Follow me. The secret crawl space runs all over the house. As characters move through a crawl space at Patrick's house, one of them briefly opens the door and finds a weird secret room full of Roman architecture mm. with Grandpat inside. Ooh. Who's a hungry boy? Dig in! Oh boy. Oh. Grow up big and bristly. <laughs> Puppets are this way. It's kind of a weird throwaway gag, but there's not really much to it, and they immediately move on with the episode without ever addressing it again. But something about this tiny, insignificant moment really stuck with me, even months after watching this episode. And when I watched it again, I couldn't help but notice that the door leading to the room is labeled XIV the Roman numerals for 14, 14 for seemingly right. no reason. Is this supposed to be the 14th room in the house or, or what? But then I remembered, we've heard the number 14 before in the season four episode, Crusty Towers. This room is hideous, redesign it. Neptune the 14th will be nice. What? King Neptune is also referred to as the 14th. Is it possible that there's some sort of connection between Grandpat and King Neptune? I mean, okay, that's on, even the way you would write a king's on, ordinal number, with the Roman numerals XIV. Also, the room is full of fancy royal Roman, Roman architecture, Roman. and the okay. way Grandpat is relaxing and eating grapes like a king. Hear me out, hear me out. Is it possible Grandpat is King Neptune? We know Neptune has the power to change the way people look. What the? And it would explain why Grandpat, just a normal sea star, is able to be alive as far back as prehistoric times. He even has a prehistoric drawing of a starfish wearing a crown in his bedroom. This could even explain why they thought Patrick was a descendant of royalty in Rule of Dumb. Which makes you a descendant of royalty. You are a king. But wait a second, wait a second. Why would the king of the sea be pretending to be Patrick's cranky old grandpa? Well, remember, the Patrick Star Show is a prequel to the main series. And if you believe my Neptune theory, then you know Neptune wasn't always the king of the sea. It's likely at some point he stole the throne and Poseidon's wife. So what if this takes place before Neptune became king? When King Neptune was a little Neptune, his mother set him adrift in a river. When he was That's all crazy. alone, That's abandoned awesome. by his own mother, desperate to find the family Family that he was denied his whole life. So how would he get one? Well, it turns out that there just happens to be one family in the sea that's dumb enough not to notice when new family members are added or replaced. The Patrick Star family. So he transforms himself into the cranky old grandfather character, Grandpat, and secretly inserts himself into the family without their knowledge. Who's this guy? I have no idea. Do you see so? So you can see him too, Bunny? I thought I was the only one. I'm your grandfather. Father, Grandpat, must we do this every morning? Fine. I don't know you, Twig. 
We need a little bit more. We I need like this. More. Yeah. We need a little bit more. Hell no. Really giving him the family love he's been searching for his entire life. Princess! We love you. And if this all still sounds far-fetched to you, listen closely to the music we hear in this scene. Who's a hungry boy? Dig in! Please grow up big and bristly! This small piece of music is called Roman Legions, composed by John Cacavis, and it was used only one other time in SpongeBob. Who's a hungry boy? Behold Neptune, god of the sea! With his mighty trident. In the season 10 episode, oh Trident Trouble, when they are introducing oh none other oh than King all. Neptune the 14th. Grand my Pat god. is king. Oh my god, Alex. I don't know how you pull that one other I'll time. Give it to you. I give it I'll to give you. I give it to you. Because one other time. Okay. King Neptune. And that is the Grand oh Pat theory. Or at least it was until they released the episode Neptune's Ball, where we oh, see King it. Neptune yeah. and Grand Pat in the same room. Man, I love your show. And I'm really conflicted about this because yes, this obviously debunks my theory. Neptune and Grandpat can't be the same yes. person if they're you know both in the, the same room. Half, but lie. then why does all of this evidence feel so specific and intentional? Like most evidence I find can usually be explained as an easter egg or a coincidence, but like I can't think of any other reason why this random room would have the Roman numerals 14 on it. Yeah. Maybe this was something they were setting up but <laughs> changed their minds about. Well, what if he was a soldier for him? Oh, yeah. Or maybe there's some sort of time travel shenanigans going on. Because we know Patrick's family has a time machine in this show that they use all the time. Ghost. Egypt. Or maybe I'm just in denial and I'm overthinking small little random details. Like I've said, these are the theories that didn't make the cut for their own videos, so they're not all gonna be as strong as my main theories. But even if it's unlikely, I'm still gonna hold out hope that maybe I'll be proven right someday. It, oh well, to the on moment. to the next theory. He got me. I believe in nothing you said. <laughs> So, when it comes to Spongebob theory crafting, the Spongebob Squarepants movie is a pretty contentious topic. Why is there no continuity between the movie and the show? Does the movie take place in the future as the canonical end of the Spongebob timeline like many people believe? Or does it take place when it was released between season 3 and 4 and it was just a fake movie production that holds no continuity? But wait a second, if it's supposed to be a fake movie production, then why does it also seem to have a secret narrative about joining a goofy goober cult? Is Shell City supposed to be a mass suicide room from an alien death cult? Or are these victims from a human fish war. This is the issue with creating so many wildly different theories about the same show. Sometimes not everything is gonna line up perfectly. And I was ready to just give up and take the L until I noticed something really strange in the season three episode as seen on TV. In the beginning of this episode, we find out Mr. Krabs has hired Squidward to direct a Krusty Krab commercial. We're shooting our first ever Krusty Krab commercial. I got Squidward organizing the whole thing. He's, you know, artsy. What the? This looks oh. expensive. Oh. But when he oh. sees the production Squidward put on is way bigger than he would need for just a tiny commercial, he scraps the whole thing and shoots a oh. lower budget one himself. But there is something Classic very Mr. strange Man. about the production Squidward was directing. Squidward set has a second Krusty Krab, just right. like the SpongeBob movie. Well, how do you explain that? A second Krusty Krab? What inspired you to build a second Krusty Krab right next door to the original? Okay, that's a weird coincidence, but whatever. But that's not all. Squidward's production also has the same giant leg right, with a heel oh. and fishnet stockings that Patrick wears at the end of the SpongeBob movie. That's right, keep moving! You know what? Like, they're not exactly the same, but you gotta admit, this is starting to feel a little too specific to be a coincidence, okay. right? Is it possible the production Squidward directed for the Krusty Krab commercial was actually the in-universe production for the SpongeBob SquarePants movie? This episode came out in 2002, which is the same year the real-life SpongeBob movie began production, and the similarities don't even end there. In the background, we can see a fish dressed with almost the exact same hat, oh. red 
bandana and boots as Dennis, the hitman Plankton hires in the SpongeBob and movie. He's a vicious, cold-blooded predator. It's clearly not the same guy, <laughs> but we gotta pull that off or something. Take the shades off the boys. Listen to what Squidward says when we see him. <laughs> Mr. Krabs, everyone needs an understudy. What if this is Dennis's understudy? We also see Mr. Krabs' understudy, who could be the stand-in for him while he's frozen for most of the movie. And then we see a guy in a giant tomato costume, and what I assume is another guy in a giant Krabby Patty costume. Right, and right, I right, think right. they're supposed to be the paddy wagon, and they're just doing some kind of visual effects that would require people to be in the suits. But regardless, there is an undeniable amount of similarities here. I think there is a very good chance that this is the actual in-universe SpongeBob movie production. But if that's all true, then why are they pretending like this is all just a commercial for the Krusty Krab? We're making the commercial, Mr. Krabs. Well, remember, in my television theory, oh, most- Oh, what if they're making a commercial for the movie? So the characters don't know they're inside of a semi-scripted TV show or movie. It's a big secret the showrunners are keeping from them. So obviously they would want to come up with some sort of cover story to keep this production a secret from the unaware characters like Spongebob. Squidward even has Spongebob bury himself in this episode to keep all the behind the scenes production a secret. What are you doing lad? Squidward said I could help by burying myself. So that means Squidward is not only a spy who's part of the television theory cover-up, but he's also the director of the SpongeBob SquarePants movie. And I know that sounds a little strange. Why would they choose Squidward, of all people, to direct this movie? And even if he was chosen for some reason, does this movie really feel like it was something Squidward made? Like, one of the main things we know about Squidward is that he is such a self-obsessed narcissist who glorifies himself in all of his art. So why would a movie he directed be any different? Well, what if I told you it's not? In the Spongebob TV show, Squidward is treated like this loser punching bag of a character. Don't say anything, Squidward. Remember your karma. <laughs> but in the Spongebob movie, for the first time ever... Nah, go ahead. Pause it, bro. What you was gonna say, bro? What you was gonna say, bro? Come on, Twin. You ain't had nothing to say. Uh, you was, was gonna was, pause I was, it. I was, I was gonna say, yeah, Squidward just got a big head on him, man. This is insane. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Well, in all SpongeBob media, Squidward is kind of presented in a surprisingly yeah. flattering way. He's the one who's given the promotion of new Krusty Krab manager because apparently he's so much more mature and responsible than SpongeBob, despite us obviously knowing how little care or effort he puts into his job. And when the entire town is dumb enough to wear Plankton's mind control helmets, Squidward is the one character who's smart enough to see through the ruse and figure out Plankton's entire plan. You may have put weight everyone else in this fat wire town, but you can't fool me. You set up Mr. Krabs. You stole the crown so Neptune would freeze him and you could finally get your stubby little toss on the Krabby Patty formula. Sir. But you made one fatal Doesn't mistake. You messed it. with my paycheck. And I'm gonna report you to the yeah, highest authority in the land, King Neptune. Like, does that not sound like something Squidward would add to the movie to make himself look better? He even yeah. gets this really great monologue at the end of the movie to wrap things up, and it makes him seem so inspiring and poetic. After going on your life-changing journey, you now realize oh, you don't himself. want what you thought you Look wanted. Good. What you, know, you really directed. wanted was inside you all along. Of course, ah. it gets cut off by a joke, and he doesn't actually win against Plankton, because this is still the Spongebob movie at the end of the day, yeah. and he probably didn't yeah. actually write it, but he still manages to make himself look really good, and it's because Squidward Tentacles directed the Spongebob Squarepants I can see movie. That. I, can I think see there's that. a lot For of sure. evidence to support this, but I still don't really know why. Out of all the people in Bikini Bottom, why did they choose him? Well, I think it all ties back in with Goofy Goobers. In the season 12 episode, The Goofy Newbie, we see something really strange on one of the tables. A Goofy Goober ice cream that looks exactly like Squidward. Now, I noticed this back when I was first making my Goofy Goober theory, but I never really knew what to do with it. It's just this really weird background detail that makes no sense. Squidward isn't even in the episode, and we've never seen him have any interactions with Goofy Goobers. But remember, 
What is the one thing we know about the things Squidward creates? He always makes them in his own image. He does this with all of his art. So if Squidward was to make ice cream, I think this is what it would look like. So this okay. kind of implies that Squidward does have some kind of connection with Goofy Goobers. Either he works there on the side and literally made this ice cream, or Goofy Goobers made it in his likeness because he's some sort of important member of the organization, sort of like how cults will get celebrities to join them. And if Squidward is a member of the Goofy Goobers cult, it explains why there's this secret underlying narrative about the cult in the Spongebob movie. It's like they got the director of the movie to include some kind of subtle propaganda about how joining Goofy Goobers is the only way to set yourself free. This isn't literally a mass suicide room, but it was an intentional similarity made by Squidward to promote the cult's ideology. In fact, I think this also explains why Squidward was chosen by the showrunners in the first place to direct the movie. Not only is Goofy Goobers heavily featured in the Spongebob movie, but there's also this weird implication that they had some kind of behind-the-scenes influence over it. Bear with me for a second. Uh -huh. About halfway through the movie, we get a classic Spongebob title card with the French narrator speaking. Ew. Meanwhile. But instead of the usual generic background, it's clearly Goofy Goober themed, despite the scene having nothing to do with Goofy Goobers. I think Goofy Goobers, being a multi-billion dollar organization, helped to fund the in-universe Spongebob movie in exchange for having some influence over it. Not only were they able to include all this subtle cult propaganda in the movie, but they had the power to choose a director from their organization to include this narrative. And they chose Squidward Tentacles to become the director of the Spongebob Squarepants movie. And that is the Squidward Director Theory. I like it. I like it. Don't ruin it. Please, for the love of God. Thank the Lord. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Okay, so the actual most frequent comment I get on any of my videos is, where's the jellyfish theory? And I get it. I tease this whole jellyfish alien invasion theory as sort of a misdirect in Don't Feed the Muse 2. This may be my darkest theory yet. This is the alien jellyfish invasion theory. The idea was that the plot- Y'all don't forget nothing. Y'all don't forget- That's no. just his, his comments, everybody. Y'all don't forget nothing. Nothing. Enough, of the theory was actually foreshadowing the plot of Don't Feed the Muse, but a lot of people, Jeez. a lot of people still really wanted to see that theory, and I still get comments about it to this day, and for good reason, I was I was definitely uh, clickbaiting you guys there. And to be completely honest, I only chose that topic because it lined up so well with the film I was making. I didn't actually have a theory planned for it, but uh, now that I've really looked into it a bit more, I do think there's actually a surprising amount of things to say about this topic. I think it might actually be one of my best mini theories in this video. So finally, here is the long -awaited alien jellyfish invasion theory. Aliens have invaded Bikini Bottom and taken the form of jellyfish. One by one, they replaced the citizens of Bikini Bottom with identical clones, slowly taking over the population from within. Throughout the entire show, there have been hints of these alien jellyfish secretly controlling people and pulling the strings from the shadows. This may be my darkest theory yet. This yeah, is the alien jellyfish invasion Appreciate theory. Sir. One of the creepiest episodes of Spongebob is, by far, the season 8 episode, Planet of the Jellyfish. A mysterious green alien appears in jellyfish fields and starts spreading alien jellyfish clones all over Bikini Bottom. By getting the people to wear the alien jellyfish's hats, one by one they kidnap and replace the citizens of Bikini Bottom with identical clones. This whole episode is very much a parody of the Invasion of the Body Snatchers films. Eventually, Spongebob discovers the weakness of the aliens is none other than mayonnaise, and he uses it to kill the aliens and set everyone free. But how free are they, really? Afterwards, Mr. Krabs decides to resell all the remaining alien goo as a new Krabby Patty condiment. Freaky Clone Jelly Relish? Get your Freaky Clone Jelly Relish patties! And the episode ends with Patrick ordering one of these patties, but without mayonnaise. Uh, I'll have one relish patty. Hold the mayonnaise. <laughs> We're left on this cliffhanger where Patrick might still very well be an alien clone. And that's it. It's been 11 years since this episode came out, and there has been no continuation of this story since then. So, is Patrick an alien? Are the Jellians still somehow around, secretly plotting another takeover? Well, before I answer that, I can actually tell you exactly where these aliens came from. The background of the title card for this episode shows a barren alien planet, but we've actually seen this exact planet before. In the season 4 episode, Squid Bob Tentacle Pants, Sandy is experimenting with a new teleportation device and accidentally sends Spongebob and Squidward to an alien planet for a few seconds. Well, here goes nothing! 
the exact same alien planet we see in the Planet of the Jellyfish title card. Now, the aliens we see on this planet don't really resemble the Jellians, so at first I thought maybe the Jellians were originally just a different species somewhere else on this planet, but then I noticed in the background we see this orange and yellow ringed planet that isn't present in the Jellyfish title card. Planet of the Jellyfish is obviously a parody of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and in that franchise, the aliens invaded Earth because their original home planet was dying. So what if this planet was the original homeworld of yeah, the Jellians, but invaded. just like an Invasion of the Body Snatchers, yeah. the planet died sometime between Squid Bob and Planet of the Jellyfish, and that's why the Jellyfish invaded Earth. The spots on the planet even look like a jellyfish. Okay, so that's where I think the Jellians came from, but where are they now? Is Patrick actually an alien clone at the end of Planet of the Jellyfish? No, no. he's not. And not because I just claimed he was a robot. <laughs> the Jellian clones all have black eyes and act in a very obviously alien way. And Patrick here looks and acts completely normal. But then why does he ask for a Krabby Patty without mayonnaise? Over there. Well, maybe it's as simple as he just doesn't like mayonnaise. Also, no. And it's not because of this scene. Is mayonnaise an instrument? It's because of the way the season 4 episode Hocus Pocus ends. When Spongebob somehow figures out how to perform real magic and Patrick asks Spongebob to do this. Hey, Spongebob, I'm still hungry. Will you turn me into a jar of mayonnaise so I can eat myself? Patrick, uh, mayonnaise -a guy. Patrick could have asked Spongebob to turn him into literally any food, and he chose mayonnaise. Mayonnaise is his favorite fucking food, which means there is no way he would ask to hold the mayo yeah, at the end of okay. Planet of the Jellyfish unless he was being controlled wow, by the Jellians, at least to Where some extent. Going? So even if he's not a full-on alien clone, I think he is being affected by the Jellian goo he ate, but in a much more subtle, dormant way. It's kind of like how rabies has evolved to make people afraid of water because the virus spreads faster without it. The Jellian goo is subconsciously making people avoid mayonnaise in order to keep itself alive. Now, there are little hints that maybe these Jellians are still around, influencing people in future episodes. Gary, Sandy, and even Patchy all mention later that they don't like mayonnaise. Gary hates mayo. I don't like mayonnaise neither. Party, you know I don't like mayo! And there was this shaman guy in season 9 that had a jellyfish on his head. But, you know, other than these random, one-off moments, that's kinda it. So maybe there is a secret jellyfish invasion going on, but like I said, I chose this theory because it fit the film I was making, not because there's any smoking gun evidence to prove it all. <laughs> I mean, it's not like there's a whole convention of people wearing jellyfish hats, right? It is! Oh, yeah, I forgot about these guys. Jellycon! So, in the Season 2 episode, I'm Your oh Biggest Fanatic, God. we're introduced to the biannual jellyfish convention, where all the jellyfish enthusiasts in Bikini Bottom can meet up and enjoy their hobby. Wow, I can't believe it! We're actually here at the biannual jellyfish convention! Jellyfish are awesome! Now, there were people wearing jellyfish hats here before the jellyfish invasion episode, but it's maybe like 10% of the people. But four seasons after Planet of the Jellyfish, we get an episode called Jolly Lodgers, where we see the convention again, <laughs> and literally like 99% of the people there are wearing wearing jellyfish hats now. Huh. I guess, I guess it just got a little more popular, you know, I guess it's not that weird. But not only does the convention seem a lot bigger, but there's right. some interesting new activities going on. We got increasing your sting endurance, get buff jellyfishing, do you want to be a jelly, totally legal? Uh, I don't, maybe that's just like a little suspicious? And just listen to the way these people talk now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, these, these guys are Jellians. They yeah. even surround Squidward in the exact yeah. same way the Jellians yeah. surrounded SpongeBob and Sandy. Look, the creators literally recreated the shot. I'm not crazy, these guys are fucking Jellians. And we even see people still wearing these jellyfish hats after the convention. In one of the newer episodes in season 14, we see a random fish wearing a jellyfish hat, in even though he's play. not at or going to a jellyfish convention. But what's really strange here is that when Bubble Bass opens a window, everyone's stuff flies off except, except for this for hat. The <laughs> It is really stuck on there. It really feels like there is some kind of alien clinging to his head. We also see Kevin's fan club, the Jelly Spotters, again in season 14, except now they've all got jellyfish hats and they've replaced their yeah, leader, Kevin, with Patrick. Damn. He got kicked out of the club years ago! Which kind of makes sense since Kevin can't really wear a jellyfish hat since he's got that thing on his head. I didn't know this was a hat! It wasn't. So they got someone else who the oh, aliens could actually replace <laughs> to be in charge. It makes sense. The Jellians are back and they're using this convention to secretly add oh, people oh, to their oh. alien hive mind collective. In fact, I'm even pretty sure that they successfully replaced Squidward in this episode. Throughout this episode, Squidward is trying to escape this convention, but they keep cornering him and even force him to wear a jellyfish hat. 
But then, at the end of this episode, he finds an empty jellyfish mascot costume and decides to use it as a disguise to escape. <laughs> Say, if I put that dumb thing on, I can sneak out of here without anybody knowing it's me. And it pretty much works. He manages to get away from everyone else. I've got peace and quiet. I've got peace and quiet. But wait a second. Let's go back to the establishing shot at the very beginning of this episode. Okay. Do you notice anything strange here, other than the stuff I've already pointed out? Oh, somebody was in there. The uh, jellyfish mascot. Hidden in the bottom right corner is the jellyfish mascot Squidward will eventually put on. But if that's the case, then why can we already see Squidward's feet coming out of it? This is way before Squidward puts on the costume to escape. We literally see him outside of the costume in the very next shot. Squidward can't also be here unless they already made an alien clone of Squidward and at some oh, point during crazy. the episode, they switch places. Squidward and everyone here has been replaced by the alien that's jellyfish crazy. invasion. And also replaced by the robot invasion, and also brainwashed by Goofy Goobers, <laughs> and also being secretly controlled by the showrunners. Uh, a, a lot of people are trying to take over Bikini Bottom, okay? <laughs> There's your jellyfish theory, you could stop. But it makes sense, a lot of people are trying to take over I'm commenting Bikini about Bottom. it. There's yeah. a lot of money there. Yeah. So, we have reached my final Spongebob mini theory, and probably the final Spongebob theory I will Hang ever on. make. And Hang on, Alex. Teach me the sauce, because, like, how you research... I don't want to learn the method to the madness to make theories, but how you research this and find stuff related, to, I don't know. I just want to know the method to the madness, bro. Facts. Because I couldn't, and I it's couldn't, fittingly I can't. The theory that I teased in the final episode of Don't Feed the Muse. I'm going to be proving that Larry the Lobster is secretly a drug lord kingpin that goes by the name Pinhead Larry. This is the Pinhead Larry the Lobster theory. I save this one till the it's end, the not because it's the best or the most shocking theory I've ever made. It might not even be the best mini theory in this video, but I saved it because it's the most ridiculous sounding one. Larry the Lobster is a drug lord kingpin that goes by the name Pinhead Larry is one of the stupidest and funniest sentences I have ever come up with in one of these Spongebob conspiracies. And I think that's the thing that I love the most about making these videos. It's that you can come up with the most ridiculous, stupid ideas about the most mundane and unsuspecting topics, like a random side character in a kid show, and then if you can still actually somehow make a pretty good case for it, it's just the most unexpected and magical feeling in the world. And it's why I have loved making a theory about a time-traveling ghost pop. I love that. Also, that's why I still stand behind Frieza. Did nothing wrong. Frieza did nothing wrong, and we need to accept that. Okay. Pirate or a goofy video. goober yeah. alien death cult. It's why I have loved making Push each up. one of these theories and why I'll continue to make theories about other stupid, unsuspecting, mundane topics after this. It's been. Boy, that, that cabbage one. That cabbage one to this day. The cabbage <laughs> bender, Alex. <laughs> you did your big one. You did that to it. You did your big one. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even. What's your a favorite, wild uh, ride. Chat and YouTube comments. What's your favorite? Uh, SpongeBob theory or Alex Let's theory. begin our final SpongeBob theory. In the season two episode, Survival of the Fittest, Sandy Sleep talks about fighting two infamous criminals named Dirty Dan and Pinhead Larry. I've had enough of your dastardly deeds, Dirty Dan. I'm going to get you and your partner, Pinhead Larry. She later mistakes SpongeBob and Patrick for the criminal duo and attacks and even buries them alive with their own gravestones. Oh, to the bitch ass nigga. To the bitch ass bitch that keeps editing my head on Sandy. And sending it to me. <laughs> On what he sent it to On you? On Instagram. It's, Why? It's he posted, he's posting. He just sent it. He just sent it to me. <laughs> he just he edited my head. On Sandy and sent it to me on Instagram. I done blocked this nigga thirty times. <laughs> I done blocked. He's sending nigga. you the same picture. <laughs> I hate you. You might as well just put it out there, Twitter. No, nah, I'll never put oh, it out. Never put it out. There. I hate you. Jeez, have you seen the new Dragon Ball series? Yeah. Oh, down, I, I started it, I actually, I actually started it. Yeah. It's obviously an iconic episode, but I've always wondered who exactly were Dirty Dan and Pinhead Larry. All right, Pinhead, your time is up. Who you calling Pinhead? Were they real people, or were they just someone Sandy made up? 
Are they legendary outlaws she heard about, or someone she actually fought from her past? It's a hard question to answer because they're really only mentioned in this one episode. The best we get later on is the words Dirty Dan was here, written in graffiti on the back Emotional of the gym. Or, that's damage. at least what I thought, Dang. until I saw the season 11 episode, Shopping List, where SpongeBob and Sandy travel to a snowy mountain and we briefly see them pass by two graves labeled oh. Dirty Dan and Pinhead Larry. So we know they were definitely real people. Now, in the episode, Sandy seems kind of familiar with this area, and these are the exact same graves she recreated for SpongeBob and Patrick. So this seems to be implying that her dream was actually based off of a real memory of her fighting and killing Dirty Dan and Pinhead Larry here. Except there's one problem with that. She didn't ran into Larry the Lobster before, and Larry the Lobster. Alive. How did Dirty yeah. Dan write this graffiti if he's supposed to be dead? I mean, I know it's not like we see when this graffiti was written, but it wasn't left on just any old random gym. It was written on the back of Larry the Lobster's gym. A gym that we saw Larry open in season 9. What you see before you is the culmination of my lifelong dream, Larry's Gym! Yeah! Meaning this graffiti must have been written long after Sandy would have fought and killed Dirty Dan and Pinhead Larry. So, how is this possible? How could Dirty Dan write this on Larry's gym if he's supposed to be dead? I think this means that the real Dirty Dan, and probably also Pinhead Larry, are not actually dead. They probably faked their deaths and are alive somewhere in Bikini Bottom. But where, and more importantly, who are they? Wait a second, why would Dirty Dan write that he was here at this specific gym? Larry's gym? You don't think Larry the Lobster could be? Pinhead Larry? That sounds stupid. Or does it? I mean, it would explain why Dirty Dan would risk exposing that he's still alive at a place Sandy probably frequents. Maybe he's leaving a message for his former criminal partner. Okay, okay, let's let's not get ahead of ourselves. So, they're both named Larry, and you definitely could say he has a pin-shaped head. But Larry is friends with Sandy, and he definitely isn't a criminal, right? Maybe we need to take a closer look at our lobster friend. So, I rewatched every cover, single appearance of Larry the Lobster in all 14 seasons of Spongebob, and here's what I learned. Larry cares a lot about staying in shape and working out, uh -huh. to an obsessive degree. <gasps> Maybe Pinhead was him when he was skinnier. Yeah. Corsi has gone flabby. I've got to get to a rowing machine. He also hates when anyone else is out of shape and will do anything in his power to help them get fit. Those poor people. Someone needs to whip them into shape. Looking out at this sea of flaccid muscles and sagging flesh, frankly, I'm disgusted. Push it! Push it! Apparently, he was also raised by these two old fish. But you guys are way too old and unsightly for my beach. So polite. Just like we raised him. And to further confirm this, the same old lady fish later says this during the Alaskan bullworm incident. We should call my nephew. Sounds like she could definitely be referring to Larry here, so I do think uh -huh. they're supposed to be his aunt and uncle. We also know he loves protein shakes. Protein shakes saved my life, bro. He used to be a lifeguard, but recently fulfilled his lifelong dream of opening up a massive gym. The culmination of my life. Well, must have been making bank as a lifeguard. What the heck? Lifelong dream. A place of my own where I can work out every day, anytime I want. What He's... you said about the morning for a nigga? Huh? What you said about the morning for a nigga? Oh, he, oh, oh, oh yeah. my fault, Larry. Oh, yeah. oh, my fault. So my my fault. That is, nigga. My fault. He's what? not the most complex character, and there's definitely nothing here to indicate that he's the former infamous outlaw Pinhead Larry. Except for one teeny tiny detail in the season 12 episode, The Nitwitting. In this episode, we very briefly see Larry working out at his gym, but we can clearly see that he's drinking a kelp shake. Kelp shake. And that wouldn't mean anything to you, unless you remembered the season 4 episode, Best Frenemies. In this episode, a new restaurant opens up selling something called a kelp shake. Ah, a new star on my block! Everyone's enjoying a delicious kelp shake! They pop up out of nowhere, and we never find out who was really running them. The kelp shakes Franchise, have an initial bad what? taste, but they are extremely addictive. This tastes like a wet gym sock. Gym sock. Hey, this ain't half bad. This is amazing. Like, to the point where people basically get hooked on it like a drug. Crabs, we're all out of juice. Well, we gotta get more. The kelp shake restaurant is later shut down, and the shakes are banned because apparently they have some kind of radioactive material in them. Oh, Take decades to clean this hazardous material up. I sure feel sorry for whoever drank this. But then why does Larry have the same banned kelp shake eight seasons later? 
maybe this is just a random throwaway easter egg? I mean, we never see him with a kelp shake again, just the generic protein shakes. Except, let's take a closer look at those protein shakes. In the season 11 episode, Larry the Floor Manager, Larry briefly takes over as manager of the Krusty Krab and turns it into a gym. Now we only yeah, serve salad uh, and protein power shakes. He forces SpongeBob to sell protein shakes, and even though the cups look different, the color of the liquid is the exact same the as the kelp shake. They even seem to have the same initial bad taste. <laughs> You like? No, Larry. No. I think every time Larry <laughs> drinks or sells a kelp shake, he is actually selling the illegal, addictive kelp shakes from Best Frenemies. Now, we never see anyone grow any green hair, but knowing what we know about Larry, there's no way he would be drinking it himself if it had the same side effects. Right. I think Larry was the one behind the original kelp shake restaurants. But after they were banned, he tweaked the recipe and started secretly reselling them as rebranded protein shakes. How else do you even explain Larry having the same kelp shake here eight seasons after they were banned unless he's the one making them? In Squid Plus One, he even admits that he's the one who makes his protein shakes. I just need to stop by the apartment and make myself a protein shake. This oh explains God, how a Larry. lifeguard could suddenly I'll afford to open a massive gym. Exactly. He's secretly a kelp shake drug lord kingpin. And if you still don't believe me, we see I'll Larry standing next to a protein shake store called Protein Fiend that has a green kelp logo and the word kelp shake on the sign, clearly referencing the kelp shakes. And this is also the episode with the Mrs. Puff newspaper, so you know the creators were like in a hiding lore mood. There are too many connections here for this to be a coincidence. Larry the Lobster is the criminal mastermind behind the kelp shakes. But does this also in. mean that he was the former infamous criminal, Pinhead Larry, who faked his death? Well, believe it or not, Larry the Lobster has also had a near-death experience in his past. In Squid Plus One, Larry oh, mentions Jesus. that the protein shakes saved his life. You don't need that glop. Oh, I wouldn't call it glop. Protein shakes saved my life, bro. Like, what does that even mean? Okay, hear me out, hear me out. What if... This is how he survived his death. Sandy killed him and his partner, but the radioactive properties of the kelp shakes brought him back to life. Protein shakes saved my life, bro. So, of course, Larry would continue to drink and sell these kelp shakes. They literally saved his life. Even if they're radioactive and illegal, to him, this is a way to help himself and everyone around him become stronger. The thing we know he wants most of all. It explains why he gets so defensive when Squidward insults his protein shakes. I love protein shakes. <laughs> Okay, okay, Dang. but there's still an obvious issue here. If Sandy killed Pinhead Larry, why doesn't she recognize him now? Well, I think we get a possible explanation to this in the Camp Coral spin-off episode, Game Night, where the camp skinny. counselors play a board game called Lobster skinny Trap. If you take away the beard and the eye patch, the lobster on the box looks exactly like Larry, a direct clue about Larry the Lobster being a criminal. Just like that Flying Dutchman game, I think this game is based Whoa. on the real legendary criminal Pinhead Larry. This explains why Sandy wouldn't recognize Larry the Lobster. Either this is a criminal disguise he wore, or or, and I'm just speculating here, it's actually what he used to look like, and the healing properties of the kelp shake fixed his eye. And if you're still not convinced about Larry's criminal connections, I've saved my best evidence for last. Remember that old lady that raised Larry? So polite! We should call my nephew! She's just a sweet old lady. There, there's no way she would have raised a criminal mastermind, right? Well, in the season 9 episode, Patrick Man, she is revealed to be none other than the Dirty Bubble. Oh, dear! <laughs> the dirty bubble! This man gotta be stopped. Tease me. De tease, tease me! Us. You know what? SpongeBob! Well, the creator, y'all said the creator died, so he can't teach us, but... Writers! You know what? For the love of God! You know what? You know what, Alex? It's time to work, man. Yeah, what the heck? It's time to work. Jeez. This random old lady was actually one of the most notorious criminals in Bikini Bottom all along. Man Ray's partner in crime, the Dirty Bubble. Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy's arch nemesis, the Dirty Bubble. And I know what you're thinking. Maybe this is just a disguise he wore in this one episode. It doesn't necessarily mean this old lady has always been the Dirty Bubble. But I checked everywhere, and I can confidently say that we have never seen the Dirty Bubble and this lady in the same scene. And she's a pretty common background character. Also, she lives in the same retirement home as the Dirty Bubble's nemesis and we see her constantly in the background watching them. She is literally the perfect cover for the Dirty Bubble to spy on. Oh, and there go the man! Oh, wait. Which man? Right there, behind. That's the man. That's her, uh, the one who raised oh. him. On them. But most damning of all, this old lady is friends with and even went to high school with Man Ray. Why, hello, Ray. Mabel, I haven't seen you since high school. Larry the Lobster was raised by the Dirty Bubble, explaining I how know. he became the infamous criminal known as Pinhead Larry. And wait a second. 
Pinhead Larry was dirty. raised by the dirty bubble. The only criminal dirty we know in the show dirty. whose entire gimmick dirty. is being dirty. Uh, uh, holy sh! The dirty bubble is Dirty, dirty Dan. Dirty. It fits too perfectly. This would also explain how Dirty Dan faked his death. The dirty bubble is constantly being killed and later brought back to life with a bubble blower. The Dirty Bubble and Larry the Lobster were the infamous criminal duo Dirty oh Dan God, and Pinhead Larry. After nearly being oh killed by Sandy, God. they changed their identities and split up. The Dirty Bubble continuing his criminal pursuits with his new partner. Have we ever seen Larry deal with the Dirty, dirty bubble, bubble by themselves? Partner Man Ray and Larry the Lobster choosing a more subtle approach yeah. by secretly selling illegal kelp shakes. And even though they've been apart for years now, the Dirty Bubble still left a little reminder to his old partner. Dirty Dan was here. Yes, he certainly Holy was. And that is the Pinhead up, Larry the Master? Lobster Theory. And that is the end of Alex Bale's SpongeBob Conspiracies. Thank you very Holy much. Holy moly! He cooked! He cooked. That's a... Okay, I'm done. That is every possible SpongeBob theory I can think of. I got no more. I have fully emptied my brain of every stupid SpongeBob thought I have ever come up with. There is no more reason to ask me for more, okay? Like I said, if you haven't seen my big SpongeBob compilation yet, go check it out because there is tons of new content in the old theories. One of them was even kind of directly confirmed by the creators, so give it a watch if you haven't yet. Listen, I'm sure they will make more SpongeBob episodes and spinoffs and movies that will be full of new lore to theorize about, but I'll probably w just let other theorists take writers, it from here. So yeah, too. more theories on the way. I'll probably keep covering Blue's topics Clues. like Spongebob that are nostalgic Blue's and unsuspecting. Blue's Clues, uh, Blue's Clues, Blues Clues, Blues Clues, Blues Clues, okay. 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 Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. You putting it together? Blue's Clues, Cars. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I gotta look at it. I gotta look at it. I gotta back up. I gotta back up. I gotta back up. Baby Mar Mario? 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 No? No? Fall that's out? a that's a sitcom up top. Holy Oh wait, that is a sitcom. That's um I had to take my glasses off. See look. Oh, this is a fucking Chico. Cause I naturally see like this. <laughs> that's fucking um What the fuck is that? That's Pop Tarts. High That's school Pop -Tarts. musical Pop Tarts. This right here. Yep. Pop Tarts. That's Pop Tarts commercial. So Pop Tarts uh universe uh theory. Some of the girls awake. Uh I can't tell what those other three are. This looks like um a TV show. I can't figure out what it is. I guess I might as well announce some of the theories I'm working on. I'll be releasing a Blue's Clues theory and a High School Musical theory. There's, there's just a lot to talk about with both of those. I'm really excited. I'm also working on a bunch of other theories too. Uh, I just don't want to reveal them yet. So go ahead. Pop Tarts. That is Pop Tarts. That is Pop Tarts. That's a Pop Tarts commercial. That's a Pop Tarts commercial. That's definitely Cars. That's Cars, Pop Tarts commercial. I can't tell what this is at all. That, this is a TV show. This is damn near home improvement. Either a TV oh show my or a commercial. Corey in the house is not Corey in the house. That's a white man. That's a, mm. matter of fact, I'll tell you what it is. It's a white man with brown blonde Puff. or brown hair. Cocoa a Puffs. white woman in a pink shirt. Coco Puffs full house. A white woman in a pink shirt and Wait, she got blonde hair. Mikey. I think it took off his glasses. Yes. Yeah, he see. said he naturally see like this. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, bro, I can clearly Malcolm see, in the middle. I can clearly see that's the Pop Tarts commercial. Holy shit. That might be, nah. Could that be Frankie Muniz? Go ahead and subscribe Ooh, to catch those. I don't know when or what order That's I'll be good. posting those in. Yeah. I might even post yeah. something else besides those two first. Well, we'll see. Thank you for all the support on these SpongeBob well, videos. Look, they our video ain't done here. Right? What's, 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 Y'all can go watch his four hours, but we're also going to put on the other theories in this video. Squilliam Fancy Son. Squilliam Fancy Son. Squilliam Fancy Son. Squilliam Fancy Squilliam Fancy Son. I don't remember that being that nigga last name. The Squilliam guy? Yeah. I barely remember Squilliam. I, I, I remember thought it was Squilliam Fancy Pants. Oh, is that a, a Mandela effect? I could have swore it was Squilliam. Oh, shit. I don't know, bro. That's right there. That's okay.
Jason the third is Squidward's rival from high school band. And Squilliam Fancy's son. Squilliam Fancy's the third is Squidward's rival from high school band class. Right. So I just took my private yacht across my private lake to my private heliport. He's more wealthy, ah, popular, remember, remember. and talented okay. than Squidward, yeah. and he always rubs it in his <clears throat> face. That's right. I'm living your dream, Squidward. Oh, <laughs> just succeeding in everything you failed in. But I intend to prove that he's a fraud, using his wealth to make he's himself more popular and talented than he actually is. He goes to ridiculously really? extreme and expensive lengths to humiliate Squidward and show his superiority, and I'm gonna prove it. Okay, I believe you. Was one what of my you favorite got? shows from my childhood. Even going back now and rewatching the old ones, it still holds up. You might think it's just a kid show. There's no content. It ain't no motherfucking kid show, bitch. SpongeBob it's a fucking Bob. escape from bills and real motherfucking shit. Rent is a thousand and five dollars. Lights is one twenty three. Water is like sixty seven, give or take a fucking extra few showers on a sweaty day. Internet is like 80. <laughs> Netflix is like 13 and some shit. Amazon so Prime. You escape with SpongeBob. I escape with every motherfucker. <laughs> I don't want to say what happened to I'm about to start trying drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Mushrooms. <laughs> Cocaine. <laughs> I'm about, to start, I'm about to start trying shit. Don't Why do it. Wrong? Don't do it. Don't do it. Y'all gonna see me on the episode of What Happened to the YouTube? <laughs> Whatever happened to Internet Air? <laughs> Play There's nothing joy. worth theorizing about, but the show constantly brings back characters and references to previous episodes. And if you look closely, you can connect the dots and find some very interesting stories. And today, okay. I'm going to okay. prove that Squilliam Fancyson the Third is a manipulative fraud. Okay, Seven I can see one, it. I can see it already. Hospital. The pit hospital. We first meet Squilliam in Season 2, Episode 15, Band Geeks. The episode opens with Squibber playing the clarinet and getting a knock on the door. My boy Squibber was trash. <laughs> yeah, uh, we're with the pet hospital down the street, and I understand you have a dying animal on the premises. Wow. Immediately after, Squibber gets a call from Squilliam. Hello, you've reached the house of unrecognized talent. Please start after the- Hello? Sounds as though you've got a dying animal to attend to, eh, old chum? I believe that not only was Squilliam oh, spying on Squidward to know when he was playing his clarinet, but he also hired the doctor to come and embarrass Squidward. Yeah, uh, oh, we're with the pet oh, hospital oh. down the street. Pet hospital down the street. We have never seen a pet hospital in Bikini Bottom. We've really? only ever seen just the regular Bikini uh. Bottom hospital. We've seen this purple doctor fish before, but but once again, he's never worked at a pet hospital. We've only ever seen him at the regular general hospital. Well, Mr. Squarepants, it seems you have the suds. Are you ready for your treatment? Then there's this green fish. Oh, I ain't gonna lie. We've only ever seen him as one of the many identical paramedics that work at the Bikini Bottom Hospital. Ah, so we even see him at the end the of the episode to take Squilliam away after fainting. So it is very likely that Squilliam hired these two and oh, told them to pretend like they're from. Oh, nigga, that's like one of the best episodes when SpongeBob took over the man. the Super Bowl. Yes, the Super Bowl. Super Bowl. That yeah. shit was clear. In the heat. Oh my Pat God! Just to humiliate <laughs> but this is just the start of Squilliam's elaborate lies. Evidence number two, the bubble bowl. In the okay, same episode, Squilliam also says, I'm the leader of a big fancy band now, and we're supposed to play the bubble bowl next week. The problem is, I'm busy next week and can't make it, so I was hoping you and your he band could up. cover for he us. Set him up. But we've never seen Squilliam's band before, and despite claiming he's too busy to make it to the bubble bowl, he's yeah, still he there band to yeah. Squidward's band. So both his excuse and probably his band were made up to pressure Squidward into humiliating himself at the bubble. Yep, he set him up. Evidence number three, Squilliam's friends. In season three, episode eight, Squilliam returns. Squidward leaves for work and conveniently bumps into Squilliam and all of his fancy friends, despite Squilliam not seeming like the kind of guy that would come near the Krusty Krab. He and his friends make fun of Squidward for working as a cashier. Okay. Hold it. Don't tell me. You're a cashier. <laughs> all right, all right. I'm going to break this one down right here. Break let me, this one down. Let me you tell feel? you because I, 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 I got down, this. Break this one down. Binoculars. Activate. Just break it down. I just want to try to cut cookies. <laughs> <laughs> but break it down. But bro. 
all those people have been seen going to the Krusty Krab, those regular people that we've seen around Bikini Bottom. You got the dude who, I don't even, I don't know if that's chocolate or my leg. Okay. Right here under, you got it. Under, under. Right here. I don't know if this is chocolate or my leg. Right. But we've seen this guy eating a burger in the fucking Krusty Krab. I don't know how you remember that, but right. We've seen her in the Krusty Krab. Okay. And we've always seen these two in and out the Krusty Krab. You know what I'm saying? So these so, are people that we've seen around Bikini Bottom. He just Bottom. hired them to act like. He just act like he got a posse. And he only like, got like, that role. Like, like he, does, he doesn't have any other rich. No outfit. other clothes. No other. No if other he was clothes. rich, you'd have more rich. Pieces. He should have hair. Exactly. He got a unibrow. Like, oh, why? Lying. lying always makes it worse. But I believe that this. Why did niggas start to cry? <laughs> I don't know. He, he was wanting like, to cry. He be embarrassed, bro. It was planned out by Squilliam in advance, and he hired all of those people oh. to pretend to be his friends. Take a look at Squilliam's friends. They're all nicely dressed. You kind of get the sense that they're fancy, high status. And they're all wearing shit they ain't never wore before. I'm telling you, that's what he about to say, except for her in a purple dress and her in the pearls. They didn't wear that shit before. Members of Bikini Bottom, but they aren't. This is more like what the fancy rich people in Bikini Bottom look like. Uh, These are just some regular Bikini Bottom citizens. Most of them usually don't yep, even wear nice yep, clothes like this. Yep, and most of them are regular yep, like the Krusty Krab. Yeah! No screw as a kid. Yeah! Right, Patty doesn't have enough slime! Mm. These are not the type of people Squilliam would Big air! I mean, why would Squilliam be hanging out with one of Pearl's teenage friends? Oh, At the end of the episode, Squilliam even admits to his whole- Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, he- Okay, let me see, let me Friends. see, let me see. Let me see, let me see, let me see. Okay, I was wrong, I was wrong. At the end of the episode, Squilliam even admits to his whole life being fake. I made everything up about my life. I have no yachts, jets, or anything. I was only trying to impress you. And then, of course, he quickly says he's just kidding. Is that true? No. Nope. Of course not. I felt they stinking rich. But was he kidding? I mean, obviously he's rich, but is there a nugget of truth in there? Evidence number four, right. the statue. In season seven, episode six, Squidward has to pick up trash for community service, and Squilliam once again conveniently bumps into him and reveals he's cleaned up so much trash that the city actually built a statue of him. <laughs> Maybe if you clean Both up the kitty bottom, they'll build a statue of you. Oh wait, they've already built one. If you're rich, why are you cleaning up trash? Exactly. I'm not. I'm not going to trust. I'm not, I'm not touching. I'm not going to pay. I'm going to pay. Like once, to do my once, charity. once I get my first million, I'm not even going to touch you, commoner. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a commoner. I'm now. like shake his hand. Shake his hand for me. <laughs> Hello, Michael. This is Aaron Tanjay. Right <laughs> of me. I cleaned up all of Bikini Bottom in only one week. I believe that once again, this encounter was staged by Squilliam, and he actually paid to get that statue built. As Squilliam tells Squidward about the statue, a female fish admires it and says, Bless you, Squilliam, fancy sim. Bless you. But if you remember, this Yo, I didn't buy the same ass that same hoe. Oh. I need to go to bed. <laughs> we do, but we got a couple more videos. Oh man. Those friends Squilliam likely paid, making the whole eyes, comment bro. feel very it, fake. By the end of the episode, Squilliam's statue gets destroyed. A police officer so approaches fake. and they have this exchange. This is your statue? It was. Squilliam admits that the it's city his don't statue, own it. not the city's. And why else would the officer give him specifically a ticket if it was city property? Fast. That's number five, the concert. I ain't ever gonna lie, bro. I ain't I'm gonna keep it a buck with you. If y'all commit a motherfucking murder or y'all in jail for a crime, y'all did not do hire this nigga. Yes. This nigga is a detective and uh, possibly a lawyer. I don't know. He could be. You, you, should, you should go to school for that. You, hey, I'm gonna break the law. And you, you are going to admit it. it on camera. I'm going to assault Michael. <laughs> no, I need on. them to know the crime so I can be acquitted. If the glove don't fit, acquit. Bye. That's how yeah. that's how I also six, got away with it. 17. Squidward watches Squilliam play the clarinet at a big fancy concert. He receives a standing ovation, causing Squidward to leave angrily. But I believe this entire concert is a scam. Not only has the audience been paid to cheer, but Squilliam never even touches his instrument. 
Once again, many of the audience members were part of Squilliam's quote-unquote friends, but we also uh, never actually see Squilliam play the clarinet. The episode opens right after he's finished his performance with the audience cheering, and one member of the audience says, He's such a great musician. He doesn't even have to touch an instrument to be brilliant. Maybe the real reason Squibber leaves so angrily is because the audience cheered for Squilliam even though he never even touched his clarinet. Maybe okay, Squilliam is just as bad as Squibber okay. at the clarinet and he's trying to hide it. Squilliam has gone to some pretty extreme lengths just to humiliate Squidward, but nothing, and I mean nothing, nothing. compares to what he does next. Okay. Do Evidence next? number six. I like the build-up. The music college. I like the build-up. In the same episode, after Squidward leaves the concert, he's approached by the headmistress of the Bikini Bottom prestigious music college. Aren't you the esteemed Squilliam Fancyson the third, who we all came here to see perform tonight? She mistakes him for Squilliam and offers him a position as a professor. Squidward pretends to be Squilliam and teaches a class, only for the police to burst in and arrest him, all while he's being filmed on live TV. And I no, believe no. that this is Squilliam's most elaborate uh, and most expensive scheme to destroy Squidward both publicly and legally. This encounter where Squidward gets offered a job there, is already buddy. suspiciously convenient, but listen closely to their exchange. I'm Squilliam Fancy Sam. But didn't you just say a minute ago that your name was Squidward Q Tentacles? It is. No, I mean, uh, no, no, I didn't. Well, that's a relief. I mean, what kind of a moron would go to their worst enemy's music recital? How does she know? Uh, How does she know? True. How does she How does fucking she know? know? Yeah. Ow. You're on to something, my guy. You're not on You're to on something. A... You're in it. I'm raw. No condom. And it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> the light, the truth is coming to the light. Exactly. Okay, I see where we're going with this. What kind of moron would go to their own enemy's music recital? How does she know that Squidward and Squilliam are enemies? Facts! If she knew who Squidward was, then why didn't she recognize him? Why would she mistake him for Squilliam? This feels way too much like she was hi- Also, also, we're going to keep it a buck. Keep it a buck with us. He don't have a unibrow. True. She would have known. And he don't even have on the uniform. And she was at the crowd when they... Yeah. She was in there. She, she was there. She yeah. was there. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's the classroom when the cops show up. Yeah, but what I'm saying is she was at the recital. Nigga. Yeah, she was at the recital. And he, Squidward doesn't have on the recital clothes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, come on. Yeah. Hired by Squidward. And how was she already outside when they just let out? No, he walked out early. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Look at us, Master Detective. Okay, we with you. We with you, my guy. William to set a trap for Squidward. And if that's not enough, the headmistress's associate is literally just a guy from the paid audience wearing a disguise. He just threw on some glasses. Damn. 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 But I ain't gonna cap this all could just be fucking Nickelodeon being cheap and recycling characters. You know what I'm saying? They don't wanna I mean, draw true. new characters. But God G, you might be on to something. This is to seem smart. Squilliam knew that Squidward couldn't resist the opportunity to teach a music class, even if it meant breaking the law. My very own music class. Then we get to the Bikini Bottom prestigious that music college, like and right off the bat, there's something very fishy about that this place. Like the building itself is very green and grimy, and right. has a very cheap metal look. Barking Nothing about weird. this says prestigious, except for the big sign on top, <laughs> which feels like the only that thing it was about set up. I think there is a very good chance that Squilliam just bought some old warehouse and yep. stuck a sign and some paint on yep. it to disguise it as a college. I mean, look at these other schools in Bikini Bottom. Yes, they all sir. have a very nice Even structure and a paint job, but this prestigious music college looks like a dumpster. Going into the class- It could be just because, you know, it's a music, it's a music degree. You know what I'm saying? Like, nah, nah, go with the theory. Go with the theory. Go with the theory. I'm with conspiracy saying. theorists, go with the theory. All right, all right. But I was just saying like, Nobody trusts, like, nobody, like, say there's, like, a, music, a degree in music or really. You're going to offend some musicians out there. Maybe. I'm not here to offend nobody. I'm just saying what the world says. Like, I wanted to be get a film degree. And they was like, I found a And look at me. Fucking six years later, computer science senior. I ain't finishing that bitch. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I ain't here to offend. I'm just saying what the world says. 
Let's get it. It's like getting a degree in photography. That's pointless as hell. Don't ever get a degree in photography. <laughs> <laughs> that is the most pointless thing. I'm just saying. Yeah. Music, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Classroom. Not only does it have another one of Squilliam's friends, but if this is such a prestigious college, why is SpongeBob and Patrick in here? Would you two numbskulls mind telling me what you're doing in music class anyway? Sure. Patrick's New Year's resolution was to learn to play an instrument. They say it was their New Year's resolution to take a music class, but you'd think it'd be harder for them. Not gonna count. If it was prestigious, they wouldn't have probably got in. And we ain't gonna cap. Let's keep it a buck. Keep it a buck. Let's keep it a buck. Right? The thing everybody in the room is missing. Michael, if you could, scoot to your right. A little bit more. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a fact! <laughs> <laughs> that is a fact! <laughs> a fact in music class! <laughs> ain't nobody said in school for that! Sit <laughs> getting dick down by Willie in the back. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie, what the hell she got on a fucking bikini? She ain't there trying to get chills. For them to get into an esteemed music school if they just decided to go to it on a whim. Seems like they're just letting in anyone to sell this ruse. Then, both the police, Squilliam and the headmistress, and a live news broadcast show up at the same time to arrest Squidward for impersonating Squilliam. If the extremely coincidental fact that all of these people suddenly showed up at the same time isn't enough for you to believe that Squilliam set right, it all up, got a mega I've got something thing. that's going to blow your Okay, mind. build us up then! Squilliam literally has the police working for him. Yeah! We're two tentacles, I'm placing you under arrest for impersonating a genius. If that doesn't sound like he's been paid yes, off, yeah. I don't know what does. Yeah. The lengths that yeah. Squilliam goes to humiliate Squidward yes, are sir. insane. He literally builds statues and entire buildings just to make Squidward feel inferior. That's petty. But why? That is why would petty. anyone go so far to embarrass an old high school band classmate? What happened between them? What could have caused this extreme level of dedication? Well, unfortunately, we never really get much information on the past. But I spent hours reading through the SpongeBob Wikipedia and looking at old episodes, and there really just isn't any clues that would explain their weird relationship. I guess we can't solve everything, but Damn, that, way, is a, that is a that's mystery. my theory. Thank you so much for that's listening. Gonna go I really on hope talk. you guys enjoyed. I'll see you next time. Wait a second. Wait, wait, whoa, 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 whoa! Wait a second. Season six, episode five, Slide Whistle Stooges. Just a normal. This nigga hard. This nigga hard as fuck. I ain't gonna cap you. This, this is the hardest <laughs> nigga ever that has ever existed. He got you. He reels it back in. Nigga, I said, <laughs> nigga, he I wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. This wait, is wait, the wait. hardest YouTuber who has ever lived. And he just getting started. That's the crazy. Hey, bro, you wanna be friends? You wanna be friends? If you watch this, let's be friends. Let's be friends, man. Normal episode where SpongeBob and. Season 6, Episode 5, Slide, Slide Whistle, Whistle Stooges. Just a normal episode where Spongebob and Patrick and always Squidward. Nothing really out of the ordinary. Except I have one question about this episode. Whoa! You saw that, that was robe? his robe! You saw that robe? You that, saw that robe? Go, play it! You saw that robe? Yes! Nothing really out of the ordinary. Yes! Except yeah. I have one question about this episode. Why does Squidward have Squilliam's robe? That is clearly not the purple robe he usually wears. That is Squilliam Fancy Son the Third's robe. Why would Squidward have this? Cause he's dreaming. Unless they were more than just classmates. Could they have once been dating? No way. <laughs> That's not possible. There's, there's no. no evidence to support that. Whoa, 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 whoa. Right? Don't be intimidated, Squidward. Try to imagine him in his underwear. Oh, no, it can't be. I mean, what kind of a moron would go to their worst enemy's music recital? It's been right in front of us this whole time. Our sources last saw evil harassing teenagers up at Makeout Reef. Ah, uh, Makeout Reef. Good time. Good time. Voted most likely. SpongeBob SquarePants is yeah. not what you think it is. There is a secret right. group of puppet masters who are always watching the citizens of Bikini Bottom and pulling the strings. Hidden within Bikini Bottom are spies that keep an eye on the characters and make sure everything goes to plan. This is a conspiracy that will fundamentally change the way you look at the show SpongeBob SquarePants, Let's and I believe it's all actually intended by the creators, and I'm gonna prove it. 
This is the television theory. Okay. 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 Bro, this is, this is you guys had a great reaction to my squilliam fancy sin theory and i had yeah, a lot that was from a good fucking it. video squilliam you lying deceiving bastard i didn't even realize that Damn, so trust me when i say video. that what i've discovered this time is much much bigger to start this theory okay. we have to go back to the very beginning of the very first episode of spongebob squarepants ah the sea so fascinating so wonderful here we see bikini bottom teeming with life Home of one of my favorite creatures, SpongeBob SquarePants. SpongeBob. Yes, of course he lives in a pineapple. You silly. So let me ask you a question. Why does he live Who's in a pineapple? Who's speaking in this clip? Facts. Well, obviously that's just the narrator. We hear his voice many times throughout the show. Ah, uh, Goo Lagoon, a sticky mud parallel to you and me. Ah. Uh, the crusty crab. Through these doors pass all the many kinds of undersea life. Pops boating school. Okay, okay, okay. Students oh, 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 oh. the rules of the road. But who exactly is the narrator? Well, he's just the narrator, right? We're not supposed to think about who he is or why we're hearing him. Lots of shows have narrator framing devices we're not supposed to think about. Caillou was amazed that mommy had made a rainbow. Just like in the picture. Nigga, that but hella throwback. There's something different about this narrator. He sounds a lot like he's narrating a nature documentary. The ocean. From above, a simple blanket of water. Very true. But Very below, true. a complex world full of color, life, and wonder. Nigga, why well, I feel like this, I just got transported in time back to 2007 and I walked into biology class. Yeah, yeah. There's Plenty no books. Born there's a video. projector. And we're already watching videos. Yeah. This is crazy. This is a hell of a nigga. I feel great. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the sea, so fascinating, so wonderful. Here we see Bikini Bottom teeming with life. What if I told you that he's not just some random disembodied voice? He's an actual character in this universe. Cat. Here we are again at the Bikini Bottom boating school. Today is once again the day of SpongeBob's boating school exam. But more importantly, this is the last test for the year. And if SpongeBob does not pass this one, it means another whole year of boating school! Oh, damn. SpongeBob literally crashes into the fourth wall, and we actually get to see the narrator and the camera he's been filming with. The show SpongeBob Yo! SquarePants is not just a cartoon. What? Everything we see is a part of a nature documentary television show being filmed by scuba divers. And if you're still not convinced, I searched really, really hard and found an Yo, old SpongeBob hello. DVD bonus feature that basically confirms everything. Since before time even existed, land-loving scientists have tried to learn the secrets of intelligence. Their studies led them to the sea, where the citizens of one undersea colony demonstrated a genius so enormous, the scientists See? felt compelled okay, you to want some Alex? for use in teaching mankind how to live better. The name of this miraculous place? Bikini, Bikini Bottom. Bikini Bottom. Pouring wow. over the mass of brainy masterminds scattered about this strange land, the scientists chose six Bikini Bottom residents at random to study. As the scientists marveled at the advanced knowledge and superior oh, intellect of like these six thing. creatures, I went to college! They rolled their cameras and took notes. And now, finally, we can learn all of the things that these smarty pantses have to teach us. Life lessons from Bikini Bottom. I don't know how it can get any more clear than that. Now, if you rewatch the show True. with this new information in mind, some things start to take on a whole new meaning. Throughout the series, there's this weird, unexplained running gag of a human hand interfering with the characters. It's even in the beginning of every episode in the intro for the show. Maybe the filmmakers are doing a bit more than just studying these characters. The hand seems to mostly they interfere with the reality the show. And safety of the characters, like treating SpongeBob for the suds. Well, Mr. Squarepants, it seems you have the suds. Are you ready for your treatment? Oh, Hans! They filming a fucking reality show. It makes sense that the filmmakers <laughs> don't want to risk the safety of their main character. After all, there's no show without SpongeBob, but that's not the only reason why they interfere. Bro. Season 3, episode 16, I Had an Accident, is infamous for having one of the most absurd, confusing endings in the entire show. It ends with a real gorilla suddenly coming out of a Patrick costume and attacking the characters. A real gorilla? I remember this. 
<laughs> How the fuck is he breathing in the water though? <laughs> That's what I used to ask myself. And then as soon as SpongeBob begins to question the logic of the scene, this happens. What's a gorilla doing underwater in the first place? Oh, uh, well, it, it's funny you should, I mean, the, see the two uh, charts are on the the. Let's get out of here. One of the city citizens. One of the townsmen. SpongeBob is a weird show, but this has always stuck out as being just a little too weird. Yeah. But knowing what we know now, I think I can explain what's going on here. This isn't a real gorilla. Every other land animal Obviously. we've seen underwater wears a helmet and is drawn in a cartoony style. The gorilla is shown in a live action style, and the only time we ever see live action characters is when they're human. So I believe both the gorilla and the horse he rides away on are humans wearing costumes. The filmmakers set this whole thing up just to make the episode more entertaining. It's starting to seem like this isn't strictly a nature documentary anymore. It's more of a reality TV wow. show for entertainment. Wow, okay! Who knows the absurd elements of the show are actually put there by the filmmakers to make the show more entertaining and profitable. Although, based on the people's reaction, it doesn't always seem to pay off. But how far will the filmmakers go to make the show more profitable? Ah, uh, Saturday morning in Bikini Bottom. SpongeBob is watching his favorite Saturday morning show, The Adventures of Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy, enjoying a bowl of Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy brand cereal, and oh wearing God. the official Mermaid Man oh and God. Barnacle Boy breakfast bikers. If we think of this as a television show, this sounds an awful lot like a product placement. Mm. I mean, listen to how the narrator specifically says brand the full names of the products. The Adventures of Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy. Brand new Mermaid Man and right. Barnacle Boy brand cereal. Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy breakfast bikers. Why don't you let me fix you some of this new Mococo drink? All natural cocoa beans from the upper slopes of Mount Nicaragua. No artificial sweeteners. What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> Who are you talking to? Maybe the Mermaid Man and Barnacle <laughs> Boy TV show is actually from the surface world. They are human after all. It makes sense that the filmmakers would choose to highlight these popular superhero characters. The more they show, the more they're gonna sell Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy merchandise. Hang on a second, why are Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy the same size as all the fish in Bikini Bottom, even though humans are always shown as massive compared to fish? Uh, wh whatever, I'll, I'll come back to that one later. The show doesn't even just hide product placements. In the episode Model Sponge, they literally trick SpongeBob into making a commercial for a human product. I'm ready for my close up, Mr. Director. Very well. Lose the pants! Pants! There's my star! What's happening? What's happening? In this scene, oh. we'll be cleaning bathroom fixtures. Okay, so where's my cleaning utensil? You are. You are. You get it. You are the cleaning utensil. Oh no, your bathroom is a disaster. Get it cleaned up fast with the new sponge. <laughs> Household chores are a snap with new sponge. It cleans. Damn, they did my boy dirty. Even though he a sponge. Just look at that shine. This is just like in real life how Spongebob is such a popular character that he's used to sell tons and tons of products. Mm -hmm. Hey, get some money there! Get some money there, Alex! Okay guys, so this is the oh, ultimate life hack for buying all this new gaming stuff for cheap. Okay, so first, go to one of your- so far, I've shown you that the show SpongeBob SquarePants is actually a documentary television show, right. but the creators continually interfere- So, what you got, what you got, what you got? So, 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 it brings up a question. What's the question, pimp? If this is a TV show, right? Does that mean everything with Squillium is fraud? Like, all that is not, it's just an, an added bonus to further they the added, plot. They added Squillium to mess with Squidward. Not like, the like, do you think, could they have written that in? Written in, well, they're, they're it's a nature documentary. So, I don't know. So, I, hmm. I'm gonna go with they added Squilliam, but it's a nature so, how, boy. How they gonna add there, it? It's animal. a reality show, but it's a nature documentary. But it's also a reality show in True. nature. In the Kardashians, it's their life, but they're adding things to, or in any reality show they that we know, of, they add drama to make them fight. Okay to push their own agendas and make more money. But that brings us to an important question. 
Do the characters know they're in a television show? Let's go back to that clip where SpongeBob hits the cameraman. It means another whole year of birthday school! Yo, he ran he into that right. He ran. What happened? I don't oh, remember that scene. SpongeBob. You just struck another pedestrian. Mrs. Puff calls him a pedestrian, which sounds more like she thinks he's just some random bikini bottom citizen. The different types of marine life in SpongeBob are so diverse They're and weird looking not. that it's not too hard to believe that the characters just think these filmmakers are another weird type of fish. And back to the gorilla episode, the gorilla and the horse immediately get nervous and run away when SpongeBob questions what's going on. <laughs> Uh, well, it, it's funny you should. I mean, I don't think they know. George, yeah. they're onto us. <laughs> Let's get out of here. Almost like the creators don't want the characters to be aware their lives are being interfered with. Now, there isn't a yeah, ton so of footage I don't of the characters added, interacting please. with the filmmakers, but I dug really, really deep and found the smoking gun that answers all of our questions. This is an old commercial from 2004 made to promote the SpongeBob movie. <laughs> SpongeBob. What kind of jellyfish is that? It's not a jellyfish, Patrick. It's a spaceship. Is that a camera? Ooh. Is this a submarine? Hey guys, it's Carlos from the Zone. Oh, I was submarine. wondering if you could answer a few questions. Questions? Run for your lives! No, Pat, don't you see? It wants to learn about our world, and it's chosen us. What? Yay! <laughs> We've been chosen. Yeah, a submarine comes cool. down to SpongeBob and Patrick to ask questions to promote the new movie. SpongeBob and Patrick are clearly confused by this and think the submarine is some kind of alien. They also have no idea that they're the stars of a movie. Well, thanks guys. We'll see you in the movie. Bye! Movie? What's that? I know. I thought they had a movie theater. So I think it's pretty clear at this yeah, point do. that the they characters are unaware shows. their lives are being... Remember when they had the breath in the movie theater? They showed them. And they was breathing on each other. <sighs> yeah. Old filmed and interfered with. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's characters that have to have some level of awareness. For example, the doctor fish the that doctor told the human knows. hand to treat SpongeBob, and the director fish that directed the commercial for the human world. What makes these characters so special? First off, the director fish isn't actually from Bikini Bottom. Before he directed this commercial, we saw him as a citizen of New Kelp City in the episode Whatever Happened to Spongebob. Out of all the characters they could have used, they specifically chose a character from out of town. Almost like the filmmakers didn't want to use anyone in Bikini Bottom so they wouldn't risk everyone finding out about the television show. Then there's the doctor fish. We don't know where he originally came from, right. but he's an extremely suspicious character. Usually he's purple, but sometimes he's orange, sometimes he's purple with orange hands, sometimes he's a pirate, and he bears a striking resemblance to Dr. Manowar from the Jellyfish Convention. And now it only hurts when you touch him. <laughs> Why does he have so many different disguises and bottle. identities? What is he hiding? I believe hidden throughout He's an actor. are spies like this who are aware they're in a television show and keep tabs on the main characters. Damn, that nigga was sucking the fuck out of that burger. You saw that nigga? <laughs> like, are right. spies like this who are aware they're in a Look at the, the television show and keep oh, talking. That nigga's fucking that hole now. Main characters and make sure everything goes to plan. There's so many suspicious characters in Bikini Bottom that it could literally be anyone. The mailman, the hot dog vendor, old man Jenkins, it could literally be anyone. But what if I told you that the biggest spy of all isn't some random side character? Oh, it's shit. one of the main characters oh, of the shit. show. Sandy! Someone has been there from the very beginning. Patrick. Someone who's not even from Bikini Bottom. Sandy! Someone Sandy! I just said that! You didn't hear that shit? No, I wasn't listening. Uh, oh, I wasn't listening to you. <laughs> oh, you motherfucker! Sometimes, like, when you talk, I forget you exist. Oh, you motherfucker. God Who's dang. not even from the ocean. That's Sandy. right. Sandy. Sandy Cheeks. Damn. Sandy Cheeks is the thrill-seeking, scientific squirrel from Texas who lives underwater in her tree dome. But why did she come to Bikini Bottom? In the episode Chimps Ahoy, we find out she was hired by a group of chimpanzees to come underwater and create inventions. But why does she need to be underwater why to make inventions? Yeah. She could have just as easily have made any of her inventions on land. It sure. must be extremely expensive to maintain a giant dome of air underwater. There is no way the only unless reason they, she's here is Unless to those aren't real chimpanzees. Well, no, never mind, never mind. Make random inventions. I think this whole episode is an elaborate ruse to throw off the other characters from the real reason Sandy is in Bikini Bottom. To spy on the main characters and make sure the show stays on track.
Many of the times okay, the characters okay. are in danger, Sandy conveniently steps in to save the day, and many of the wacky, entertaining episode plots are driven by an invention Sandy creates. Everything she does is a calculated move to carry out the hidden agenda of the filmmakers. Her entire friendship with Spongebob and the other characters is built on a lie. Wow. What you're probably saying, Sandy is a sweet, it. friendly squirrel. There's no way she's behind this. Texas, you're not though. convinced yet? No, no. That's okay because what I'm about to show you is so mind-blowing, so insanely revealing, that it's actually the whole reason I decided to make this video. You're good You're at this, Alex. Big one. You're fucking You're good Season at this. 10, episode 10, oh, Feral shit. Friends, is the episode that unlocks this oh, entire shit. mystery. During a birthday party, a green moon suddenly appears and turns everyone except Sandy into less evolved, real-life versions of themselves. Sandy is completely caught off guard by this and decides to call someone for help. And take a guess, who she calls. Huh. The submarine. Hello, French narrator speaking. Hi, Frenchie. It's me, Sandy. Ah, uh, Sandy Cheeks. How is it hanging? Uh, oh, it's not hanging too good, Frenchie. You see, there's this... Don't say another word. I have been monitoring the behavior of the green moon all day. Huh. Yeah, I guess that's a pretty interesting clip, yeah. Holy shit! Sandy literally calls the narrator to let him know what's going on and ask for instructions on what to do next. She has been working Direct with him the entire line. fucking time. He even has a picture of her on his desk. This is where I originally planned on ending the video, but there is still one small issue with the television theory. Just one nagging plot hole that contradicts everything. If this is all a television show filmed by scuba divers, then how are we seeing inside the buildings? It's not like any of the humans filming the show could fit inside them. It's the one annoying thing- Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy. Damn near. They're the cameraman, Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy. That keeps this theory from being complete. I mean, the most logical explanation is that they have hidden cameras inside of everyone's homes, but we never really see anything like that. Holy shit. Season 6, episode 24, Truth or Square. The SpongeBob 10th anniversary special where they reveal lots of stuff about the characters. But the most damning piece of evidence comes from when the characters get lost in the Krusty Krab vents and end up in a room full of monitors showing live footage of all of their homes. I didn't see that episode. Oh, my house is on TV. I didn't oh, see that episode. You get down from that bed this instant. Hey, there's my house. Middle, wow. Look, it's Sandy. <laughs> and who is the character responsible for all of these hidden Mr. cameras? Krabs. Mr. Krabs, why do you have cameras watching us? <laughs> oh, but, uh, Dave, I just want to make sure you all floss after every meal. Nigga, Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Krabs. Bro. Yeah. Yeah. Very important. Dental hygiene? Eugene, you lying bastard. Huh. Of course. I thought he was about to say, you <laughs> lying bitch. <laughs> he would sell out his friends for a quick buck. And if there's any part of you that thinks there's some chance Mr. Krabs has all these hidden cameras for some other reason, then take a look at what happens next. Hey, who are those guys? I think it's us, Patrick. But who are they? All right, they're not even trying to hide it anymore. A cameraman and a boom operator have been following around the characters this entire time. And just like the gorilla, as soon as they get seen, they make a run for it. The case is closed. Uh, television! The television theory is something the television. show has consistently alluded to from the very first episode to the newest episodes. Maybe one day the show will actually directly address it and our characters will discover the real truth about it's their still world. Going? But regardless, that's my theory. I hope you guys enjoyed. Let me know what you think in the comments. Make sure to subscribe okay. if you want to see more. See you next time. Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Hang on a second. You thought I forgot about the Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy thing, I didn't did. you? All right, here's a quick bonus theory. Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy were two superheroes that fought crime underwater and protect- The Wajumbo belt. The belt. It's the fucking belt. It's the fucking belt. ...to the sea from evil. Whether or not they actually did this or it was all staged for television isn't clear, but they both spent their lives underwater until they became old and retired. But after spending so much time under the sea, they no longer fit in with human society. Plus, Mermaid Man is clearly dealing with some form of dementia and PTSD from fighting evil. But you can't retire. There's evil afoot. What? Evil! 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 
So they decided to live the rest of their lives in Bikini Bottom. And in order to fit in better with their fellow sea creatures, they made the, the fucking decision belt. to shrink themselves I using the Mermaid fucking Man's belt. shrinking belt. Damn. The case is closed. Damn. Again. Okay, Alex. You're good at what you fucking do, man. You're good at what you fucking do. That's nice, a lot of research nice. went into that thing. I can totally get with it, man. If you will, what to do, crew. Hey, you if you real, what to do, crew. You made it this far. Give them the word, player. Comment, Krabby Batty. We said we heard it's gonna be good. This is not Mrs. Puff. What? You may think she's just SpongeBob's boating teacher, but you'd be very, very wrong. Okay. For years, she's been running okay. from her dark and mysterious past, but it's finally caught up to her. And behind it all is a mastermind who's been secretly controlling her life and psychologically torturing her. If you guys thought my last two theories were mind blowing, get ready for my biggest conspiracy yet. This okay, is okay. the Mrs. Puff theory. I gotta start Let's off by saying, it. wow, the reaction to my last two Spongebob theories has been insane. Let's go! Shout out to Alex Ray! I wasn't expecting that part. <laughs> Okay. I'm glad you guys are enjoying my ridiculously deep dives into this show. I mean, I have to watch so much SpongeBob and read so much of the Wikipedia to put these theories uh, together, yeah. but it's worth it because uh, the writers actually it. take the time to set these things up. Now, a lot of people have been asking, Alex, how do you come up with these crazy conspiracy theories? Well, God well damn it. I always start these theories by looking for the moments in the show that seem to be implying more than they're letting on. Like I've said before, SpongeBob is a weird show yeah. with lots of abstract humor, but I can usually understand the intent the writers had behind a weird joke. But then there's stuff like this. Wasn't this a dream? I hope I still remember how to do this. What the fuck? Oh, I'm good. Yeah. And it's so confusing and weird that it feels like the writers are trying to imply something beyond just weirdness for the sake of comedy. And nowhere in the show is there more of these moments than with Mrs. Puff. Okay. And once I started looking okay. into okay. it, it led me down the deepest rabbit hole I've ever seen from this show. So, let's begin. Puff's dark past. Mrs. Puff is a boating school teacher in Bikini Bottom. She's right, passed right. all of her students except for one, SpongeBob SquarePants. He's taken her driver's test hundreds of times and he always ends up failing it and causing destruction and chaos that usually ends up with Mrs. Puff going to jail, despite he sucked, it not man. really being her fault. Leave we also know that she was man. once married, but her husband was killed by fishermen. That's Whoa. my driving teacher, Mrs. Puff. Mrs. Whoa, I did not know that. That's dark as hell. Is she? Oh, oh she's crazy. married. Oh no, Mr. Krabs, she's single. Then what happened to Mr. Puff? Yeah. I remember she doesn't like to talk about it. Throughout the show, there are moments like this that seem to be hinting at her having a dark, mysterious past. And in season two, episode 10, No Free Rides, we get the biggest clue about who Mrs. Puff really is. After SpongeBob fails the driving test yet again, Mrs. Puff has just had it with him and ends up just giving up and giving him his license, even though he never really passed. She quickly realizes that this is a horrible idea and he'll probably end up destroying the entire town. Yeah, I remember this part. <laughs> so much destruction. This reporter asks, why? Local consensus places the blame on this negligent, selfish driving instructor who... <laughs> remember this clip, because it's going to be very important later on. And okay. then she says this okay. insanely revealing line. What have I done? Everyone will know that I let him slide through school. I'll have to move to a new city, start a new boating school with a new name. No. Not again. Oh, Bro! I, I remember that. I remember yeah, that. Not again. I remember that. Okay, yeah, okay. Okay, here we okay, go. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Got a long ride. Buckle not up. Again. Come on, it's like they're just begging someone yeah, to make yeah, a theory yeah. about this. Let's go! So we now know Mrs. Puff was originally from I'm a different, a different town. town. Right. She used to own a different boating school. Right. And Mrs. Puff isn't even her real name. Mm. There's something in her past that she ran away from. Now, there's been some debate over whether she killed her husband. I'm Damn jumping man. it. I'm jumping it. You I'm think she killed her husband? She killed her husband. Or well, it could she could have not had a she husband at all. She set that nigga up. No, she could have not had a husband at all. Mrs. Puff is not a real name. 
So uh, she could not even have, okay. Whether she's actually referring to a new name for herself or for her boating school, but I do think she's talking about her own name because if she's trying to run away from something in her past, she wouldn't start a new boating school with her real name in the title. Now, when she says again, I don't think she's just referring to starting a new life. Everyone will know that I let him slide through school. Not again. I think at her previous boating school, she had a terrible student just like Spongebob, who she prematurely gave a license to, and it led to something so terrible happening that she had to run away and start a whole new life. In season 3 episode 5, Doing Time, we get a flashback to when she first opened up the school. school, I pledge that as long as a student is willing to learn, I shall never give up. Hi, I'm SpongeBob SquarePants. With the opening of this new boating school, let's keep in mind that this is not her first boating uh, school. Maybe uh, the whole reason she's making this okay, pledge okay, now. Instead of my first, instead of my first, it's new. Okay, 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 we're picking up what you're putting down at her second school is because she gave up on a student at her previous school and that led to her having to run away and start a new life. She's pledging to never make the same mistake again. Now let's skip ahead to one of the newer episodes. Season 12, episode 21, Lighthouse Louie, where Mrs. Puff has Spongebob organize all the stuff she keeps in the school's lighthouse. There's lots of interesting things hidden in the background, but the first thing that caught my eye was this file labeled Mrs. Puff. Okay. It makes sense for a teacher to have files on all their students, but why would she have a file about herself? But let's remember, she's not Mrs. Puff. That's a fake identity she created. And I'm willing to bet all of her fake identification documents are in this right file. There. Back okay. in No Free Rides, she just gives SpongeBob a license that she already had for him. So she clearly makes these licenses and would probably know how to make fake identifications. Oh. But that's not the only hint about Mrs. Puff's past in this lighthouse. There is something in here that directly confirms all of this. As Sp the ring. Ah. Spongebob swallows all of Mrs. Puff's junk, we see something very interesting for only a few frames. Deranged boat teacher makes getaway. Oh. Ten seasons later and the creators are still hiding stuff about Mrs. Puff fleeing her old life. It might not look like it at first, but we actually get a ton of new information from this newspaper. This, this is from the New Kelp Post. Distracts authorities with balloon animals. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, come on. Which tells us Mrs. Puff originally lived in New Kelp City. Then there's oh, a caption that reads, Distracts authorities with balloon animals. And do you oh, remember that clip from the beginning? Yeah, I hope I still this, remember bro, how to do this. I hope I still remember. <laughs> oh, bro, bro, hold up. How deeper does this go? That means she, she, oh. she was doing that just in case she got caught. Yeah, to yeah, distract yeah. the authorities. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, bro, bro. <laughs> So whenever okay. Mrs. Puff makes a getaway or commits a crime, she leaves behind a balloon animal to distract the police. I'm telling you guys, these writers don't just do stuff randomly, they have reasons for everything. And the most damning piece of evidence from this newspaper Sheep. is actually the picture of Mrs. Puff. Kind of a Sheep. strange photo, right? We have seen this exact same photo of her before. In the episode No Free Rides, when she imagines what would happen if Spongebob got his license. Local consensus places the blame on this oh. negligent, selfish driving instructor. This means that this isn't just her imagination of what might happen. That happened! It's also her remembering That's... what happened when she lived in New Kelp City and prematurely gave one of her students a license. And I'm willing to bet that the fish reporting the news Yo. is the exact same one who reported about her in New Kelp City. Uh, Let me explain. We know I from bet. the episode Whatever Happened to Spongebob that reporters from the Bikini Bottom News can also work for the New Kelp City News. Yeah. But the real reason I think this is because of his hair. In the entire show, we have never seen this fish reporter with hair before. Yeah. Why would the creators go out of their way to add that detail? Mm. Because Mrs. Puff isn't imagining him as he looks now. She's remembering him when from years younger. ago when he Damn. used to have hair when Damn. he reported about her in New Kelp City. Mrs. Damn. Puff has been running from her past ever since and is now forced to relive her experience with an unteachable student through Spongebob. Bob, but reliving this trauma has pushed her to the point of complete insanity. And trust me when I say that you have no idea how delusional she actually is. Ah, oh, shit. This is good. This is good. Another it's running hard. gag throughout the series is Mrs. Puff's occasional nervous breakdowns or moments of insanity because of Spongebob, and they get more severe as the show continues. At first, she did care for Spongebob, but in the newer episodes, she literally tries to kill Spongebob just to get him out of her life. Even Spongebob just walking up to her gives her severe PTSD. Hi, Mrs. Puff. Ah! Hit the brakes! Spongebob! Watch the tree! Laugh! Wait, Mrs. Puff! Driving. But these mostly seem like just one-off moments, and for the most part, Mrs. Puff is still a functioning member of society. 
right? I'm going to show you that she's actually much, much more insane and delusional than you may think. And some of the episodes hey, she's oh, in take oh, place- I, We need that sound effect, bro. <laughs> Send us that sound effect. <laughs> <laughs> that ho clean, I ain't gonna lie. Cinematic booms. Entirely in her own head. <laughs> if we're talking about how insane Mrs. Puff is, there is no better place to start than the episode doing time. Once again, SpongeBob fails the voting test and causes destruction and chaos, which leads to Mrs. Puff going to jail. SpongeBob yeah, keeps breaking that. into jail to try and bust her out, but Mrs. Puff actually prefers being in jail over teaching him. She we actually get another interesting line about Mrs. Puff's past in this episode. Okay, you can do this, Puff. You can get through this without losing your sanity. Oh, that's a road we don't want to go down. Again. So we know that Mrs. Puff yeah. has lost her sanity in the yeah. past, probably from her previous terrible student. But it seems like she's recovered since then, except in this episode she has a complete mental breakdown. SpongeBob keeps appearing in impossible places until she gets thrown into solitary confinement, where each wall of the room transforms into a giant SpongeBob face. And then the episode ends in a way that's so weird and confusing that it rivals the infamous gorilla episode ending. As Mrs. Puff freaks out, she's suddenly transported back into the beginning of the episode when SpongeBob SpongeBob was taking the test. Except this time, SpongeBob gets arrested instead of her. Help! Help! No! This is not a good time! No! I can't believe it! It was all a dream! I'm not going to jail! Why would you go to jail? You already did your time. Ah! So what's really going on in this episode? Was the ending all in her head? Is Mrs. Puff just caught in an endless loop? I think this entire episode is inside of Mrs. Puff's head, and she's actually on the outside the whole time, but she's been imagining herself inside of prison. I can explain. Listen closely to what the police officer tells right, Mrs. Puff. I'm not going to jail. Why would you go to jail? You already did, did your time. time yeah. Why would you go to jail? You already did your time. And then revealing she's still in a prison uniform despite being on the outside. So this scene is obviously inside of her head, which means everything we see is symbolic. And if we can understand the symbolism of it, we can understand what's really going on with Mrs. Puff. Notice how she's suddenly wearing a black and white striped prison uniform, mm -hmm. even though the entire episode she's been wearing this orange jumpsuit. Why would the creators go to the extra effort to draw a whole new prison uniform for her? Well, we've seen her wear this black and white prison uniform before. The very first time she went to prison back in season one, episode seven, Hall Monitor. Okay. So when the police officer says, you've already done your time, he's referring to the first time she went to jail. But why is she still wearing that uniform outside of prison? Well, she may have gotten out of jail, but she was by no means free. Having to teach SpongeBob is a prison in itself. Yeah, it's, it's, and she yeah, manifests yeah. that by believing she's in jail and wearing a prison uniform despite being on the outside. This entire episode, every time SpongeBob magically appears, Years is all inside of her head. She is completely delusional, and hints that she's experiencing these hallucinations don't stop there. Just six episodes later, she goes to a house party SpongeBob throws, and while everyone is talking and having a good time, in the background we see she's literally sitting by herself talking to an ice sculpture of SpongeBob. You can't tell me this isn't intentional. I mean, look at this. <laughs> now, back in the episode No Free Rides, there hell. was a very strange picture inside of. She's crazy as hell, bro. Mrs. Puff's home. It's a picture of Mrs. Puff inside of a picture of Mrs. Puff inside of a wow. picture of Mrs. Puff creating an infinite loop. This is something that has confused SpongeBob fans for years. But like everything in the show, there is a reason for it being there. One of the SpongeBob storyboard artists actually called it the biggest mystery in the entire show. If you think about it, this is just like the end uh, of Doing Time, where she's stuck in an infinite loop of SpongeBob failing the driving test. Because it's all symbolic of what her life is, just an endless cycle of SpongeBob taking the test and failing, and no matter what she does to try and escape, she always ends up back in the same place wait, at the end. Wait, 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 Okay, so does this mean that none of, could, could none of the episodes we see Mr. Miss Puff in, could none of those be real? Could they all be like her mind, like a mind trip? That could be a twist on it. That could be a twist on it. Right now I'm settling. It feels at... like the Matrix. 
I've never seen The Matrix, so I don't know. Oh, shit. At the end of the episode. So this picture is another symbolic manifestation of what she's feeling. We even see another one of these pictures all the way in season nine, episode five, bumper to bumper. This is something that the show is consistently alluding to. Mrs. Puff is an unreliable narrator and anything we see with her could potentially all be inside of her own head. In fact, I believe I found another episode that takes place inside of her head. In season nine, episode 17, SpongeBob Long Pants, SpongeBob goes to a different boating instructor and actually gets his license. But as soon as he does, we briefly cut to Mrs. Puff waking up. You pass. I finally got my driver's license. Oh, oh. Lock your doors. Buy your windows. It's the end of the world. Now, this seems like it's probably just a throwaway gag where Mrs. Puff somehow senses that SpongeBob got his license and it causes her to wake up and freak out. You know, it's a good bit. It's funny. But I have a question. If the joke is that she's supposed to be waking up at the exact time Spongebob gets his license, how come she wakes up at night when Spongebob clearly gets his license during the day? Because this entire episode yeah. actually takes place inside of Mrs. Puff's head. Damn. And this is the only part of the episode in the real world. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that was all about, but I'm glad it's over. But let me pause for a second. I'm sure some of you are already wondering if this contradicts my previous SpongeBob video, The Television Theory. If you haven't watched that one, the gist of it is that the entire show is a documentary television show, and everything we see is actually being secretly filmed by scuba divers. And there's a ton of evidence to support it. I'm very proud of that video. You should definitely check it out. But if everything's supposed to be from a camera, then how are we seeing things from, from inside mind. Mrs. Puff's yeah, head? Yeah, yeah. In fact, how do we see dreams and flashbacks and thought bubbles? Well, uh -huh. I think the simple answer is that even though we view the show through an objective camera lens, the world itself still follows the rules of a cartoon. You can never tell another <laughs> living soul. Wait, wait, hold on! What's that? My pen is out of ink. Plankton! You'll never get me formula. Not even in a flashback. In the world of SpongeBob, you can imagine something and other people can still see, record, or interact with it because that's just how cartoons work. Back to the theory, we know that her insanity has caused her to live a life of delusion. But if you remember back to the Lighthouse episode, she's also become an extreme hoarder. And looking at her collection of junk is like a look directly into her mind. So there's gotta be something we can learn about her from it. There's a picture of her boyfriend, Mr. Krabs, the hall monitor belt she gives her students, the mean drawings her students make her, Spongebob's diary, a boating safety helmet. Wait, Spongebob's diary? Why does she have Spongebob's diary? The last time we saw that, it was safely put away in Spongebob's library. What's it doing in her lighthouse? And why does she have Squidward's painting? And uh. a table from the Krusty Krab? Uh. And Spongebob's bike? Uh. And Squidward's teddy bear? Whoa. And the hair curlers Mr. Krabs Whoa. had? And that statue of Squidward? And that diamond ring? And that crown? And that bucket of radioactive waste? And that jellyfish sign? Oh my She's god. Mrs. Puff is a kleptomaniac. Ooh! Mrs. Puff. Oh, I was right on the money. What buddy. exactly is a kleptomaniac? A, 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 a person that just lives to steal. Like, they just steal, 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 steal. Oh, shit. Has been stealing from everyone in Bikini shit. Bottom. I can even prove that her pet snail from season three, episode 19 was stolen. My snail is up, but true. That was, wasn't that original. If I remember correctly, that was originally Squidward's. If mm -hmm. I remember correctly, that was originally Squidward's. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I remember that snail Ray Gary, but I don't know if that was later on in the show. I've had her since I was a little girl. No! Hmm, you've had that snail since you've been a little girl, huh? Then how come that is the exact same snail Squibble I knew it! Four episodes ago in it. the Great Snail Race. I knew it! I wouldn't let Snally here play with that mongrel mutt. She's a purebred. See, she even has her own papers. He even has her paperwork. Mrs. Puff clearly stole the snail from Squidward. But why the hell would Mrs. Puff steal all this other junk? What possible use could she have for any of it? We could find the answer to that question by looking at this green hat and this purple jacket. These were gifts Mr. Krabs bought her on their first date, but she ended up feeling uncomfortable receiving them and gave them back to him. I'm afraid I just don't feel comfortable accepting all these gifts. <laughs> Except apparently she's not too uncomfortable to steal them back ba afterwards. Yes, so clearly Mrs. Puff isn't stealing this stuff because she wants to use it. She just steals for the thrill of it. Maybe stealing things is like her way of coping with the insanity of her everyday life. And remember, this isn't the first time she's gone insane. You can get through this without losing your sanity. Oh, that's that's motherfucking you don't crazy. Want to down again. In fact, I have reason to believe that she started stealing things <laughs> way back whenever she first went insane. I hope I still remember how to do this. I don't think she's just talking about remembering how to make balloons. And it sounded like it was more stuff in the bag than just balloons. Yeah. 
animals. She's probably also referring to remembering how to steal a boat. And if that's not enough for you, in a Spongebob comic book, she actually admits that she used to rob banks and she wears the exact same ski mask. Damn. Mrs. Puff lives a completely delusional and miserable life, all because she has to teach Spongebob how to drive. It's led her to steal from the people she cares about and completely disassociate from reality. But that begs a very important question. If Spongebob is causing her life to be so miserable, then why does she even keep teaching him? After all the destruction and pain he's caused, she'd totally be justified to expel him, right? I mean, she will literally try and kill him so she doesn't have to teach him, but for- Well, that goes back on what she said at the beginning, that she won't give up on the student. Oh, yeah, Her yeah, yeah, not yeah. giving up on the student don't mean she, she not gonna kill him. <laughs> for some reason, she can't just expel him. It's almost like there's someone forcing her to teach SpongeBob. Wait, what? Ooh. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Back to the episode No Free Rides, after prematurely giving Spongebob a license, she steals his boatmobile so he can't hurt anyone. In the end, this causes her to get arrested and go to jail, but then Spongebob tells her this. And besides, the warden says she'll let you go early, if you do her a favor. What's that? Free driving lessons! She'll get to leave prison early if she gives free driving lessons. That seems like an oddly specific requirement. And that's not the only time this gets mentioned either. In Season 9, Episode 5, Bumper to Bumper, we get this scene. If only Spongebob could pass his boating test, he'd be out of my life once and for all. Unfortunately, I keep getting reminded of the consequences if I get too uh, angry with a little shit. nuisance. Consequences? Uh, Are you telling me shit. that if she refuses to teach SpongeBob specifically, she'll be violating her parole and get sent back to jail? Why does the prison even care, Mrs. Puff? Typically, consequences reminded wait, wait, wait. out of my. Okay, I had to see if it was on her leg or not. I had to, I had to back it up. I was trying to see if that really was on her leg. The ankle monitor. Uh -huh. Yeah. If she refuses to teach Spongebob specifically, she'll be violating her parole and get sent back to jail? Why does the prison even care if Mrs. Puff teaches Spongebob? Is it just part of some weird community service? But things start to get really suspicious at the end of Season 7, Episode 5, Summer Job. Once again, Mrs. Puff ends up in jail, but this time she's forced to go to a prison boating school. Oh, wow! A driver's education class! Good day, class! What? <laughs> <laughs> What's he doing here? <laughs> Dear Mrs. Puff, I'm following in your footsteps and got a job wow. as a driver's ed teacher for the summer. <laughs> yeah! Who in their right mind would hire SpongeBob to do this after he's literally destroyed the city countless times while driving? Is and doesn't have a license. Is this exactly. just another one of Mrs. Puff's delusions? Or is the prison intentionally forcing her to be around SpongeBob just to torture her? I mean, look at the way the guard forces her to sit there and listen to him. And look at that evil smile he has as he watches her endure this torture. There is something very strange going on with this prison. Then, in Season 10, Episode 8, The Getaway, Mrs. Puff meets a criminal named Dorsal Dan and starts to get romantic feelings for him. This is also while she's still dating Mr. Krabs. Damn. Shame on you, Mrs. Puff. At the Damn. end of the episode, they both accidentally land in prison, and the warden puts him in solitary confinement. Warden, I found this one pulling up outside the prison. Dorsal Dan, a notorious getaway driver. Toss him in the clink. I'll wait for you, my little tender fuck. In or out of jail, this prison will stop at nothing to make sure she is alone and miserable. But why? Who's behind all of this? Why would anyone care this much about torturing Mrs. Puff? Who's the mastermind pulling the strings? Oh, well, that maybe Mr. it has Graf. something to do Mr. with Graf. her old life oh. in New Kelp City. Maybe she crossed someone and they've been plotting their revenge ever since. But I've looked in every single frame of New Kelp City and there is nothing connecting it back to the prison. I've looked literally everywhere and there's not a single person from the city that has anything to do with Mrs. Puff. Well, I mean, maybe except for the literal warden of the prison she's being kept in. He may be hiding slightly off screen, but that is clearly the same warden of the Bikini Bottom prison. And this isn't some random background character that the show reuses all the time. He is a very distinct character. You can call me out on the Squilliam video all you want, but not this time. But wait a second, wait a second. If the warden was originally from New Kelp City, then he'd probably know about Mrs. Puff's dark past and her true identity. So why hasn't he exposed her? He's just kept quiet about the fact that one of his in- Cause maybe he's the one who she gave the license to. 
Maybe he's the one she gave oh, the license to. Shit. Oh shit! If I'm shit. right, if I'm right, you gotta bring me on a conspiracy video. If I'm right, <laughs> I gotta, I, you gotta let me in on one, bro. You gotta let it. You know? He got a good mic to do the voice. Hey, over. bro. I, hey, look, I got a sure SM7B. What's up with you, bro? Let's go. Nate's is living a completely false identity. She'd probably even get more prison time when they find out who she really is. So why hasn't he said anything? This him. is where things get it's very him. interesting. If I'm right. If I'm right, I am the GOAT. I am the greatest of all time. If I am correct. So, we know Mrs. Puff. And for anybody on some bullshit, this is the first time we're watching this. Prematurely gave a student at her original boating school a license. And that led to them causing chaos and destruction. Maybe this student accidentally did something terrible to the warden. And he's blamed Mrs. Puff ever since. Whatever happened was so terrible that it caused him to move to Bikini Bottom and get a job as the warden of the town's prison. And to his surprise, he finds out that one of his inmates is actually the person he blames for that terrible thing happening. This works out perfectly for him. He can finally get his revenge on Mrs. Puff by making her life miserable. All he has to do is reveal her dark secret and she'll be stuck in jail for much longer. Except for one small issue he with can. his plan. Mrs. Puff actually likes being in prison. One day down, 2,528 to go. Oh, that's just shy of four years without SpongeBob. I'm going to enjoy this. So he comes up with a new plan. Keep Mrs. Puff's secret and let her out of prison early, but only under the condition that she has to teach SpongeBob. He's literally turning her normal life into a prison. And he makes sure going back to prison to avoid SpongeBob isn't even an option for her anymore because he'll make sure that SpongeBob is always in there with her. And he He's not gonna let her escape and start a new life like she did in New Kelp City. He makes sure to give her an ankle bracelet that okay, doesn't that let her real. leave Bikini Bottom. I can't even leave town that without was, violating yeah. my parole. He is the mastermind yeah. who's been controlling everything this entire time. But guess what? His insidious plan doesn't even end there. This is not the first time we've seen the Warden character. We first see him in Season 4, Episode 2, Crabs vs. Plankton. This in this episode, Plankton research. slips on some water in the Krusty Krab and decides to sue Mr. Krabs for everything he owns. And then guess who shows up out of nowhere and offers to be Mr. Krabs' lawyer? What I really need is a good lawyer. Hello, did somebody say lawyer? Richard A. Bottom Feeder, attorney at law. I couldn't help but notice that despicable display. Richard A. Bottom Feeder, the warden of the Bikini Bottom Prison, is also apparently a lawyer? That's kind of strange. Those both sound like major careers. You usually wouldn't imagine someone being both. Then he says he'll be Mr. Krabs' lawyer completely free of charge. So, uh, how much is this gonna cost? Me. Actually, I won't charge a dime unless we win. Well, that's awfully generous of you, Richard. He seems very confident that he can win the case, but right before he goes to court, he slips on some water and says SpongeBob will have to be Mr. Krabs' lawyer now. Oh, this is gonna be a slam dunk. Oh, no! Mr. Krabs' lawyer, speak to me! Wrapped with pain, can't move. Looks like you're gonna have to handle this one, son. He tells he SpongeBob that he has to represent Mr. Krabs, he even though purpose. he himself called SpongeBob a liability. Actually, SpongeBob, we won't be needing any testimony from you. Why, well, you'd be more of a, uh... <laughs> of a liability than an asset. But it's okay, because apparently all SpongeBob needs to win is inside of Richard's briefcase. Everything you need to win <laughs> is in this here case. <laughs> really? Everything? Except when SpongeBob gets to court, he realizes that Richard never gave him the combination to the case. It's uh, all in here. Really? Yep, right in here. Is there a problem? Uh, your lawyer didn't give me the combination. Either Richard A. Bottom Feeder is the worst lawyer in history, or this is all part of his elaborate plan to ruin Mrs. Puff's life. Here's what I think happened. First, he finds out that Mr. Krabs is being sued, and he wants to ensure that Mr. Krabs loses the case because he wants to destroy any chance Mrs. Puff has at finding love. So he pretends to be a lawyer, Damn. even offering his services for free, something Mr. Krabs can't resist. He makes Mr. Krabs feel confident that they're gonna win the case, and then at the last second, he pretends to get into an accident so he can't can't represent Mr. Krabs. Instead of finding a real lawyer to replace him, he tells the most incompetent person for the job, SpongeBob, that he has to be Mr. Krabs' lawyer. And he gives him a case that allegedly has all the answers in it without actually giving SpongeBob the combination, setting him up for a total failure in court. Richard A. Bottom Feeder refuses to let anyone get close to Mrs. Puff, not Dorsal Dan and not Mr. Krabs. This guy has squillium levels of hate for Mrs. Puff, yeah. but why? What exactly did her previous student do that warrants this 
much torture. It can't be something as simple as him or his property getting damaged. It has to be something life-changing. Something like losing a loved one because of the student's reckless driving. And I think the show gives us one last hint about who this might have been. All the pictures of Mrs. Puff's house are very meaningful to her. She's got photos of Mr. Krabs, her pet snail, and of course those infinitely looping photos that told us so much about her mental state. But there is one more photo in this house that might be the key to this entire conspiracy. In season 12, episode 14, Plankton's Old Chum, we see a photo of someone we've never seen before on Mrs. Puff's wall. There's some surprising similarities between this character and Richard. The green color, the red bow tie, the overall fancy, serious appearance. It clearly isn't the same person, but maybe this is someone related to Richard. Like a father, a son, or a brother that Mrs. Puff's former student killed. And the reason she keeps a photo of him up is to have a permanent reminder to never make the same mistake of giving someone a license who doesn't deserve it. Mrs. Puff is a boating school teacher who once made a terrible mistake that led to the loss of her business, identity, sanity, and any chance at finding happiness. I like to think that there used to be a time when she was happy, back when her husband was still alive. If only he was still around today, maybe she wouldn't have to face all of this on her own. Thank you for watching, everyone. I hope you enjoyed. Nah, 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 is what nah, I would nah, say if nah, I was nah. done. Except her husband is still alive. Woo! Let's do this. What? In the SpongeBob movie, SpongeBob and Patrick travel to a gift shop named Shell City that's full of dead fish turned into knickknacks and ornaments. Except they end up setting off the smoke detector, which activates the sprinkler system and brings all the dead fish back to life, including a very familiar-looking puffer fish uh -huh. hanging from the ceiling. Uh -huh. Mr. Puff is alive. Well, wait a second. If he's alive and he escaped, then why hasn't he gone back to Mrs. Puff? Wait, wait, wait. And that would mean that her name is actually Mrs. Puff and they were married. How long? Why is she still alone? Because remember, she ran away from their home in New Kelp City and started a new identity. So sadly, Mr. Puff has no way of finding her. The tragedy of Mrs. Puff's story is that her happiness is just a city away, but she can never even leave town because that would violate her parole. Richard uh, A. Bottomfeeder probably uh, even knows her husband is alive and is making sure they're never reunited. As the name says, Richard really is a bottom feeder. This video took a ton of time and effort to do all the research for, so I really hope you guys enjoy. Thank you for watching, and thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring this theory. Go to nordvpn.com slash alexbale or use code alexbale. This filmmaking. What's the what's the sit here? What you gonna feed? No, this this cinematography. <laughs> Step in the focus. Step in the focus. Okay. What do we have here? What you got going on here, Bucko? Oh, he's feeding somebody to get the secrets. Richard A. Bottom Feeder, mm. or whatever his real name is, I feel like he's actually the student that no, because Mrs. Puff will remember him. That's very true. But and that's another thing. I think she, she doesn't she, recognize him. She doesn't know him. So yeah, it has to be something the student did. Has well, to be. Oh, that's good. That's, that's good. Oh, that's I good. Can, I'm, oh, we waiting. We that's waiting good. on it, brother man. We waiting on it. Bikini Bottom Citizens, the result of nuclear radiation. What? Who is Pearl's mother? Yes.
What is the Krabby Patty secret formula? Oh! These are by far the three biggest questions in the show SpongeBob SquarePants. And today I'm going to be answering all three of them and more with just one theory. Let's go! Get ready for the darkest SpongeBob conspiracy you'll ever see. This is the Evolution Theory. Okay. 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 We're back with another SpongeBob conspiracy. Guess I'm the SpongeBob guy now. Yeah. That's, that's all I know. Yeah. You guys should sure <laughs> love these SpongeBob theories. Alex Bale out with another video. Let's go. The makers of SpongeBob interfere to put in their own message to brainwash you people. Squilliam sends the doctor in. He's not really a doctor. He's just trying to infiltrate that little round thing on his head there. Oh my God. Thank God for Alex Bale. Look at that. He's helping me prove my point. Let's go. You know yes, sir. Awesome. Maybe some of you love them a little too much. Yeah. Oh my God. Other videos, right? I, I make films and stuff too. Anyone want to watch those? We got Any you. We got you, bro. We got you. Y'all go to this man's channel. We got you. Check them out. Say less. But I mean, you, you the sponge. You, You gotta whisper down here, buddy. Alex, we got you. We're gonna watch all of your movies. And we're gonna be your biggest fans. We got you. I just wanted to make this really creepy for no reason. Why are you fighting this? Why are you fighting this? <laughs> <laughs> Fucking idiot, bro. You ready? I'm ready. We good? We good. Sheesh! Sheesh! Anyways, by far the most popular SpongeBob theory. Oh, out and my question is, does this disprove your other theories? Does this, or does this tie them all together? There okay. is the bikini yeah, atoll yeah, yeah, nuclear yeah, yeah. radiation theory. It's pretty simple. It's been confirmed that Bikini Bottom is actually beneath a real-life place called Bikini Atoll. From right, 1946 right, right. to 1958, the United States did nuclear tests there, devastating the area and leaving it radioactive even to this day. The theory states that the reason why the citizens of Bikini Bottom can talk and have formed advanced societies is because of mutations caused by these nuclear tests. Mm. And that's about the whole theory. Even though there's tons and tons of videos about it, none of them actually go in depth with it or really look through the show for evidence. But y'all know that if Alex Bale is making a theory yep. on it, then it's not going to be some baby surface level analysis. Let's get it. I will watch every single episode of Spongebob. Yeah. I will read every page of the goddamn Wikipedia. If I'm making a theory on it, then you guys Let's know go. it's going to be good. And once I really started looking into this theory, I realized that there is so much more here than anyone thinks. Get ready, because today we're going to be solving the biggest mysteries in the history of Spongebob Squarepants and changing the way you look at the entire show. So without further ado, let's begin the theory. In order to find out whether the Bikini Atoll theory is true, we first have to determine whether fish talking and being so intelligent is unique to Bikini Bottom, or if that's just the way the SpongeBob universe works. You know, it could just be that all animals in this world are able to talk, and that's completely normal because at the end of the day, SpongeBob is still just a cartoon. Right, well, right. If we take a look at season 10 episode. Oh, I've already found sort of a kink. What? Oh. Uh, and I know he's gonna talk on Sandy. Sandy talks. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. All right, let's, let's go. So 10 feral friends, we get a bit of a hint about how the SpongeBob world works. In this episode, a green moon appears and transforms all the characters into less cartoony, real-life versions of themselves. SpongeBob? Patrick? Just like in real life, they can't talk and end up trying to eat each other. The French narrator is watching all this unfold, and he says this very important line. I have been monitoring the behavior of the green moon all day. It is called Neptune's moon. Every 100 years, it de-evolves everyone in Bikini Bottom into primal fish. Every 100 years, it de-evolves everyone in Bikini Bottom okay. into primal fish. So this implies that the characters in Bikini Bottom are, are more evolved, evolved yeah. and were once like these primal fish. But this doesn't prove that the evolution only exists in Bikini Bottom. It could still be a worldwide phenomenon. Remember that bonus DVD clip I found in my television theory? It was about humans studying fish in Bikini Bottom because of their intelligence. Land-loving scientists have tried to learn the secret of intelligence. Their studies led them to the sea, where the citizens of one undersea colony demonstrated
created a genius so enormous, the scientists felt compelled to record their actions for use in teaching mankind how to live better. This makes it sound an awful lot like the fish in Bikini Bottom actually are uniquely evolved and it's not some worldwide phase. Exactly. Then, in the SpongeBob 20 year anniversary special, SpongeBob's Big Birthday Blowout, we get a major piece of evidence for this theory. SpongeBob and Patrick take a tour of the surface world <laughs> and eventually go to a fish store and see some very realistic, less evolved fish. Uh, what kind of monsters would want to keep fish folk in jail like this? They're so beautiful. They can't talk back to SpongeBob and Patrick, and they're actually able right. to swim freely through the water instead I've of being affected by gravity. They are clearly showing us that both evolved and primitive fish exist in this universe at the same time. Okay. Now, sometimes we've seen Bikini Bottom characters represented as realistic fish like this, but yeah. only when they're out of water, never while they're still in water like these fish. We even see this again in the beginning of the third SpongeBob movie, Sponge on the Run. Okay. The movie opens with a coral reef full well, of these realistic primal fish, but eventually Eventually we get to Bikini Bottom where the more evolved fish live. So there you go, direct proof that the citizens of Bikini Bottom are uniquely evolved. This is a very yeah, deliberate world building choice for the creators to make. So I guess that kind Bro. Just, just a hypothetical. Just a hypothetical. Right? Do you think all this shit was really planned? If this shit was all really planned- I don't know. Bro, this shit was all really planned, bro. I am scared. Cause I have never thought this deep. <laughs> <laughs> that is right, right. <laughs> that is right to Hey, right, right. Kind of confirms the bikini atoll theory. Theory confirmed. We did it. Woo. Well, let's hold on for a second. As much as I'd love to call this theory complete, there's actually one major piece of evidence that gives me some resistance. Sandy. Something I've never seen anyone else bring up when talking about this theory. Prehistoric Bikini Bottom. Oh, oh yeah. We've seen episodes like yeah, Ugg, the fucking, okay. Ugg or SB129 that show Bikini Bottom millions of years in the past, but we still see evolved versions of SpongeBob and Patrick. Sure, they may not be super intelligent or advanced, but they're still clearly way more evolved than the primitive realistic versions yeah. we see in Feral Friends or in the fish store. So how are we seeing these evolutions millions of years before the Bikini Atoll tests? Well, oh, I think I'm, hold on, hold on. Let me, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, y'all. I like doing this. If you ever watch any of our SpongeBob reactions, you already know. What if mm -hmm. the, but like the Atoll test happened, like what if prehistoric SpongeBob isn't prehistoric our time? What is it? What if it isn't our time prehistoric? Oh, it's it's they have their own. Yeah, timeline. it's on a different timeline. Mm, mm, like okay. like it's the like their time moves uh, faster for them or at a different pace. I mean, well, yeah. Well, unfortunately, I think the only conclusion is that the bikini atoll theory just isn't true. I mean, clearly something has caused Bikini Bottom citizens to be uniquely evolved. There's no denying that. But whatever caused it took place millions of years ago and couldn't have been the Bikini Atoll nuclear tests. Then. What really caused the evolution? In the entire show, the only thing we've seen that directly affects the evolution of characters is the green moon and feral friends. Except the French narrator specifically calls it Neptune's moon. It is called Neptune's moon. Named after the ruler of the seven seas, King Neptune. King Neptune is a character who's been around since the beginning of the sea. He's a character who the Bikini Bottom citizens view as their god. And he's a okay. character who has the ability to change fish into other forms. Oh. Oops. King Neptune used his magic to turn the fish of the sea into more evolved subjects for him to rule over. He's the one who's been behind it all this time. Oh. Now, I could spend this entire video talking about King Neptune and his weird continuity and contradictions in the show, but I'll save that for another theory. What I'd much rather talk about are the implications of having evolved and primitive fish coexisting in the sea. Right. Now, we know that this evolution isn't specific to just Bikini Bottom. We've seen different cities yeah. and places far across the ocean that still have talking fish, which makes sense because the marine life in Bikini Bottom has evolved to resemble humans, so it's no surprise that just like humans, they've yeah. expanded beyond Bikini Bottom yeah. and colonized other areas of the sea. But now, I have an interesting question for you. What is the relationship between evolved fish and oh. primitive unevolved fish? Well, they probably just peacefully coexist in the sea without bothering each other. You know, just like real life humans and animals. Or do they? Wait a second. If this is what- Krabby Patty formula? 
Other crabs. Krabby Patty formula. Other crabs. That nigga Mr. Krabs was three, in the episode war. 10, the Krusty Krab training video. There is this hilarious, absurd moment when they're talking about Mr. Krabs. After the war, Krabs stayed secluded in a deep depression that seemed endless. Oh, like, oh, exactly. oh. They just tell us this and then completely drop it. But with this new context, oh. is it possible that Krabs fought in a war against these primitive wild fish of the sea? I mean, let's remember in Feral Friends, some of those de-evolved fish were massive compared to the evolved fish, and they immediately started attacking each other. Ah, uh, the battle for the survival of the fittest Damn. rages on in the animal kingdom. So yeah, in order for the Bikini Bottom citizens to survive, and expand, they would probably break into some kind of war. Damn. And from the sounds of it, this war must have been pretty brutal to put Mr. Krabs yep. into such a deep depression. Like with the but Vietnam. I'm getting ahead of myself. Is there actually any evidence that proves the war Mr. Krabs fought in was specifically this evolutionary war? Well, through the few flashbacks we get, we know that Mr. Krabs served in the Navy. And yes, they were sailing ships on an ocean, even though they're already underwater. This is actually a real-life phenomenon where certain parts of the sea can have a higher level of salinity, and it looks like an underwater ocean. Shout out Miss Parks, my high school marine biology teacher. We also know from maps of Bikini Bottom that the town is surrounded by this underwater ocean. So that places Mr. Krabs' war outside of Bikini Bottom where this evolutionary war would have to take place. Then if we took a look at Mr. Krabs' home, we see it is full of memorabilia from his past days in the Navy. But hidden within here is something that will absolutely blow your mind and answer one of the biggest questions in the show. Hanging there on his wall is a picture of a massive whale next to a ship. You don't think that could be... Mother? Oh. Pearl is Mr. Krabs' whale daughter. The show never really explains how a crab can be the father of a whale, but most people just assume she was adopted. People have been speculating about who Pearl's biological mother is for years, and I think we finally just found our answer. We see two photos of this whale on a ship in Season 3, Episode 9, Damn. just one episode before we find out Mr. Krabs fought in a war. Since Damn. this is among all okay. Mr. Krabs' Navy stuff, I think we can assume that this is something he encountered and not just some random picture of a whale on a ship above the ocean. The whale is massive compared to the ship. We've seen adult whales in Bikini Bottom before, yep. but they are nothing compared yep. to the size of this whale. This has a much closer resemblance to Pearl when she de-evolved in Feral Friends and became massive. So this has to be an unevolved primitive whale, and the picture clearly shows them fighting. Not only does this prove that there was a war between evolved and primitive fish, but Mr. Krabs definitely fought in it. But this also implies something very dark. That he killed her Mr. Mom. Krabs killed Pearl's mother. She and under the guilt is why he took her in. Yeah. Oh, Alex, yeah. you fucking cold, Shit. bro. Shit, that's a lot of research, man. Yeah. Alex, if you start doing other theories, we watching every last one of them. <laughs> hey, I don't what? give a fuck, bro. You too. What, what other? Fuck let him you? know what other shows they got. Y'all got y'all worried about, man. Bro, like I, we, nigga, like got we my need Ned and Eddie, nigga, Kim Possible, Ned nigga, like fucking Rugrats, nigga. Who are you, Alex? <laughs> you, I have a conspiracy theory about you. <laughs> Cause you ain't no normal human being, bro. The only direct reference we get in the show to Pearl's mother is one of Mr. Krabs' many sayings, Mother of Pearl. <laughs> mother of Pearl! Oh. Mother of Pearl! He uses it in places something like holy crap or dear god, only saying it when something truly shocking or terrible Damn. happens. Because he knows the terrible thing that happened to Pearl's mother. Why did Mr. Krabs go into such a deep depression after the war? Because he's haunted by what he's done. And the smoking harpoon to prove it is right there on his wall. So that leaves us with an important question. Why Before we go any further, could, could Pearl's mom be the Krabby Patty? Yeah, because that was one of the things too. And it's it's big enough. Uh, adult will is big yeah, enough to feed. Yeah. 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 Why did he adopt Pearl? After he killed her mother, he probably realized she had an infant daughter who had the evolutionary genes. Instead of leaving her to die, he adopted her as his own, all while keeping the dark secret that he was responsible for her mother's death. Woo! Childhood ruined yet? Well, don't worry. There's still time for this theory to get even worse. What? Now's your chance to remove yourself before things get really dark. God, dog. God, dog. Still here? Yeah. Okay, so this. here's a fun question. 
What's the deal with all the pets in Bikini Bottom? How come most fish are basically humans, but a snail or a worm acts like a pet? Yeah. Well, just like humans have domesticated wild animals, it should be no surprise that evolved fish have domesticated primitive fish as pets. Unlike the massive primitive fish that the Bikini Bottom citizens had to go to war with, there's also smaller primitive fish like jellyfish, snails, yeah. spirit worms, seahorses, and clams that the Bikini Bottom citizens were able to form a symbiotic relationship with. Aww, and I thought you said this was gonna be the dark part, Alex. They're living peacefully together. Uh. That's nice. Okay, okay, you got me. Here's another fun question. Where do the citizens of Bikini Bottom get their food? I mean, sure, some of it is plant-based, but there sure does seem to be an awful lot of meat-based food yeah. that see. I think you know where I'm going with this. The Bikini Bottom citizens eat primitive fish. Yep. <laughs> It's not cannibalism if they're less evolved than you, right? There's no moral dilemma there. In season three, episode 13, we see direct proof of this when the characters go fishing for primitive clams. This is something completely normal in this world. And then there's the chum bucket, which sells chum. Chum. Oh. Chum is literally just ground up fish. The show isn't even hiding this. Damn. Now, we don't really see too much of the meat okay. harvesting side of Bikini Bottom, and I'm not surprised they're keeping it on the DL, you know, with the whole cannibalism thing, but there is one secret to making food that is kept more secret than anything in Bikini Bottom. The best kept Everybody. secret the in the Krabby entire show. Patty you already know formula. what I'm gonna say. The Krabby Patty Let's secret go. formula. Throughout the show, there's been lots of contradictory evidence about the Krabby Patty secret formula. In season four, episode seven, Mr. Krabs says it's an old family recipe. And your mother knows the Krabby Patty formula? Of course she does. It's an old Krabs family recipe. But in season five, episode one, apparently Mr. Krabs discovered it on his own by accidentally mixing random ingredients together. I've done it. I discovered the perfect patty batter. Sometimes it's a secret formula, sometimes it's a book, sometimes it's a secret sauce, and any glimpse we get of the formula is just random nonsense. There is a ton of contradictory evidence out there, but I yeah. think this might all be intentional. I can't hold you, that burger looks amazing. Yeah, that, 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 that burger looks amazing. <laughs> Sorry to be the fat man here, Jeez. but that burger looks amazing. It's a in big ass tomato. Off, Mr. Krabs has spread misinformation about the Krabby Patty formula. In fact, he's already done this in season three, episode 18, by hiding a fake formula for Plankton to find that says he's the secret ingredient. Mixed together with the most important ingredient of all, four heaping pounds of freshly ground Plankton. <laughs> And the contradictions aren't just inside the show. Even one of the SpongeBob crew members once said that Krabby Patties are vegetarian and contain no meat. But I've always been a little suspicious about what the creators say. They've also said that they're not allowed to show fish as food, except they clearly do with chum, clam fishing, and all the many, many gags where fish turn into food. Oh, it's yo. almost like they're not allowed by Nickelodeon to publicly acknowledge this because that could create a controversy, but they could still sneak this dark secret into the show. So what is the true secret? Secret ingredient. Where does the meat really come from? It's strange. Uh -oh. We never really see Mr. Krabs get the meat delivered, or at least go Not out himself to get it. It's almost like he has all the meat he needs stockpiled somewhere. Hmm. What primitive meat can Mr. Krabs have access to? Pearl's Maybe he's been holding onto something from the war. Hmm. What could Mr. Krabs yeah. have killed during the war? to find out about. Something big enough to supply him with meat for years without needing more. Hmm, what could that be? You really gonna make me say yes. it? Yes. Mr. Krabs is using yeah. his carcass to make Krabby Patties. Woo, we did it. Yeah, we solved the mystery. Got we up. did it. <laughs> I'm so glad. <laughs> Season one, episode 15, Sleepy Time. Mr. Krabs has a dream that he's on a boat fishing for a massive dollar. This is his memory of killing Pearl's mother, oh. except now all he sees her as is money. Oh. And take a guess what name he calls the dollar. What you doing, Mr. Krabs? Hey, picking Neptune's pocket. What are you talking about? I'm talking about cold, hard, flipping cash. It's the mighty Moby Dollar. Moby no. Dollar, a direct Moby reference Dick. to Moby Dick, a story about hunting a whale. Are you kidding me? Yes, and sir! That is the evolution theory. Yes, I you guys sir!
Yeah! With the Kimmy and Toll theory, King Neptune, Pearl's mother, the Krabby Patty formula, we hit everything in this theory. Even if you don't agree with all of it, you gotta admit a lot oh, of this makes sense. Eugene Crab's aspirations for money and greed have caused him to do terrible, terrible things. Yeah. At least his love for Pearl seems to be real, so maybe there's some small- No! Animal. No! No! What? No! There's more. He, There's a lot bro, more. Bro, 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 he doesn't love Pearl. He's keeping Pearl for more Krabby Patties in the future. Yo, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Good in him. And even though Pearl's mother probably provides tons of meat, eventually he's gonna run out and he'll have to face what he's done. Well, unless, of course, there's another whale he has access yeah. to. Yeah! Nope. Nope. No, 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 no. I'm right! No, 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 no. I'm right! Krabs wouldn't do that. He yes, he would! He's not just raising her for Krabby Patty meats. Even Mr. Krabs isn't that much of a monster. From every side I've ever seen To the sweetest sound I've heard I'd gladly give up everything For all the money that I've earned Huh. Well, already then, that's the end of that theory. Just gonna end it here before there's any more dark nope, plot you twists. Done. You guys have been insanely supportive with these SpongeBob theories, so I guess I have to make more. I've been your host, Alex Bale. Thanks she for watching. Uh-oh. Alex, oh, what about shit. Sandy? Oh, shit. <sighs> okay. Back in the garage. Uh, hey, just want to let you know that I, uh, I think I'm gonna take a break from the SpongeBob videos for a little bit. Oh, it's talking to. Uh, it's not you. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the videos are great. People, people love them. It's just, I think I want to go back to making actual films for a bit. The fuck is in there, Alex? Uh, okay then. Uh, thanks for everything. I guess I'll just, I'll just see you around. When I found you, you were unnoticed and unloved. But now you have millions of views. You have sponsors. Why would you forsake them? I just, you know, I don't, I don't want to really make these videos forever. You know, I don't want to be known as the, the SpongeBob guy. <laughs> Uh, Yo, what the? My boy, you really think they will care about your little films? We do. I am your muse. I have given you the gift of knowledge. Wow, this is good. If is that one Bobby? That's what I was, that's what I was. If you wish to go back to anonymity, then be my guest. But I know who you really are. Holy! Bro, y'all better stop playing with me, boy. Stop playing with that boy. Hey, Alex, you a cold man. This man is. This is the man. God you, damn. You okay. Cold. You cold. Number five. On the way. We can't wait, God damn it! Boy, that's gonna, cold, yeah, that's gonna do it, y'all. Go Sandy, show Alex some love. Alex, what about Sandy? Yeah, what about Sandy? That's my question, yeah. bro. Yeah, she's an involved animal that apparently came from, from Texas. Yeah. So does that mean the rest of the world up top is more advanced, but they're so advanced that they no longer get along? So they're looking at animals who have advanced to what humans used to be, who are getting along to try to go back to get back to become what they once were. That was a lot of shit. <laughs> Continuity with King Neptune is 
a bit of a mess. There are right. two different King Neptunes. Right. There's a King Poseidon. Yep. There's three different royal palaces. Yep. Two of them are called the City of Atlantis, but there's also a third unrelated City of Atlantis. It's confusing to say the least. But there is actually a way to explain how all of this is intentional and connects together. This is a story of power, deception, and betrayal. Oh, this no. is the Neptune Theory. Oh, okay. no! Okay. Okay, okay. Who is that? Oh, this is from that his other. Probably nothing. This is from his short film. On his channel. There's no tension. The pacing oh. is slow. Bro, y'all, 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 y'all. Let's talk about this for a second. Y'all ungrateful, then. First I'm of all, y'all gotta show Alex love. He is a filmmaker. Yeah, the, 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 I understand a love for a theory, but that is not his only craft. And I get that's that's exactly. what y'all love, but come on, y'all, we gotta do better. He obviously didn't come to YouTube just, just to make theories. Yeah, bro. he wants to be a filmmaker. And come shout on, out man. to my boy. Come on, man fundamentally fails as a film. Alex, go back to making SpongeBob theory videos. No one wants- Bro, I don't even know who you are with 660 subscribers, so fuck you. Your opinion don't matter. If, if that's satirical, okay, cool. My bad, I apologize. But if it's not, fuck you, Alex. We got your back. Your okay. awful horror films. I've been your host, the one and only cynical critic. And remember to stay cynical. <laughs> cynical <Yeah>. critic. <laughs> Now, Cynical Critic, if you weren't being an asshole, my apologies. Wait, we ride for our dogs around here. And we're back. What's up? I'm your host, Alex, the SpongeBob guy, back with another SpongeBob conspiracy. I've said it before, but the overwhelming support for these videos is insane. So that I'd be stupid Pop not to make more. I mean, everyone loves them, right? Hello, fellow truth seekers. It's Conspiracy Carl here. Welcome back to the Awakening. Oh, my God. I hey, this is a hat. To the... Immense <laughs> lies of this person right here. This what? liar, Alex Bale. Well, almost everyone. Oh, oh my so God. I showed a bit of this conspiracy guy's reaction in my last video, and apparently he didn't like that, so now he's claiming that I'm part of some giant Illuminati conspiracy. Somebody looks like they're a puppet for the Illuminati. It's yes, funny. you, you, sir, have. It's funny when conspiracy niggas. <laughs> Get trolled and they think it's real. Like, nigga, I'm messing with you. You idiot. <laughs> That's how brainwashing you are. Inserting secret messages into your videos. Evil. Evil lurks there, people. It's honestly really funny. You, sh you should check them out. Anyways, let's get into the theory. Is what I would say if I wasn't sponsored. Hey, Alex, okay. How do I make a cool YouTube film video like you? Well, it's easy. You just gotta learn to edit, record dialogue, write yep. a script, yep. use camera and lights, yep. learn Photoshop and VFX. Oh, how the heck am I gonna learn to do all that? All you gotta oh, do yeah. is go to Skillshare. Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning platform that offers thousands of different right, classes gotta, where you can gotta, learn filmmaking. Gotta go. All right, here we go. King Neptune is the ruler of the seven seas and the Roman god of the ocean. If you watch my evolution theory, you know there's also a good chance he's the reason why fish and bikini bottom are so okay, evolved and able okay. to talk. He lives okay. in the city of Atlantis with his wife, Queen Amphitrite, and his son, Triton. But in the first SpongeBob movie, he's replaced by a completely different King Neptune who has a completely different daughter named Mindy. These guys don't look or sound at all the same, so how can they both exist in this universe? Well, there's already an interesting theory out there about this. It's widely believed that the SpongeBob movie takes place in the future after the events of the show. So widely believed that I got hundreds of comments about it in my Mrs. Puff theory. Yep, I, I know. I know, guys. I heard, I heard what you said. The creator of Spongebob, Steven Hillenburg, said he wanted to end the series with the movie. And it being canonically at the end of the Spongebob timeline would explain why we never see the Krusty Krab 2 or any of the other characters from the movie in the later Spongebob episodes. Yes. And some people ah, believe that the no, reason no, why no, movie no, no, Neptune is so different is because he's actually Neptune's son, Triton, all grown up. And that's a pretty cool theory, but I don't buy it. Okay. Other than Triton looking nothing like movie Neptune, I've never actually believed that the Spongebob movie takes place in the future. Despite there being many, many people who commented about it on my Mrs. Puff theory as if it was a proven fact, there's never actually been any official confirmation of it. Steven Hillenburg only said that he wanted to stop making Spongebob after the movie. He never said anything about where the movie actually takes place in the timeline of the show. And we do actually briefly see Neptune's daughter Mindy show up later in the show in Spongebob's Big Birthday Blowout. 
out. Oh, there is no way she'd be there unless the show took place after the events of the movie. I think what's actually going on here with Neptune is something much more interesting, and it ties directly in with the television theory. If you haven't seen that video, it basically proves that the entire show, SpongeBob SquarePants, is actually a nature documentary being filmed by scuba divers, and many of the elements we see throughout. I ain't gonna cap. I don't know how you tie all this together because my brain hurts just thinking about how I would tie all this together if I was in your shoes. You are a genius, my guy. And you hey, are just also kind of stupid. Just, I am, but <laughs> <laughs> that hurt. <laughs> but, oh, oh, <laughs> but you oh, know God. what I'm saying? The effort yeah. to go back and to research. Yeah. All these comments don't do that. set up by the showrunners to make sure that the show is more entertaining and profitable. And this applies to the SpongeBob movie as well. There's promotional art and even a commercial that acknowledges the fact that it's just a movie being filmed. <gasps> SpongeBob, what kind of jellyfish is that? Hey guys, it's Carlos from the Zone. Can you tell us about your latest adventure? Well, this one adventure we had was a real. This Lulu. makes me feel so old. We went after Neptune's crown. It seemed bigger than our usual adventures. Yes, and with fewer interruptions. Well, thanks, guys. We'll see you in the movie. Movie? What's that? I don't know. I think the so real just reason why Neptune looks so yeah. different in the movie is because the filmmakers couldn't get the real King Neptune, ah. the literal god of the sea, to show up for a movie. So just they an hired an actor to pretend to be the king. And there is actually a ton of evidence in the show to support this. King Neptune is supposed to live in the great city of Atlantis, but in the movie, he just lives in some random sand castle, almost like ah. they just built a discount version for ah. the movie. Gosh. But the real evidence comes from season 10, episode 18, Lost and Found. Damn. where Spongebob goes beneath the Krusty Krab to look for something in the Lost and Found. As he searches through the surprisingly massive collection of items, on one of the shelves, we see something mind-blowing. The crown worn by King Neptune in the Spongebob movie. Wow. The entire props. plot of the movie hinges on the fact that Neptune thinks Mr. Krabs stole his crown. Why would Mr. Krabs have this now? Because this isn't just the Krusty Krabs lost and found. It's also where they store the props used by the Spongebob Squarepants wow. filmmakers to create okay. the Spongebob movie. If you remember from my television theory, Mr. Krabs is secretly working for the showrunners to spy on all the main characters. And his secret surveillance room was hidden beneath the Krusty Krabs just like this lost and found. Okay. So it makes perfect sense for the showrunners to hide their props down here. True. And if you still don't believe me, we also see SpongeBob's guitar, the Goofy Goober peanut hats, oh. and the magical bag of wind. Oh. All items from the movie that would make no sense being down here unless this was the showrunners' prop storage. Yeah. And the movie I like it! I like the, it! The tie-in is phenomenal. No, like this man's it. a madman. Key oh, Neptune was just an actor. Well, that's one Neptune down. Now for the real mystery, King Poseidon. Hold on. I ain't never seen this thing. I ain't seen it no in the third Spongebob movie, Spongebob, oh, that's the king of the sea is yet again replaced <laughs> by a new character, King Poseidon, the Greek god of the ocean. He actually does live in the city of Atlantis, except instead of the ancient royal architecture, it's a giant casino designed to make money. Sheesh. It'd be easy to say that these are just two separate kings that rule different areas of the sea, but they both claim to be the ruler of the seven seas. So how can two different characters both be the king of the same seven seas? The Give answer to, to that question actually has to do with a place called King. Camp Coral. Throughout the third SpongeBob movie, we keep cutting back to flashbacks of a younger SpongeBob and all the other characters when they all went to summer camp together. This was all to set up a spin off show called Camp Coral that followed these younger characters. Now, at first, I just wrote the show off as SpongeBob following the trend of making all their characters younger to appeal to a younger uh, demographic. Okay. It's been done before and it's never very good. They also completely contradict the continuity of the main show by having characters like Sandy and SpongeBob meet as kids when we yeah. know they actually met as adults in the main show. Yeah. Look, I am having a hard enough time figuring out this show's continuity on its own. I do not need another show full of contradictions to make it even harder. But the creators actually did something very clever to make the continuity work. The seventh episode of Camp Coral ends with one of the biggest plot twists I've ever seen oh, from the show. So in this episode, SpongeBob actually discovers the Krabby Patty secret formula way before it was supposed to be created by Mr. Krabs. But at the end of the episode, it gets accidentally destroyed by Sandy, and then we we get this mind-blowing scene. This is Little Cheeks calling Big Cheeks. Come in, Big Cheeks. Over. Affirmative, Little Cheeks. This is Big Cheeks receiving you from the future. How's it 
things going in the past. Your plan worked perfectly. The formula burned up before Mr. Uh, Plank could snap it. Now it can be safely rediscovered in the future. I knew sending you to Camp Coral was the right thing to do. Over and out. <laughs> Bye, future me. Hi. Mission accomplished, timeline preserved. Okay. Now everything can continue just that's the way smart, it's always been. That's smart do. So Sandy smart used it'll time do. travel to send her past self to Camp Coral so that she could make sure the Krabby Patty formula didn't get discovered before it was supposed to. They actually figured out a way to make this messed up continuity make sense. Don't you dare tell me this show doesn't care about its continuity. Can I also just say that this scene lines up perfectly with my television theory? A major part of that theory is that Sandy is actually a spy working for the showrunner and is secretly making sure everything stays on track. And then what do we see a month after I post my theory? Sandy secretly manipulating everyone to keep the show on track. Just gonna, just gonna give myself a little Yo, pat on the back. Hey, hey, you it. What does you any of this it. have to do with King Poseidon? Okay. Well, this proves that Camp Coral and the movie that sets it up are in an alternate timeline. The events that have taken place in the show are not the same events in this movie. The continuity errors like Sandy and SpongeBob meeting or Poseidon being the king of the sea instead of Neptune can be explained by this shift in the timeline. So ah. there you go. King Poseidon and ah. King Neptune are from completely separate Different timelines. Yeah, That's why yeah, we never yeah. see any reference to King Poseidon in the show. And that is the Neptune theory. Huh. I mean, that, that wasn't so hard. That's I guess, I guess I'm done here. It. Neptune stirred up quite a gale tonight. He must be mad about something. <laughs> That's silly. Everyone knows Poseidon is ruler of the undersea. Everyone knows Poseidon Under is ruler of the undersea. <sighs> Why can't anything ever be easy? This is the clip that really made me decide to make this theory. The okay. beginning of season 5, episode 19, Sponge Henge, shows two fish arguing over whether Neptune or Poseidon is the real ruler of the sea. It's like the creators are directly telling us that both of these characters somehow exist in the same timeline, oh, and it's shit. our job to figure out how the puzzle pieces fit together. So, let's take a look. Despite both of these characters having similar appearances and personalities, there is one very important difference between them. Poseidon doesn't have power. Hours. We've seen many times mm. that King Neptune has magical abilities that he can use at any time, even without his trident. But in the entire third SpongeBob movie, we never see Poseidon use any powers or magical abilities. Except for lighting up his trident, but all he has to do for that is just flip a switch. And wow. we know from the episode Trident He's Trouble that you don't even need to be a god He's to like use the a... trident. And at the end of the third movie, we find out Poseidon is actually in terrible shape. Whoa. If you remember at the end of the episode Whoa. Neptune's spatula, Neptune briefly- I if I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> Turn SpongeBob into a god. And we can see that having god powers gives you a perfect body. So why is Poseidon in such terrible shape? Because he doesn't actually have powers. Only Neptune does. Even Neptune's wife, Queen Amphitrite, has to use technology to zap someone, unlike Neptune, uh -huh. who only has to use his finger in the exact same episode. He is clearly the only one with powers, but why? To answer this question, we first have to understand the origins of King Neptune. Now, us. throughout the show, there is very little information on Neptune's past. I read the Wikipedia, I looked through the comic books, the video games, but I just couldn't find anything that would help me. But then I remembered there are SpongeBob shorts, which are like many episodes that only air once, usually to promote something. So I started looking to see if there were any that could help us, and lo and Bro, behold, y'all see is... how much research this man Bro, does? He is a deep diver. This this man is, is, you are Bro. committed! Bro, Alex you're not normal, but yeah, it's okay. No, it's good. It's cool. It's cool. Y'all, just because of this, this is why y'all should support his other work. Yeah, bro. Come on. He put a lot of yeah. work into this. He really to promote something. So I started looking to see if there were any that could help us, and lo and behold, there is a SpongeBob short called The Story of King Neptune. Huh. Yeah, I, I, I guess that could be helpful. This short is about SpongeBob telling Patrick the origins of King Neptune, but it's not entirely clear whether it's true. The story of King Neptune. When King Neptune was a little Neptune, okay. his mother set him adrift in a river. As he floated up, along, up, but okay. a radioactive meteor fell to earth. An alien appeared and anointed the infant with Super Neptune fluid. Is that really the origin of King Neptune? Um, oh. sure. So King Neptune was abandoned as a baby and then given his powers by aliens. But SpongeBob is holding an upside down comic book. So it feels a lot like something he just made up. And SpongeBob is not the most reliable narrator. Nice, nice, unless yeah. there's something in the story that we can definitively prove, I don't think we can use it for a theory. Like, do you really expect me to believe that Neptune got his powers from aliens? I mean, we've never 
even seen aliens in the show before. <gasps> Except humans. Humans. we have. Humans. And they just so happen to also oh, live in a city oh, called Atlantis. Shit. Season 5, episode 12, Atlantis oh, Square shit. Pantis. We see another completely different Atlantis, the lost city of Atlantis. A city that's home to a race of aliens. The Atlantean aliens traveled billions of light years to come to this planet and build their city. For reasons unknown, this great city disappeared one day, but no ruins were ever found. All the inventions you take for granted were given to us by the Atlanteans. They were a peaceful race of aliens who shared their Weaponry. technology, but then mysteriously disappeared for some reason. And take a guess what we find when we look inside of that city. A it. massive sculpture oh. of King Neptune. Goodness, that Christ. story about aliens giving Neptune his powers doesn't sound so far-fetched now, does it? Oh, and goodness, that's not Christ. all we find. Neptune's Ascension. The only surviving painting from the great lost city of Atlantis. A painting created by the Atlanteans wow. called Neptune's Ascension, aka Neptune ascending to his god status by being given powers by the Atlantean aliens. The wow. story is definitely referencing this. There okay. are too many connections okay. for this to be a coincidence. They gave so him the power. They didn't give it to him like that, yeah, but they but gave him the power. power. Okay, okay. It's being told by SpongeBob, and details like the alien's appearance are wrong. The story itself is probably based on truth. And there's also a lot of evidence to support the idea that Neptune was abandoned as a baby. In Clash of Triton, Neptune is watching a soap opera in his bedroom and gets upset when his wife turns it off. Oh, Neptune, surely this isn't the behavior befitting a king doing nothing but watching daytime television. Wait! Rochelle was just about to meet her biological parents. Oh. In the soap opera, Rochelle was just about to meet her biological parents. Maybe the real reason why Neptune's so invested in the soap opera is because he's never met his biological parents either. There's even tissues on the table next to him as if he's been crying. And the idea that Neptune was abandoned as a baby works perfectly with the mythology in the show. Neptune is the Roman god of the sea, but right. he is the only reference to Roman mythology in the show. Everything else we see is from Greek mythology. In the episode Tried at Trouble, we see a Greek chorus. Behold, we are the Greek chorus. We narrate this epic tale. Neptune once mentioned Zeus, the Greek god of thunder. So I say, look, Zeus, either you come up with more money or Neptune walks. He also mentions Apollo, the Greek god of the sun. Now behold, uh -huh. my beloved home of Atlantis. A prize worthy of Apollo. Even in the city of Atlantis where Neptune lives, there's a building named the Poseidon, clearly named after Poseidon. So right. Neptune is clearly the outsider here, which is why he was abandoned as a baby. But if the sea is actually ruled by Greek mythology, then Poseidon should be the true heir to the throne. Why is Neptune the king in the show? Because after Neptune was given his god powers by aliens, he returned to Atlantis and stole the throne from Poseidon. Oh. This would explain why there's so much confusion over who the real king is. Neptune stirred up quite a gale tonight. Everyone knows Poseidon is ruler of the undersea. Legally, Poseidon should be the king, but Neptune took it by force. And that's not all he took from Poseidon. Neptune's wife, Queen Amphitrite, is the goddess of the sea. The Greek goddess of the sea, aka the wife of Poseidon. God damn, Neptune stole his wife and his throne. And Mr. Stereo Girl! <laughs> He came up that and, stole is and eventually, everyone Jeez. did recognize Neptune as the rightful king. The pink fish who seemed adamant about Poseidon being the king completely changes her mind one season later in Clash of Triton. Oh, wait a minute, King Neptune is coming here? Oh, I'm a huge fan of the royal family. I just love everything they do. And that is the real story of King Neptune. Oh, the reason shit. why Poseidon is king in the but third movie is yet. probably because in that timeline, Neptune was never given his god powers, so he never stole the throne from Poseidon. Poseidon. Although, ah. seeing as how Poseidon turned Atlantis into a big casino cash grab city, maybe it's a good thing Neptune took over. The lost city of Atlantic City. And that is the Neptune theory. That was a tough one. That's not he it, said buddy. Atlantic. Not Atlantis. He said Atlantic City. Yeah, he said Atlantic City. But we are finally done. See you next time, guys. Come on. Wait. Come on. Why is Poseidon City called the Lost City of Atlantic City? The yeah. Lost City of Atlantic yep, City. I know. The Atlantic City Park makes sense. That's a reference to the real life Atlantic uh -huh. City, but why is it called the Lost City? There is nothing lost about the city. It seems like everyone's easily able to find it. The only other reference to a Lost City of Atlantis is the one with the aliens that gave Neptune his powers. Nope.
Nope, I, I I don't care. I'm done with this theory. I don't need to answer every single little question. I Come am a hundred percent done. There it is. Ah! <sighs> Fine, okay. One more quick part just to tie up all the loose ends, and then I am done. Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. So we know before the Atlantean aliens mysteriously disappeared, they shared their technology with the creatures of the sea. Right, I think the right. self-proclaimed gods of the sea got their technology, like tridents and their other weapons, from the Atlantean aliens. Okay. In fact, the Atlantean guards even use golden tridents as their weapons. That's okay. why the gods named their city Atlantis, to pay tribute to the Atlanteans that gave them their technology. But all of that changed when Poseidon became king of the sea. He betrayed the Atlanteans and used their own weapons against them to conquer their home and turn it into a casino city. That's why Poseidon City is called the Lost City, even though it's not lost. It's referencing the Atlantean city that was conquered by Poseidon. And oh. the reason why the Atlanteans gave god powers to some random abandoned baby in the main timeline was so that Neptune could but take the of Poseidon and prevent him from conquering the alien city. And oh. the reason why the Atlantean city mysteriously disappeared was because they hid it so no one could ever try and conquer them again. And that is the Neptune theory. I am done. Psych! Psych. <sighs> Okay, that's it ain't uh, never that easy. another one done. Thank you so much for it watching. Yeah, I've nah. been your host, Alex. We've got Alex, you got like, you got like yeah, more on the way. I'll easy. see you next time. Hey, listen, that that theory was awesome. You know, I don't know how you keep coming up with these, but I mean, they're great. And, and listen, you were you were totally right. You know, the people want SpongeBob theories, so. Who might ignore them? So, thank you. Uh, hello? Got the got the meat for you. All right, listen. If we're gonna work on this, then we need to work on our communication skills because this this creepy quiet act is getting old. Don't do it! Don't do it, my boy! It's gonna be gone. It's gonna be gone. Yeah. It's nothing there. It escaped. Is it any more out there? Oh. Oh. Ah, uh, shizzle! Why, why are you on my ceiling? My boy. You have done well, but if we are to continue our work, I will require something more. Oh, shit. I hate this nigga. This, this thing is good. This thing is good. Hey man, follow your heart, man. Make the film, yeah, man. Bro. Yeah, bro. Make we, the we, film. We'll watch man. everything. We'll. You already know the vibes, bro. We fuck with you. Make the film. I'm like, blessed. don't don't let people control your content, man. Like you read the title What's correctly. Goody? This is the Goofy Goober Alien Death Cult Theory. Oh, and no, okay. I am not joking. This seemingly innocent right, ice right. cream parlor is a front for something very sinister. The beloved SpongeBob movie actually has a much darker and tragic meaning to it. I am being 100% oh. serious when I tell you that I think this is my best, most convincing theory okay. yet. And Let's if you thought it. my evolution theory was dark, well, get ready. This is the Goofy Goober Alien Death Cult Theory. I'm a Goofy Goober! Rock! Da, 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 da. All right, let's go. We're all Goofy Goober! Rock! <laughs> okay.
Okay, my boy got some. Okay, we shoot. This should be. That look like pressure. What you shot this on? A7S? Or did you get stock footage? Either way, it go, it look great. Look, Ham Taro. This man is a filmmaker. Hey, uh, what's the biggest animal that you have? Oh, he gonna fit. Oh into boy, Alex has finally lost his mind. Goofy goober alien death Achoo. cult theory. What did he make that in a random word generator? Yes. Trust me, there's actually a lot to this theory. And if anyone's qualified to make it, it's me. Of considering course. I made a whole web series about a restaurant being a front for a cult. Here. Are what, what the f <laughs> hold up bro you can't just gloss over that <laughs> pizza time pizza we don't use any preservatives or fake ingredients pizza time pizza is not a cult but those are the old days i'm the spongebob guy now and there is yes. an insane demand for <laughs> more of these puff theories got the 12 i mean million? the mrs puff one has like 12 million Gay. views 12 that is million? crazy Gay. thank you guys so much hey now how that feel alex how that, how yeah how like that feel, we we barely know we, what it feel like to hit two we got the two that's the five. that's the best. How, that 12 feels, How does that feel, bro? I know it feels the amazing. Video. Goofy Alex. Goobers is an old-fashioned ice cream parlor that first appeared in the SpongeBob movie. It's the very definition of a fun, innocent place for children. Okay. Also, one thing I gotta tell you: when we start watching these scenes, look around, see if you see anything, because he always be pointing stuff out okay, okay, that we okay, ain't okay, see. Okay, so okay. I'm already ready. We so like how like the clock, on, like, like the twelve, on. the twelve on the clock ain't where it's supposed to be already. So, how on earth did I come to the conclusion that it's actually an alien death cult? Let's see. In that's fact, a, that's a, what even is an alien death cult? Fact, Usually, a stretch, it's a religious Alex. group that wants you to believe that one day aliens will come to Earth and right. take the members of the cult to a better place. And in order to get there, they have to commit mass suicide. The most Whoa. infamous example of this oh, being yeah, Heaven's yeah, Gate. Yeah, 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 like yeah, I said, yeah, yeah. this that's is going to be people, a very right? dark yeah, video yeah, with some so. serious subject matter. So, how does this have anything to do with Goofy Goobers? Okay. In the more recent seasons of Spongebob, they've started started referencing Goofy Goobers again. In fact, mm -hmm. there's even an episode called The, the Goofy, Goofy Newbie where Patrick gets a job there. And it's in this episode when Patrick is watching an employee training video that I first realized there was something more going on here. Okay. The story of our ice cream begins with our founder, Reginald Goober, who for some <laughs> unexplained reason was nicknamed Goofy. In 1842, he headed west in a the covered ice cream reason. wagon. He served his warm ice cream on rocks and sticks. From those humble beginnings, what? Goofy Goober has grown into a multi-billion dollar business okay just a pause real quick i just want to know alex do you watch these episodes he has to like i mean like this is what i mean like how does he get here you know what i mean like is he, he watching nickel is he watching watch nickelodeon yeah. all day okay watch i'm just wondering you know it's a pretty standard company video they just want their employees to wash their hands and keep their work area clean we only ask that you one practice good hygiene Two, Patrick, maintain don't fit. good work habits. Nothing out of the ordinary, except there's one more thing that they want you to do. What? And three, believe in extraterrestrials. Okay. Pigs, hags, and ice cream. Huh. An organization that wants you to believe in aliens. That couldn't be a heaven's gate reference in spongebob could it no that that's that's crazy and, mm -hmm. and even if it was it could just be a random throwaway gag there's no way goofy goobers is actually a cult right but then i started to rewatch every appearance of goofy goobers and things took on a whole new meaning okay. one of the most basic ideas of a cult is that they strip you of your individuality and make you change your entire identity to be about the cult and that's exactly what goofy goobers does everyone there wears goofy goober uniforms okay. just like a cult i mean what other restaurant has not just employees but customers that always dress up in a specific way and True. their theme song that is constantly repeated and reinforced is just the simple line i'm a goofy, goofy goober, goober yeah you're, you're a goofy, goofy goober, goober, goober. Yeah, we are all goofy goobers. Yeah. I'm a goofy. goofy goober. You're a goofy goober. We are all goofy goobers. It is literally just a song saying that your it's whole identity your is head. based around goofy goobers, and that's it. And in the SpongeBob like movie, there's a scene where SpongeBob and Patrick have to try their best to not sing along to the theme song, oh, and it like literally brainwashing. causes them intense pain to not yeah, sing along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't sing along, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying, trying so hard. 
It's as if they've been brainwashed and physically can't stop themselves from singing it. And you can't even just chalk this up to SpongeBob and Patrick being weirdos. Two other fish can't stop themselves from singing along, even though it means they'll get beat up for it. Goofy, goofy, goober, goobers, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> and just like how many cults have an icon or god that they worship, Goofy Goobers has the dancing peanut mascot that's all over the restaurant's branding. Of course, you gotta have I mean, a mascot. just look at how excited all the kids are when he comes out. Goofy Goober! <laughs> and I start you young as a kid. All right, but Started just because kid, kids like a mascot doesn't mean that they have some kind of religious worship for them. Well, if you don't believe me, take it from SpongeBob himself. Open your eyes, Patrick! We blow bubbles, we eat ice cream, we worship a dancing peanut for oh, corn's sake! Why do not worship him? Patrick, <laughs> you've been wearing the same Goofy Goober peanut party underpants for three years straight! Damn. Ain't no way, bro. Nigga, hold oh, Alex, what the fuck? <laughs> what the? What do you call that? Worship? In the SpongeBob movie video game, oh. there's even a Goofy Goober token that reads, In Goofy We Trust, Damn. replacing the word God with Goofy. Hmm, things are looking awfully culty, aren't they? Yep. Cults yeah. will also often create reading material about their beliefs for their followers oh, to read, and manual. Goofy Goobers is no exception to this. In the new SpongeBob spinoff, The Patrick Star Show, we see a Goofy Goober employee reading some kind of book about ice cream. Question, question. I thought The Patrick Star Show wasn't canon. Um... I know, as you would know, because you're like a SpongeBob dude, but I could have swore it wasn't canon because of like there's a whole bunch of inconsistencies with this as well as like when spongebob was little and look at him he's not busy working he's choosing to read this in his downtime i mean compare him to squidward who sometimes reads in his downtime at work it's not like he's reading about the crusty crab this book looks a lot like it's a doctrine for a cult's beliefs a major part of how cults get so successful is by getting their followers to give them money now obviously goofy goobers charges people for ice cream but they actually convince their followers to trade their money for a made-up goofy goober currency uh, i don't know what plankton's paying you but if you let us go i can make it worth your while what is this uh that sir is five goober dollars legal tender at any participating goofy goober this would explain how the goofy goober founder an idiot who sold ice cream on rocks and sticks turned the company into a multi-billion dollar franchise but he's an he idiot. convinced people yeah, he to believe that aliens would one day take them to a better place and got them to give them all their money another tactic that cults use to indoctrinate people is overloading them with compliments and making them feel special and that's exactly what goofy goobers does to patrick when he gets a job there the training video says that they appreciate him. Hello and welcome. As a new Goofy Goober employee, we'd like you to know that we appreciate you. And then his Bullshit. manager says the exact same thing. I'm your manager, and I want you to know that I appreciate you. And then despite they Patrick messing slick. up and causing chaos, they the manager says slick. it once again. I'll give you another chance tomorrow. Because if I it doesn't work out, you. I'm afraid you're fired. <clears throat> in a most appreciative way. There is no reason for the manager to be this appreciative of Patrick after all the terrible Unless work he's, he's done. Ordered he's to. just trying to emotionally manipulate him. The tactic is especially effective on vulnerable people like children, and we see this in the Patrick Star Show. Not only did Patrick start eating Goofy Goober ice cream when he was young, and eventually ended up working there and worshipping their god, but this green kid also grew up to become an employee at Goofy Goobers. Yeah, he's shaped like a peanut. <laughs> oh, There's shit. a clear pattern here. Kids who eat the ice cream all eventually join the cult. Whoa. They are specifically targeting children for indoctrination, Is this but their manipulation the goes far beyond just Where's psychological tactics. Trust me, we've just scratched the surface of how far Goofy Goobers will go to brainwash its members. Things are about to get darker. Let's get it. I'm with all this shit. My boy, you are a filmmaker. I want to talk to you about a doc though. That's a, you about to feed a cat to Squidward? <laughs> the fuck? Don't eat the ice cream. Yeah, something in the ice cream. It's something in the ice cream. Well, I want some ice cream. No, me too. There's a part in the SpongeBob movie some. where SpongeBob and Patrick go to Goofy Goobers and eat tons of ice cream all night to the point where they become completely drunk off of it. It's a really funny scene. 
but it begs the question, why does the ice cream get them drunk? Maybe that's just how ice cream works in the SpongeBob universe, and it's the show's way of making a family-friendly alcohol reference. But we've seen other instances where characters eat tons of ice cream and it doesn't have this effect on them. Alright, well, maybe this was just a one-time gag for the movie, and it's not a consistent part of the continuity. But in the season 11 episode, Call the Cops, we get we this we scene. <laughs> oh yeah, Patrick, go! Oh. <laughs> One too many goofy goobers again, uh, eh, Patrick? Yo! So, another deliberate Why would reference the cops to say goofy that? goober ice cream having a weird alcoholic effect on people. Is it possible that they put something in the ice cream to make people more open Very to cult so. indoctrination? Cults have been known to use drugs to keep their followers <laughs> obedient and suggestible. <laughs> One of the most famous examples of this being Charles Manson, who used LSD to convince his followers of his beliefs. If this is the case with Goofy Goobers, they'd probably want to make sure everyone there eats as much ice cream mm -hmm. as possible. And the Goofy Goober building is actually cleverly designed in a way to ensure that this happens. There are no windows in the entire oh. building, so you can't tell whether it's day or night. And oh. the Goofy Goober clock just has random numbers on yeah. it, so it's impossible to keep track of time. Because of this, Spongebob eats ice cream all night and is actually late for work for the very first time. <laughs> also, can I point out the fact that the eyes on the clock seem to follow Patrick around in the Goofy Newbie? It's a really oh. creepy and specific detail to include. I mean, we know from the movie that the eyes are usually supposed to be looking straight ahead, but here, they're always watching Patrick, their next target for indoctrination. Now, if the ice cream is what keeps their followers in line, they definitely want to make sure their employees were eating as much as possible. And it turns out, Goofy Goobers actually has a policy about this. Wow, I can't believe Goofy Goobers employees get to eat all oh, the ice damn. cream they want on this damn. job. Hmm, the damn. employees get to eat. That employee turnover is immaculate because they don't uh, leave. They not leaving. They not, they not leaving. leaving. All the ice cream they want. Very interesting. And there's evidence to suggest that the ice cream can do a lot more than just make you suggestible. At the beginning of the Goofy Newbie, Patrick is holding up the line asking for samples of ice cream. The employee he's talking to gets frustrated and calls for security to kick him out. Hey, you sampled every flavor we have. Will you please just pick one? I would like you to use my spoon. <laughs> I think he's slick. Security. But there's something oddly familiar about this employee. Hang okay. on a second. Isn't that Patrick's sister? The new spinoff, The Patrick Star Show, is a prequel to the main show that introduces us to Patrick's little sister, Squidina. And here, we see her all grown oh, up working that at is Goofy Squid. Goobers. She's even credited as Squidina and has the same oh. voice actor. In The Patrick Star Show, we actually do see her eating Goofy Goober ice cream as a kid, which fits with the pattern of kids who eat the ice cream eventually Damn. getting indoctrinated into the cult. Now, Squidina and Patrick have a very close, loving relationship in The Patrick Star Show, but here, they act like they're total strangers. It's not surprising that Patrick would forget his own sister, but Squidina is always portrayed as being smart. It's yeah. almost like she completely forgot about him. One of the biggest tactics that cults use to indoctrinate people is isolating them from their friends and family mm -hmm. to make them more vulnerable and dependent on the and cult. The and that's exactly yes, what we're seeing here with Squidina. She has no memory of her family. The ice cream might Yo, just be affecting her memory as well. Hell. I mean, if she was just meant to be some random reusable character here with no continuity, why would the creator go out of their way to specifically credit her as Squidina, Squidina unlike yeah. the other mm. random employees who are just credited as employee. Feels like mm. they're deliberately trying to draw attention to it. At the end of the Goofy Newbie, Patrick goes crazy and eats a ton of the ice cream, and then the episode <laughs> ends in a very interesting way. <laughs> he getting abducted. Oh! Peace, hugs, and ice cream! What the hell? Now, I don't think Patrick was actually abducted by aliens. I mean, we see him on Earth in the very next episode, and the UFO has the same fake look as the one in the training video. I think that because of all the ice cream he ate, he, he was now high. fully accepts the Goofy Goober's beliefs, and it's caused him to hallucinate the Damn. UFO. So, at this point, I'd say we can make a very strong case for Goofy Goobers being a cult, but... With this realization comes a very dark and tragic new meaning for the Spongebob movie. Believe okay. me, you will never look at that movie the same way again. I think about to feed a cat to Squidward. <laughs> and I know that Squidward, know Squidward. Because the ink. Mm, true. Mm. 
That was black ink dropping on my boy face. This nigga about to feed this nigga a cat. And then the first theory, the first theory, the squilliam theory. Where would he get that from? Aside from Squidward. You feel me? Alex, you're going to let me know it's Squidward because I know it is. Great ass cinematics you got here. Cute ass yellow jacket. <laughs> we about to hear cat die. <laughs> oh, just about to say, yeah. Okay. I like how he implemented the second storyline. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you trying, yeah, to, yeah. Keep, you trying hey, to keep us hey, on retention, Alex? Hey, hey, oh. hey, you didn't figure it out what we've been trying to you learn the whole keep, time you on YouTube. End, Let's get it. Let's get it. Hey, I respect it, man. I respect it. The 2004 Spongebob movie is my With favorite double thing payoff. to come out of the franchise. It's funny, it's emotional, and it encapsulates everything right, great right, right, about right, right. Spongebob. In this movie, Spongebob goes on a journey of self-discovery and realizes that he doesn't need to change who he is and grow up to fit into society. He Not just has all. to embrace his inner kid and be himself. It's so a great extent. message that feels really fitting for the character. But, but if you replace the word kid with Goofy Goober, Spongebob's arc takes on a whole new meaning. It's mm. not about Spongebob embracing being himself. It's about Spongebob fully accepting the indoctrination and beliefs of the Goofy Goober cult. Shit. The movie starts with Spongebob not getting promoted to manager of the new Krusty Krab, a job that he desperately wanted and believed that he would get. When he finds out that Squidward got chosen instead of him, it completely destroys him. Cults will target vulnerable people who are at extremely low points, and the first place that Spongebob goes to after having his heart broken is it's Goofy, Goofy Goobers. Goobers. After a night God of getting damn. drunk off of ice cream, he becomes resentful of Mr. Krabs and decides to tell him off. I deserve that manager's job, but you didn't give it to me, cause you say I'm a kid. Well, I am 100% man! And this man has got the Easy to influence, that's what this man is. About to be very easy to influence. In fact, if King Neptune didn't interrupt and try to kill Mr. Krabs, SpongeBob probably would have quit and been fully able to join the cult. SpongeBob and Patrick go on a quest to retrieve Neptune's crown, and it's almost like every obstacle they face along the way is specifically Damn. designed to make SpongeBob and Patrick realize the dark truth about Goofy Goobers, but Nigga, they f the lady, the lady in the fish was giving them niggas ice cream. Yeah. Oh my god. But they failed to do so at every turn. So, they first stop at this tough guy bar that's full of men who beat up anyone that isn't manly enough. <laughs> but I think there's actually a lot more going on here than it seems. This place actually has an insane amount of similarities to so, the Goofy yeah. Goober ice cream parlor. They're both Sheesh. shaped like boats, they both have bikes out front and a bar inside, and they both have two word titles that start with the same letter, Goofy Goobers and Thug Tug. Is it possible that this place is actually a former Goofy Goobers establishment that was abandoned? I mean, they literally have the Goofy Goober theme song on hand. <laughs> And it also didn't have the windows. Goofy theme song. And they claim that this no kids crazy. are allowed here, yet we see some old kid sized crazy. handprints in this the bathroom. Is crazy. If this really is a no, 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 this. my boy. Them them handprints are like this. So somebody could have been getting taken. I don't think. No, don't um, say that. No, don't, don't do, boy. I don't think that's kids, my boy. I'm just saying. The former Goofy Goobers. And they only have a male bathroom. know the truth about the cult. And there's no windows. Why they're so against having anyone who's not manly in the bar. It's not because they hate kids. It's because they're trying to keep out a dangerous cult. Mm. If SpongeBob and Patrick just stuck around a little longer, maybe they would have learned this too. But they quickly sneak out and even make fun of the tough guys at the bar. Come on, Pat. One more time. Okay. We're on the baby hunt. I don't think we don't know how to weed them out. <laughs> Clearly, they didn't get the lesson they were supposed to from this place. Then they go through a fish graveyard and stop at a random ice cream stand, but it turns out it was actually a trap for a monster to lure unsuspecting victims. Okay, Patrick, let's. I'm, you can let go now. Hmm, an ice cream store that's a facade for something darker that lures people in and keeps them trapped. Sheesh. It's like the ocean is literally screaming the truth to Spongebob and Patrick, but they just this aren't getting it. Hell. But then they reach an obstacle that's just 
too great for them in the past, and it makes them reevaluate some things about themselves. We're not kids! Open your eyes, Patrick! We worship a dancing peanut for corn's sake! You've been wearing the same goofy goober peanut party underpants for three years straight! Oh, you're right, 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 right. It isn't until Mindy helps them realize that they're more than just goofy goober kids that they can continue on their journey. They sing an entire Mindy. song about how they believe in themselves now, and Patrick even says this. Now, now that we're men, I changed my underwear! They have finally broken free from the cult's indoctrination, but... Unfortunately, it doesn't last very long. They're stopped by a hitman Plankton hire to take them out, and he completely destroys all the progress they've made to grow as characters. Step aside and you won't have to feel the awesome wrath of our mustaches. These. <laughs> they were fake? Of course they were fake! They end up getting abducted by a scuba diver, who, to them, is a terrifying alien from another world, which is an interesting parallel to Reginald Goober being taken by aliens. They're taken to Shell City in a room full of dead fish, a place eerily similar to a death cult after a mass suicide. While Spongebob and Patrick are being dried to death, they decide to fully embrace the Goofy Goober's beliefs and spend their last moments oh, alive. Like when you die, uh, they say you gotta give your life to God. <laughs> <laughs> These things ain't shit! Singing the Goofy Goober theme song. I'm a goofy and they got saved. But then, just like death cults always promise, they and everyone in the room are reborn when the sprinkler system turns on. Yo! They got saved. Whew, this is, uh, it's getting real dark. Uh, then, we get to the climactic finale of the movie. You, SpongeBob returns to the Krusty Krab, now a changed man. He has to battle man? Plankton and his army of mind-controlled slaves, and this is how the final confrontation plays out. And if I've learned anything during that and nigga time, rags you watching this like hell yeah. Who you are. So yeah, I'm a kid and I'm also a goofball and a wingnut. Except for the whole heart. <laughs> What's going on here? But most of all, and then it came out. What are you? What are you, Spun? I want the scallop. I'm, I'm a goofy goober. I'm a yeah. goofy goober. On first watch, this is such a satisfying and cathartic moment for Spongebob, but in reality, this is the moment that he has gone past the point of no return and becomes a goofy goober. Now, this is normally when I pretend like the video was over and clip. then surprise you with a last minute twist, I but I don't need to pretend this time. If you think this entire video has been insane rambling and none of this could possibly be intentional, well then just for you, I have saved my best piece of evidence for last. Oh. Are you ready? <laughs> While Spongebob sings the Goofy Goober song, we cut to him standing on the world and getting abducted by a UFO. Oh, and even shit. the UFO's lights make a oh, pattern of shit. red, yellow, red, which is eerily similar to the Goofy Goober UFO that has two red cherries with a yellow banana in the middle and that is the goofy goober alien God death cult that theory. one was a stretch that, that last one was a little stretch but i know you got more come on come on now but he still got abducted by alien though no cap oh the cat didn't die he ain't eat the cat the fat cat hey. love cat how did he get the cat to participate in this scene uh, wow. Didn't think I could, uh, make these theories any darker, could ya? Gotta love that good old family-friendly PG-rated SpongeBob. I am having so much oh, fun shit. making these videos. Don't worry, we've got plenty more on the way. I'm just making SpongeBob stuff from now on. Seriously? I've been your host, Alex the SpongeBob Guy. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you. Stop the cap. Uh, stop stop the, cap. the cap. Don't you dare stop click off this cap. video, you whores. Stop the you cap. Hey, hey, you Let's dumb. Go. Hey, don't Let's click go. off. Stop it. We got three minutes left. Let's go. I know you click monkeys trying to leave. Stop the cap, Alex. Oh, that hoodie actually pressure. Hey. What's up? I'm going to assume you're still down here. Um, I thought about what you $5 asked. $5 a square. Sorry, I, I just can't. I mean, it's, it's one thing to, to buy you meat, but... 
a living animal, like a cat, that's not a line that I'm willing to cross. And if that means you're not going to give me Spongebob theories anymore, then so be it. Oh, he feed but him the... Okay. Honestly, man, good luck finding someone else that's going to be willing to be a part of whatever this weird relationship is between us. Think about be yanked into the Come on. I know you can hear me. Oh. Perfect for Halloween. That boy Squid was about to beat your ass. Oh, he took the cat. That nigga said, I'm going to eat what I please. Cat. He took the cat. This nigga Squid was right. Fluffy go. That nigga about to say, now what? What did you do? <laughs> 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 he did what you My could. boy, I took what you brought. My boy. It's Is it crabs. Mr. Krabs? It's crabs. Nah, but crabs don't have ink. Me. No. No, no, no. No, but but I changed my mind. I, I didn't I didn't give you the cat. You purchased the cat. You brought it to this hole. I Shit. simply finished the job. No, no, th- this is not what I wanted, okay? This is, this isn't worth it. We are fucking done. Gave her number boy, seven. We both know you can't go back now. Okay. This is the last time and then I want you out of this house. Uh, uh, uh. Squidward. Squidward! It is Squidward! Squidward. Yeah, <laughs> nigga! Yeah! 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 <laughs> yeah! Nigga! What are you talking about? That nigga tore that cat up. <laughs> yeah! Okay, we got shit. a number seven Squat. coming! So I admit it, some of my theories have been a little crazy lately. Of course. I mean, Goofy Goober alien death cult theory, right, right, Pearl's right. dead mother theory. Mm-hmm. Let's maybe try and slow down a bit on this. But they all were right. We don't need you to slow down. There is a secret robot invasion happening in Bikini Bottom. Everywhere okay. you look, robots have integrated themselves into society, kidnapping and replacing people with robot cyborgs, waiting for I their chance to rise up and start the robot apocalypse. Okay, I ain't gonna lie, this seemed far out of the field. <laughs> this seemed like it's out of nowhere. And I can tell you for a fact, it's gonna have something to do with this plankton wife. Damn near. I guarantee you, plank computer wife got something to do with this. Damn near. This is not a joke. I repeat, the robots are coming. The robots are coming. Robots is here. Robot invasion theory. Mm. Mm. Okay, let's get it. Oh, the cinematography. My boy, my boy is a filmmaker. I love it here. Also, just to let you know, Alex, when you see this, both me and Mike both now have the FX3. Mm. So we going crazy, dog. Mm. Oh, look, 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 your boy, Scott. I, ooh. I'm out there hooping. You see me? I ain't, t- I ain't tell you about my, my gig. You ever realize Alex kind of look like Papa Meat? Alex. Damn, man. Alex. Oh. Sorry, what? You okay, dude? Uh. Yeah, sorry, um, I've just got a lot on my mind lately. How's the, uh, Spongebob theorizing going? It's good, it's good, um, I'm actually thinking about maybe stopping. Why? They're huge! Yeah, I mean, people watch them, it's just... I didn't go to film school for three years just to make Spongebob theories forever. Damn. Yeah, Thanks. but I mean, it's just something you're doing now. It doesn't mean you have to do them, like, forever. True. It's easy for you to say. I mean, what, you're a year out of film school and you're already directing commercials? Yeah, but I didn't go to film school to make commercials either. It's just something I'm doing for now. I like SpongeBob theories. Yeah, maybe. I don't know, these, uh... I really appreciate this nigga quality. Like, Alex... Audio quality up there, my boy. Audio, audio quality. I heard audio a little quality. wind on the other side. But it just... It looks so good. I love how it's shot. It feels... Yeah, bro. I can see I can see you went to film school. These videos also just... They, they take a lot to make. Not sure if I'm up for it anymore. Dude, up for it? You're just like watching cartoons all day. That sounds awesome. I would kill to have as many followers as you, man. I'd be set. 
I've been trying to get my film funded for months, and I still have nothing to show for it. You know, sounds like a pretty sweet gig you got there. But <laughs> no, boy, Alex, like, stop fucking talking to me. <laughs> The robots are coming! Let's go, Alex. One of my favorite episodes of Spongebob is the season 3 episode, Crab Borg. Spongebob watches a scary robot movie, oh, and yeah. he's super paranoid about robots taking over, and he, he even kidnaps Mr. Crab. Yes, I remember what? this! You think I'm a robot?! We don't think, we, we know. know. It's a really funny episode, huh, but... Huh. What's the color of my underwear? <laughs> SpongeBob, you gotta ask him a question first. <laughs> I can't help but wonder if SpongeBob's fears might be a bit more justified than we thought. Mm. In the episode SB129, we get our first glimpse of the future of Bikini Bottom, 2,000 years later. Okay, oh, okay. Uh, what's going on here? Why is everything Shiny. chrome? Everything <laughs> is chrome in the future. Is that where that sound come from? What? Why is everything chrome? Yes! I didn't yeah. know that. We see a world covered in chrome, where everyone has been replaced with robotic people. SpongeBob, is that you? SpongeBob? No, I am SpongeDron. And this isn't Damn. the only time we see a future full of robots. In the season seven episode, Back to the Past, SpongeBob time travels to an alternate future where Man Ray takes over, and once again, people have been replaced by robots. And okay, then, okay. in the second but SpongeBob movie, SpongeBob Water, Water, there's a deleted scene where SpongeBob and Plankton go to the future and see this. We did it! I wonder when we are. Yeah, Excuse yeah. me, sir. Do you know what year this is? Oh. Parks? Avoid that we didn't go back in time. Time. We went correct in time. And there's even foreshadowing in episodes that take place in the present. In the Krusty Krab training video, we hear this. Well, luckily for you, Mr. Krab's fear of robot overlords keeps the balance of technology in check. Mm. And in its security guards, we can see an exhibit that clearly shows the evolution of SpongeBob eventually getting taken over by oh, robots. That's crazy. Okay, so there that's seems crazy. to be a lot of evidence for the future of Bikini Bottom being taken over by robots. But what about but the now? Honestly. Why does any of this matter? Facts. I mean, robots ruling the world is a pretty common depiction of the future in lots of different media. Facts. And even if this is the canonical future of the show, it's at the very least thousands of years in the future. It's not like we can already see this robot invasion happening in present nope. day Bikini Bottom. Yeah, you can. Right? Computer wise. Here's an interesting question about SpongeBob that's always bothered me. Why are there so many robots in the show? And I'm not talking about Sandy or Plankton's inventions. It makes sense for them to have robots since they're both genius inventors. But why do hostile hospitals and office buildings and amusement parks and Weenie Hut Juniors and many, many more places have such advanced robots. I mean, let's ignore the fact that they're underwater and robots wouldn't really make sense down here. Bikini Bottom True. isn't like a super advanced society, right? You wouldn't really say that they have much futuristic technology, except when it comes to robots. Facts. But why? And what's even stranger is that there are many, many instances where these robots suddenly turn evil. The first time I really started to notice this was in the season 7 episode Tunnel of Glove. SpongeBob and Pearl get trapped in a Glove World boat ride that's full of animatronics. Patrick tries to set them free by breaking into the control room, but accidentally causes all the animatronics to suddenly turn evil and attack SpongeBob. Hey, yo! <laughs> This is a pretty basic cartoon trope. Someone accidentally breaks the controls, then the robot malfunctions and turns evil. This isn't really all that weird for SpongeBob. Facts. Except what's strange about this is that Patrick doesn't break any controls. He hits a button labeled animatronic override, and that's what causes the robots to turn evil. Why is that even there? Surely lean on this wall. Huh? Oh, I'm giving the robots control over themselves. They aren't malfunctioning. The robots were intentionally designed to have a why button that, that makes them attack needed? people, but why? Then, in the episode Good Neighbors, Scoop- I feel like this has something to do with aliens. I feel it like does. this somehow, this is like, like, Combating the aliens, or I, this is gonna tie into the aliens. I can. I can discovers say. a flyer for a home security system that's suspiciously free, despite it clearly being very advanced. After he sets it up, his house suddenly grows arms and legs and starts destroying Bikini Bottom. Whoa! This house is destroying the neighborhood. They had a tank. 
Now, to be fair, this was a malfunction caused by SpongeBob, but why would a simple home security system have giant arms and legs? I mean, the malfunction didn't create them, they were clearly already installed. They eventually do manage to stop the house, but what's really creepy about this is that we can still see signs of Squidward's house being sentient after this episode. Then, in the season 11 episode, Yo. Krusty Cleaners, SpongeBob and Patrick go to an office building and encounter a trash cleaning robot. The robot immediately attacks them for causing a mess. <laughs> Robots no, just don't like my them. Rumpus roasting! But this time, there's Robots no malfunction that causes like this. It's working exactly as intended. Not only does the trash robot have a buzzsaw and a literal laser cannon, but Whoa. it also turns all of the nearby machines into killer robots to help hunt down SpongeBob and Patrick. So where are all these places getting these super advanced robots? And more importantly, why are they all being programmed to suddenly Answer turn my questions, evil? Alex. This is a question that stumped me for a while. Okay, I don't know. I'm, we're gonna see. Until I watch the season 11 episode. My leg! This is the episode where My I truly leg! realized there was an actual conspiracy theory oh, here oh. and not just cartoon antics. It's time we finally find out who is behind the robot invasion. Please don't beat on my leg, guy. How do. Wait, what the hell? Wait, 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 wait. wait, wait, wait. From a larder. <laughs> <laughs> thing in the basement if you'd have watched into the mind you know what it is oh man bro <laughs> yeah. hey oh um, no, he came out the basement oh yeah i'm still serious about you leaving this house it's not that i don't appreciate everything you've done for me it's just I think we want very different things. You know, I don't, I don't want it to come to this, but I will. I will use force if I have to. So you you better go. Break it down. Oh. The episode, My Leg, focuses on the reoccurring gag of this one fish always injuring his leg throughout the show. My leg! My leg! My leg! Oh. At the in the episode, he goes to a hospital and meets a robot that works there. It's just a small throwaway gag. The robot never turns evil or does anything strange. But the robot's missing a leg. Don't take my leg! Don't take my leg! But there's something awfully familiar about the robot's design. Let's go all the way back to the season three episode, Plankton's Army, which opens with Plankton trying to steal the Krabby Patty secret formula with a robot disguise. You never know what trick he'll use to steal me secret Krabby Patty formula. What a quaint restaurant. I think I will sample their wares. These robots have an uncanny similarity right down to the same tie. Okay, but maybe we could just chalk this up to the showrunners being lazy and reusing assets. But SpongeBob has always had a pretty diverse amount of robot designs throughout the show. And it's not like this is a direct copy paste either. They went to the effort to redesign the face and colors, but it was still clearly based on Plankton's robot. So here's my theory. Plankton has built many robots to try and steal the Krabby Patty secret formula, but I think after he fails to do so, he doesn't just throw them away. He redesigns the robots and then gives them to different businesses in Bikini Bottom with the intention to one day use them to take over the world once he has enough in place. I mean, we know what Plankton really wants isn't the secret formula, it's to rule the world. I will rule the world! And there's even the video game Battle for Bikini Bottom, That's where Plankton tried to take over business. using an army of robots. So, this theory doesn't seem I'm too far-fetched for Plankton's character, but we're gonna need a lot more evidence if we're gonna prove he's the one behind all the robots in Bikini Bottom. Facts. So, let's Fun, get started. Cool, in the season three episode, No Weenies Allowed, we see a robot working at a place called Weenie Hut Juniors. Would you care for another diet cola with a lemon twist, Weenie? And while it doesn't resemble any of the robots we've seen Plankton make, does that voice sound familiar to you? Would you care for another diet cola with a lemon twist, what a quaint restaurant? Yo! Their wares. And again, it's not like this is the default robot voice we hear in Spongebob. There are many different voices the show has used for robot characters. What a quaint restaurant. Greetings, I am Robo 2.1. No threat detected. This is very uncomfortable. Leave my father alone! 
but here Yo, they specifically what is that created from? the voice from Plankton's robot. Let's go back to Glove World for a second. Okay. In the control room, we see a machine on the wall that looks shockingly like Whoa. SpongeBob. So much so that Patrick SpongeBob. even mistakes him for it. We know Plankton has built a SpongeBob robot before in Welcome to the Chum Bucket. Maybe he repurposed it here inside of Glove World. Yeah. In Krusty Cleaners, the trash robot also has a striking resemblance to Plankton's robot in the season 9 episode Eek and Urchin. In the season 5 episode, The Patty Gadget, Squidward tries to get SpongeBob fired by replacing him with a machine that creates Krabby Patties for free. But it's never explained where Squidward got this machine. Now, it doesn't resemble anything we've seen Plankton make, but a staple in a lot of Plankton's inventions is having them resemble his likeness, especially one with one eye in one the middle. Eye. And that's exactly what we see with the Patty Gadget. And oh, the patties it makes are terrible, which would make sense for something Plankton made. Facts. In the episode All That Glitters, SpongeBob buys a super advanced talking spatula. <laughs> Les Spatula 3000 at your service. But in the episode oh, Evil Spatula, we find out Plankton has a whole collection of advanced spatulas just like this one, and even tries to trick SpongeBob into taking a talking spatula. It seems like no matter where we turn, we can find a connection between the technology in Bikini Bottom and Plankton. But if you remember in those glimpses of the future, the world isn't just ruled by robots. They've actually replaced all the existing citizens with robot copies. Well, that's great. I am SpongeBob. Believe it or not, this is also something we can already see happening in Bikini Bottom today. Okay. Get ready to see how far this robot invasion has really gone. Surprise, this man! No, how hey. to keep us locked hey. in, guys. Victoria, dang, what are you? Uh, what are you? What are you doing here? Um, I was just around. Thought I'd stop by. Can I come in? Or? Uh, inside? Inside? Uh, no, no, no. It's just it's not a good time right now. Um, in all honesty, it kind of seems like you're going through something. You think? I just wanted to check in on you. Uh, I appreciate that. It's just, I'm fine. You know, uh, it's just the, the SpongeBob stuff is been keeping me really busy. I'm a little stressed about that. And, um, but I'm, I'm fine. You should, you should probably go. You're being really weird. You're not answering your phone. You're living in total darkness. Can you just talk to me? What's going on? Okay, fine. Okay. We can talk. Just, just not here. Fine. Do you want to get coffee or something? Sure. Fine. Yeah. Um, uh, I gotta put something away. Just stay right here. That mug gonna take all them knives and be waiting for my boy. I wanna, I wanna see a show from Alex. I really I do. See a show. I really I do. I feel like it feel great. A little bit of comedy, a little bit of drama. I feel like that mug will feel Facts. great. Or, or a film. You know what I'm saying? Hey, yes. Hey. I ain't gonna lie, I like the way that felt. Yeah, he, he's now, great. He's a great know writer. We has tried to turn people into robots before. SpongeBob, come in here. <laughs> Or should I say Robot Bob? But he gave up after SpongeBob was too annoying. <laughs> You've got to take that yellow nightmare back. It's not worth it. But I don't think this was his only attempt. In the season 11 episode, The Checkup, SpongeBob and Squidward are trying to give Mr. Krabs a health checkup by testing his pinching reflexes. Okay, I brought plenty of things for Mr. Krabs to pinch. Uh, pinch us all. I don't know, but I don't <laughs> And one of the things they have him pinch is a baby. A baby cheek. Robot hmm, some random baby just turned out to be a robot, and it's never explained why. That's weird even for Spongebob, Yo. but things get even more interesting when we go back to Season 9 in the episode Plankton's Pet, where Plankton tries to steal a Krabby Patty using the exact same purple baby Whoa. as a robot disguise. Diabolical fiend! This fool Plankton is a genius. This is working. And we're not even done yet. If we go even further back to the season five episode Goo Goo Gas, we can actually see the exact moment where Plankton gets the idea to turn the baby into a robot. Why you're so tiny and helpless? I could take your formula whenever I wanted to, and you That's couldn't messed do up. a thing about That's it. Messed up. That's, so That's messed it. Up. Finally, victory will be mine. Now, in the episode, it's implied that this is just him getting the idea to turn everyone into babies to steal the formula, but nah. isn't it crazy how it also perfectly nah. lines up with the purple baby fish suddenly turning into a robot in future episodes? Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. there's another fish who's always been very suspicious to me. The strangely realistic news anchor fish. Yeah. All of Bikini Bottom is a buzz it's a robot. the identity of a mysterious flying man who helps people. Who knows what superhero act of courage he'll astound us with next? In a show full of cartoon characters, why is he the only realistic one. In fact, True. I made a whole theory about how there are evolved cartoony fish that can talk and primitive realistic fish who can't. But as many people have pointed out, the one exception to this is the realistic news anchor fish. Yeah. Well, 
if you ask me, he looks a lot like one of those animatronic singing yeah. fish you buy in a gift shop. Yeah. Especially the way he mechanically moves his mouth and how we only ever see one side of him. So, already a pretty strong indication that he might be a robot, but there's also something familiar about his voice. What kind of cruel, sound like careless, evil person. It does! I'll canvas all he the like That's, crazy. In town. That's right, he has the same voice as Plankton. And if you're gonna take over the world, then you're definitely gonna want to control the media. True. But how exactly is Plankton replacing these people with plank robots? Well, I think the season 10 hey, episode of Whirly Brains gives us an important clue. In this episode, suddenly a new toy becomes extremely popular in Bikini Bottom, the Whirly Brain. Just flip your lid, attach the propeller, and watch your brain soar. What? Face into the air. Yeah, oh. it's a weird episode. So people are actually voluntarily attaching devices to their brains and ripping what them out the? of their bodies, and no one thinks I that never this saw is that. suspicious. If you ask me, this seems like the perfect way to replace someone yeah. with a robot. Remember, in Welcome to the Chum Bucket, Plankton told us how he turns people into robots. Uh. This thing of Plankton can do everything but steal the dang formula. Bro, forget Plankton. Every this thing. dude, Alex, <laughs> out here making this goddamn what? <laughs> I did. I'll be forced to remove your brain and implant it in my robot chef. By removing their brains. But is there any proof that he's the one behind the Whirly Brain toys? Let's take a look at the new SpongeBob prequel, The Patrick Star Show. Every once in a while, the show cuts to this stop motion parody of Frankenstein with Plankton, and he actually uses Whirly Brains to conduct his experiments. Wow. It's it's not super clear how this all connects to the main show. I mean, we do see Patrick interact with the stop motion plankton at some point, so they're at least in the same universe, but regardless, it's still a solid connection. We see another head-based gadget in the season 11 episode, Bottle Burglars, an invisible helmet being advertised in a magazine for only 99 cents. And in the same episode, we see plankton using the exact same helmet. Crabs will never see me coming in Whoa. Now, maybe this is just implying that he bought the helmet. I ain't gonna lie, my boy was very muscular. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this. God damn, Plankton. That boy got abs got for days. Sheesh. That boy plays. <laughs> Look at this man ripped off, guys. <laughs> Now, maybe this is just implying that he bought the helmet from the magazine, but that doesn't really line up with what we know about Plankton as an inventor. Plus, I can't see them selling a tiny version of the helmet just True. for Plankton. Yeah. Seems a lot more likely that Plankton created the helmet and is selling them to the people of Bikini Bottom, possibly as a way to create more robots. All right, so we're starting to get a pretty clear idea of how Plankton plans on turning the citizens of Bikini Bottom into robots. But there is one more character that I believe has already been secretly assimilated into a robot. And it's not some random background character either. It's one of the main characters in SpongeBob Squidward? SquarePants. This final part of the robot invasion theory. Who your money on? One of the main characters. I think Squidward is Sandy. Pick one. Pick one. Pick one. I'm going to say Sandy. I'm going to say Pearl. I'm going to say Pearl? I don't know why. I'm going to just say Pearl. Bro, you going to be... You I'll all be the way wrong, you I'm going to say Pearl. Why? I don't know. It's just in my head. It's just Pearl. Why? I don't know. No, it can't it's, be Pearl. He made a, a theory about a Pearl already. It's, it's either Sandy. Sandy. I'm going to say Sandy. It's either Sandy or school. Sandy. And the reason why I think it's Sandy, because she's just as smart as him. It's definitely going to be Mr. Krabs, but I'm going to say Sandy. She's I, Nah, because it can't be Mr. Krabs, because he would have got the formula. Oh, yeah, formula. he would have got the formula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, right, I'm going to go right, with Sandy. Right. And the reason why I say it's Sandy, she's just as smart as him. Get rid of the competition. It's going to completely change the way you look at the entire show. Are you ready? Because this is the Patrick Star Theory. Patrick? <laughs> Patch? <sighs> Pat? Oh, yeah, 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 the cat. Damn. <laughs> Victoria! 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 No. Did she go down there? He got caught. I'm loving this second storyline. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, Alex Cole. If y'all knew how cold Alex really was, 
Y'all don't these, get it Y'all just see stuff on a screen Yeah but like what as a YouTuber do, What it takes to do this As a filmmaker As a filmmaker yes have it be this quality Not yeah. even just as a filmmaker But to tie it in perfectly As a YouTuber yep. The main storyline Your secondary storyline Pacing Oh my god Alex I love you Hat now, I fully realize saying Patrick is a robot is a very bold claim. And unbelievable. hold your judgments till the end. No. By far, the most requested <laughs> theory to get on this channel is to cover Patrick Starr, and more specifically, his inconsistent intelligence. Throughout the entire show, there are these little moments where Patrick suddenly says something smart. I'm a bit more complicated than that. The inner machinations of my mind are an enigma. And then immediately goes back to being dumb. There's so many examples of this happening that many people have actually made their own theories about it. Is Patrick secretly a genius and just pretending to be dumb? Does he have a secret split personality? I diagnosed Patrick Starr with trauma-induced anxiety triggered spontaneously duplicative multi-intellectual DID with additional paranoid Whoa. Whoa. Nigga, what? what? Whoa! What? Whoa! <laughs> Okay. Schizophrenic delusions of a mental multiverse. Uh, uh, maybe, but I've come to a bit of a different conclusion. Have you ever noticed how every time we see Patrick try to think, there's either sparks or smoke coming out of his head? Oh, like he's like an engine starting up. Uh, 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 it's Patrick thinking again. And Dang. almost every time we see inside of Patrick's head, it's represented with gears or some Dang. kind of machinery. Now, we're supposed to assume that this is just a cartoony way to visualize thoughts, but what's strange is just how consistent they are with it. And even stranger, none of the other characters' thoughts are visualized this way. Yeah. Just got an order from the boss. Dump everything that isn't about fine dining. Squidward's happy gland is forced to take shelter in the recesses of his mind. It's only Patrick who seems to have this robotic association with him. And just look at how detailed they are with it. While Patrick's head is sparking in a rule of dumb, if you look closely, you can see a spring pop out of him and even a hole left behind by the spring. That is such a small detail that no one would notice. And the fact that his eyes followed it. That boy SpongeBob saw that. Unless yeah. you were going frame by frame. He saw and if this it. is just supposed to be a metaphor inside That's of Patrick's crazy. head, how come SpongeBob clearly sees the spring come out? Okay, okay. So let's entertain the idea for a moment that Patrick might be some sort of robot. How would he have gotten converted, and why does this cause him to randomly become smart every once in a while? Well, I looked at all the scenes where Patrick suddenly does something smart, and I noticed a bit of a pattern. There are two different types of these moments. There are times when we think he's saying something intelligent. Wait, SpongeBob! We're not cavemen! We have technology! But then it's revealed he's not actually being smart. <laughs> This doesn't contradict his character at all. Patrick is someone who doesn't see himself as dumb, so there's lots of times when he tries to be smart, but he fails. Dumb people are always blissfully bro, unaware bro. of how dumb they really Patrick are. Patrick is funny, bro. <laughs> he really is. There are also the moments eye, where he saying. actually does do something undeniably smart. Wait a minute, Squidward. They might be onto something. We could filter the CO2 through our ballast tanks, oh, refire the engines, and ride the shockwave out of here. Wow. He's right! But then he immediately acts oblivious to the fact that he was being smart. We're going through with your plan, Patrick! Yay! What plan? So, I kept track of these two different types of moments, and it okay. seems like after season three is when he suddenly he switches from pretending to be smart precious. to actually having these smart moments. And this switch perfectly lines up with the season four episode, Patrick's Smarty Pants. Okay. In this episode, Patrick falls off a cliff and gets his head knocked off. SpongeBob accidentally replaces his head with some brain oh, no. coral, which makes him become a genius. I find all this laughter to be highly illogical. In the end, they switch back to his normal head and Patrick goes back to his usual stupid self. But take a closer look at the scene when he first puts on the brain coral. Here's your head. Now, oh, he was already a robot? Yeah. 
I've interpreted these gears with cobwebs as a metaphor for Patrick's brain never being used until now, but these gears are not from Patrick's brain. His brain came off during the fall, which means these gears are entirely from the brain coral. Oh. And at the end of the episode, when they remove the brain coral, we can still see the electrical plug attached to it. We are no longer seeing a metaphorical representation inside of someone's head. We are seeing this plug from an outside perspective. The brain coral is just like the Whirly Brains, a robotic device that plugs into your brain to control you. Isn't it convenient that Patrick just happened to land next to a pile of coral that looked identical to his head? Is it possible that Plankton saw this as an opportunity to add another victim to his robot invasion? But after nah. Patrick removed it, he went back to normal, right? He completely stopped Plankton's plan, right? Well, one season later, in the episode Sing a Song of Patrick, Patrick attempts to use his brain again, and we see the exact same gears inside of his head. Come on, you stupid brain! Wait! No cobwebs the this creators time. went out of their way to recreate the exact placement of all the gears from the brain coral, which means the head Patrick put on at the end of Patrick's Smarty Pants was not his head. It was another Yo. piece of robotic brain coral. But it seems like for whatever reason, this brain coral isn't as effective as the first one, and he's only able to have rare moments of genius. In the season 12 episode, SpongeBob's Big Birthday Blowout, Patrick has another one of his smart moments. Oh, would you look at the hour? It's almost time for me to take SpongeBob on a tour so you guys can decorate his house! But this moment in particular is very interesting because Plankton is actually there to witness it. And take a guess how Plankton responds to him. I guess even a broken moron can be right once a day. He calls Patrick a broken moron because he knows Patrick is a broken one of his experiments. And if you still don't believe me, in the newest episode of season 13, The Goofy Scoopers, we get this scene. This stinks. I wanted to go backstage for an autograph. Plank oh. Bro, look at his fucking hand. <laughs> <laughs> Yo. <laughs> <laughs> Yo. He got a parking ticket on that bug. Tin was here. Yes, he certainly was. And that is the robot invasion theory. Thank you very much. Nah. We both know how this goes. You're missing nah. some stuff. Come on. It doesn't. Okay, robot invasion. I was about to fight uh, yeah. you. Invasion theory done. <laughs> Hey, Not we just all. passed 500,000 subscribers. Gang. Thank you guys so much. Boy. This is honestly a dream come true for me. I mean, I've always wanted to have this many people watching me. Hey, first of all, Godzilla, if you ever watch our video, you suck. Okay? You suck. Yeah, you, that's the, You are that's absolute horrible, garbage, and I want you to know this. Horrible, uh, if you ever see it. our video, you're garbage. You're a shitty person because the short was pressured. For um, <laughs> SpongeBob theory. Fucking, you dickwad. You guys wouldn't like all immediately unsubscribe and leave me if I stop making these, right? Hell no. Nah. Uh, thanks again for watching. We here, I've been gang. your host, the, the SpongeBob guy. I will see you. I'll, I'll, In I'll see you seconds. guys. Bye. In a few seconds. Bye. I swear to God, if you go back to the film. Wait, Victoria. Do not give me the silent treatment right now. I swear to God, if you did something, I'll. What you gonna do? <laughs> You better go get the blicky. Oh my god! Victoria! Where were you? I was using your bathroom. Why the fuck are you pointing a knife at me? Shit, uh, okay, it doesn't matter, okay? You, you cannot be here right now. No, I am not leaving until then you tell me what's downstairs? going on. Listen, listen, I promise I will explain everything to you later. You just, you cannot be in here. Why are you so afraid of me being in your house? Victoria, I promise you, this is not the time. We have to leave right now. Your muse isn't gonna eat me! What? what? How would you? You mean the big how would you tentacle monster in my basement? Yeah. How do you know about that? I have one too. What? What? Okay, look here. That was incomplete. The we theory is something. The theory was incomplete. The theory was incomplete. And why would you say so? The reason why I say so. This is okay. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong. Right? Did it not leave you wanting more? Does it not? Does it not feel incomplete? Because I get the tie-in proving that Patrick is a robot, right? And that Plankton is controlling all of them, and Plankton is controlling all of them. However, 
it feels like something's missing. I guess it was probably just the way he worded certain things at the end. It just you feel it like feels like there was more to go. Yeah, probably. something is missing here. I don't know what. Prime example. But in conclusion, there's robots taking over. Yeah, Lincoln is behind it. But here's Patrick the thing: is a secret robot that failed. Yeah, but here's the thing: he never explained. Why plankton is never depicted in the future when the robots have taken over? That's another thing. That's why. That's one reason I feel like mm. Alex. What's up, bro? I love it though. So this time, instead of ending with the big twist, okay. I'm just gonna open with it. Okay. The Flying Dutchman is the ghost oh. of Patchy the Pirate. This what? is a claim that makes absolutely no sense. At all. They look different, they act different, and most importantly, Patchy the Pirate is alive at the same time we see the Flying right. Dutchman. Facts. It would be impossible to prove that they're the same person, right? Yes. Well, you know, I like a challenge. Let's this is it. the time traveling ghost pirate theory. Time traveling? Okay. You mean the big tentacle monster in my basement? Yeah. Uh oh, Phil McGee. You know about that? I have one too. What? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. The muse. They they each have their. So muse. yeah. When you say you have a muse, you mean you also have a creepy monster thing in your basement giving you SpongeBob theories? Well, no, it didn't give me SpongeBob theories. It got me my commercial jobs. Yeah, I didn't gave even know there else. was more than one. I have like a thousand questions right now. Like, what exactly are they? Where do they come from? What do they want? Oh, um, I probably don't know that much more than you. Mine just showed up in my house one day and eventually it left. Wait. You, you don't want it to leave. And you don't have a muse? No. I just kept giving mine meat and got me a permanent job and then it left. Listen, I know they seem really weird and creepy at first, but honestly, they're just here to help. Honestly, but didn't you have to? If you had that in real life, would you want it to stay or leave? The muse? Yes. That motherfucker got go. He got to go. go. What y'all would y'all do if it's giving well, you? Well, if, <laughs> if, if it's giving me million few ideas, <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm gonna yeah. go get you a cat. <laughs> to feed yours like more than just meat? No. What have you been feeding yours? A cat. Mine ate a cat. <laughs> Hang on, you gave your muse a cat? I didn't feed it the cat, okay? It, it was in my cat. home and then it, it took it, okay? It wasn't my fault. Okay, well, obviously you don't have a cat in your home when you have a muse. Listen. The framing. Just keep look. giving it meat and uh -oh. eventually it'll leave you with enough SpongeBob theories to right. last you for years. Mm. Mm. Where does Alex go after this? I, don't, I know that's I don't a question know. he's racking his brain. I don't Where know. do y'all see him going after Short this? films. Because obviously SpongeBob theories can't last forever. I mean, they could. And it's done wonders, but, but where does it go from Short here? films. Short films. Short films. He, he takes he takes his, his short films to the next level. His core audience that genuinely loves him and the content he makes. They push his short films. They push his short films. Because he has the gift. Yeah, he has he it. He has it. He has it. You just got to gotta take it. Because I think, I think if I remember correctly, he's shooting all this with a GH4. Mm. <coughs> old school. Not really, but. Hey, so I've been thinking about things and uh, I'm willing to well, I got the continue shirt. our relationship, but things have to be very different this time. No more eating living animals. Let's just stick to the store bought meat, okay? That nigga say, deal. <laughs> oh. Number eight. Okay. Ready to go. Uh, great. <laughs> Glad we're on the same page. You know, I'm I'm sorry about all the shouting and the craziness. You know, I will have. Oh, he's you what? Bro. What? Oh. what? I think if we just communicated <clears throat> better, we could have, you know, avoided a lot of the issues that we were having. Oh. But I'm glad we finally have an understanding. Oh. <laughs> Son of a gun. He's in the whole house. Oh, that's, oh, no, oh, no, that's the other move. That's another muse. <coughs> oh, oh, wait. Okay. Is he infected? Before I get into how these characters connect, I have to explain the tragic backstory of Patchy the uh -oh. Pirate. Uh-oh. Okay. I'm Patchy the Pirate, the president of the SpongeBob SquarePants fan club. Patchy the Pirate is the president of the SpongeBob fan club, and right. they often cut to Makes him sense. during special episodes to host the show and talk to the audience. He fits in perfectly with my television theory. He uh -huh. clearly works for the in-universe SpongeBob SquarePants showrunners as some kind of mascot for the show. Boring! Well, if it isn't my less than a 
amusing sidekick, Patty the Parrot. Patchy is this weird, lonely guy whose only friend is a talking parrot who's constantly harassing him. And I'm also pretty sure Patchy wants to eat him. Shivers what? It timbers, it's Patty! <laughs> I wonder what parrot tastes like! <laughs> but that's not what this theory's about. If you rewatch all the episodes with Patchy, you start to notice a bit of a disturbing development with his character. Oh, Patchy snap. has devoted his entire life to SpongeBob, okay. but that devotion is very one sided. And the more time that goes on, the more resentful Patchy becomes of SpongeBob. In the season no. 3 episode Party Pooper Pants, Patchy throws a house party and tries to invite SpongeBob, but he doesn't show doesn't up. Show, Say, obviously. You didn't bring SpongeBob with you, did you? Gee, I sure hope he got his invitation. I'd sure like to go to this party, oh, but I can't read actually... the invitation. Oh, but man. Patchy doesn't really seem to be that upset about it. Ah, well. But then things start to take a turn in the episode The Sponge Who Could Fly. Patchy follows a map and goes on a crazy adventure to find the legendary lost SpongeBob episode, and after finally getting it, this is what plays. What? what? That's it? What? That's the last episode? He's angry. That was just a bunch of cheap walk cycles! What a rip! So, Patchy got let down uh -oh. by SpongeBob again. Uh -oh. But I'm sure he'll get over it just like last time. No. Nope. SpongeBob betrayed us! I'm sorry I ever started this! Oh, oh no, 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 it's not that serious! Patchy has a full on mental breakdown. <laughs> now, eventually, he, he does it find. <laughs> He ripped off his drawers! He ripped off his drawers, bro! Did you see Boy, you couldn't hit the button, boy! <coughs> it wasn't going back! That nigga ripped off his drawers! But I'm sure he'll get over it just like last time. SpongeBob betrayed us! I'm sorry I ever started this stupid fan club in the first place! Patchy has a full on mental breakdown. Now, eventually, oh, he does find he the real lost episode and goes back to normal, <laughs> but this is just the start of Patchy's transformation into a much darker just character. Stuff is building In the up. season 6 episode, okay. Truth or Square, up. Patchy throws a massive television extravaganza to celebrate 10 years of Spongebob. There okay. is a ton of production value and celebrities that Patchy managed to get. There is no Whoa, way Spongebob what? would show up for When was that? That was the broad What? Right. Spongebob Squarepants! What do you mean he's not coming? Ten years I've been president in his fan club! And he didn't show has up. dedicated That's ten crazy. years of his life to Spongebob, and he can't even be bothered to show up once. Mm. And this never even gets resolved in the episode either. Mm. Patchy tries to find Spongebob, thinks he's about to meet him, but then it turns out it was all just a dream. Mister, are you okay? Dang. Thanks. What did he fell through the roof? No, it's just me. The guy in the penny. Patchy's one-sided obsession with SpongeBob is making him delusional, and this is by no means the last time Patchy will hallucinate meeting SpongeBob. In Atlantis Square Pantis, Patchy gets lost in the desert and once again hallucinates SpongeBob. Uh oh! And almost Here ate his parrot. Hallucination. But he knows it. He's cognizant. It. It's me, SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> Who did they get to do that? <laughs> but wow. then, in SpongeBob's big birthday blowout, mm -hmm. it seems like he finally really does meet SpongeBob. From your biggest fan. Huh? I have a fan? Ah, surprise! <laughs> it's Patchy the Pirate! <laughs> Happy birthday, SpongeBob! Thank you, Patchy. But even if they don't explicitly say it, this is definitely another hallucination. It's right after he crashed into an island, and he's just a severed head for some reason, and he can breathe underwater. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna say yeah. that this is a- And the yeah. fact that Spongebob knows who he is. Yeah. Hallucination. Yeah. They have another alleged meeting in Spongebob's Road to Christmas special, but this time Patchy's fully animated for some reason, so I'm pretty skeptical about this one too. In fact, I'm gonna come back to this one. Keep okay. it in mind because it's gonna be very important later on. Okay, so, as much as Patchy worships SpongeBob and wants to meet him, he never will. And you don't have to take my word for it either. In a 2009 WonderCon panel with some of the actors and creators of SpongeBob, they talk about the rules they have for writing the show, including the fact that Patchy can never meet SpongeBob. His character is, has evolved into this pirate that's obsessed with SpongeBob. But he doesn't realize never... that SpongeBob is a character and he can Wait, never meet him. They said it. Wait, time they, out, they time out. It. This is this, bro. I I kind of hate Alex because he's really good at this. The fa like, bro, he dug this up. That's crazy. That was crazy. Right? Well, no, yeah, they can never meet. There's, there's there's a lot of rules in SpongeBob which are there for a reason. 
part of success in a way. From the very start of his creation, <coughs> they doomed Patchy to be an obsessed fan who would never meet his idol. He will spend Man, the rest of, of his not. life devoted to SpongeBob, but no Man. matter how hard he tries, he will never reach <laughs> Bikini Bottom, Man. and he will never meet SpongeBob. Sad. And unfortunately, Sad. that is the tragic story of Patchy the Pirate. But if all of that's true, then I just have one lingering question. Okay. How come the dumpster behind the Krusty Krab huh? has a message that huh? reads Patchy was what? here? Don't go anywhere because the time traveling ghost pirate is about to get crazy. Is there some type of SpongeBob community that just points out all this stuff? Has to be. Ooh, that was a bad scar. Ooh, he poked him, poked him. Reminds me of Facebook. You might want to get that checked out by a doctor. <laughs> For the SpongeBob band. <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. That chromatic operation. Uh oh. Uh -oh. I wonder if that was in post or if he had like a Ronin, M like not a Ronin, but an aperture MC in the fridge. What are you about to make? Are you high? You high on Octopussy? He got the munchies, bro. He got the munchies. That's crazy. That's all. He didn't want to waste the milk. milk. He just took the cap off. Oh, he did waste the milk. Never mind. No, he didn't. He drunk it, though. Milk is kind of nasty when you think about it. Depends on how, how, where I'm at in life. You better not. You, you better okay, not. Liver King. <laughs> Liver King beating it raw? Yes. Oh. Don't you do it! Alex. What if he's becoming his muse? Oh, oh, oh. Is that watermelon? I hope that's watermelon. Or, or that's salmon. Watermelon, that would be crazy. Watermelon. I wouldn't even eat salmon raw. I wouldn't even do that. Yeah. Well, if he eats sushi, he eats salmon raw. I mean, that could be watermelon. Okay. I'm telling you, Alex is the king of second storyline. I love this guy. I'll Look. come back to this message later, but first we have to talk about the mysterious origins of the Flying Dutchman. Right, right, the Flying right, Dutchman right, right. is the legendary ghost pirate that haunts Bikini Bottom. In a pirate ship, the Flying Dutchman descends on Bikini Bottom. The first time we hear about the Flying Dutchman is in the episode Squibber the Unfriendly Ghost, when SpongeBob finds a comic book about his origins. It's the origin of the Flying Dutchman. It says when he died, they used his body as a window display. Now Damn. he haunts the seven seas because he was never Dang. put to rest. Now, I've always Dang. been a little skeptical about this origin, not just because it's claiming they put an actual human corpse up That's as display up. in a kid's store, but because the Flying Dutchman himself contradicts it. Hmm, it's a little torn. Of course, it was the shirt I was buried in. He was never put to rest. If he was mm. buried, then this origin can't be true. Mm. So, who is the Flying Dutchman actually? Well, when I rewatched all the episodes with the Flying Dutchman, I kept noticing that he seems to have some kind of fixation with SpongeBob in particular. In the episode Shanghai, he drops <coughs> his anchor on SpongeBob's home, which leads to him having to briefly join the Dutchman's crew. Then, in Born Again Krabs, he's about to take Mr. Krabs' soul, but then immediately changes his mind when SpongeBob offers his soul mm. instead. And even in the Camp Coral prequel show, he haunts SpongeBob as a kid. But strangest of all, in Ghost Host, the Dutchman's ship gets destroyed, and out of all going? the places in Bikini Bottom he could stay, he it's decides to stay house. with SpongeBob. I remember My this. location where I'll be staying? Business or residence? Residence. Mm. And look at the way he the mischievously situation. smiles when he sees SpongeBob. It feels like this is personal for him. It but is. Why? The episode Ghost Host is actually the first time we get a bit more depth of the Flying Dutchman's character. At first, he spends all of his time torturing Spongebob, but eventually, he just wants to stay and hang out with him. Maybe stay with a friend for a while. 
Just for a little while longer. Even though his ship's already been repaired for three months. Actually, I have a confession, SpongeBob. Oh, damn. My ship's been done for three months now. Oh. It feels like the Dutchman has some kind of vendetta against SpongeBob specifically, but also, deep down, he's just he's, lonely yep, and he wants just to be, be his SpongeBob's friend. friend. And does that remind you of anyone? Someone no. who's desperate to be SpongeBob's friend, but also mm. has a deep resentment towards him. Still feel like a reach. Okay, but. There's like a bunch of reasons why the Flying Dutchman couldn't be the ghost of Patchy the Pirate. Yeah. I mean, for starters, yeah, they exists. look totally different, yes. right? Different shirt, different hat, and most importantly, the Dutchman doesn't have the iconic hook and eye patch that Patchy does. This is the point where I was about to give up and scrap this theory, but then I decided to rewatch the season one episode, ARG, where SpongeBob plays a board game called The Flying Dutchman's Treasure that's right. actually based on The Flying Dutchman's real map. The Flying Dutchman's Treasure Hunt. <coughs> based on a real treasure map. And then I noticed something. One of the game cards actually shows a picture of the Flying Dutchman. I mean, look, he clearly has the same nose and face as him, but this looks like a picture of when he was still alive and had a darker okay. black beard. But the okay. hat he's wearing is not the usual Flying Dutchman of hat. Of course not. It is the exact same hat Patchy the Pirate wears. Okay. okay. But he still doesn't have the eye patch and the hook hand, right? True. Well, yeah. He but wouldn't. Here's the thing. Neither does Patchy. Yeah, Patchy's he's, hook it's, it's is like, always switching hands, fake. and he constantly takes off his eye patch because Patchy isn't a real pirate. He's, yeah, he's just pretending human. to be one. The great thing about Patchy is that he lives in Encino, California, <laughs> <laughs> but he's a pirate. But the only thing that makes him a pirate is that he says he's one and dresses like one. Exactly. <laughs> okay, fine, but but the shirt, the shirt is still very different. You know, the, the really. Dutchman's is all open and it's got those stripey things. Patchy's is more fancy with the big white puffy collar and cuffs. Yeah. Well, in the Curse of Bikini Bottom, we see the Flying Dutchman's closet and he pulls out the exact same mm. shirt that Patchy wears. Mm. Same fancy puffy collar, same cuffs. <sighs> Fine, okay? Maybe Patchy the Pirate really. and the Dutchman look the same. We're going but with it. that doesn't... No, because they, they... Bro, all pirates wore the same thing. All And Blackbeard was a real pirate. His beard was black. So it, the Flying Dutchman could be Blackbeard. <laughs> or Davy Jones. Uh, who knows? Or Jack Sparrow. That's yeah. that's who it is. Or it's Patchy. Jack Sparrow. Or it's Johnny or Depp. Patchy. It's Johnny Depp. the same person. It's time we address the elephant in the room. What's that? The Flying Dutchman can't be Patchy's ghost because Patchy is alive at the same time we see the Flying Dutchman. Like, in order for this theory to be true, Patchy would have to die and then the Dutchman's ghost would show up. But they're yeah. simultaneously existing at the same time. Patchy even shows up during an episode all about the Flying Dutchman and he even calls it his favorite episode. We're gonna see me favorite show, Shanghai! Ta-da! It is physically impossible right, for Patchy right, right, and the Dutchman right, right. to be the same person. But there's a twist. <laughs> or is it? Things are about to get stranger. What you got? Thank you once again for supporting us at Happy Meat Farms. Together, we're building a better future. Cut! Um, let's move on. Why this mother look phenomenal? The production quality out the God roof! Damn, Alex. Hey, Victoria. Uh, I tried to work things out with the muse, like you said, and then I'm pretty sure it, like, bit me or something, and now I'm, like, feeling really weird and craving raw meat. Uh, could you just call me back, please? I'm starting to freak out a little bit. Where have you been? I've been trying to call you all day. Hey, sorry, I'm at work. Okay, so like the muse like bit me, I think, and now I'm like craving raw meat and- Yeah, I know, I got your messages. Just calm down. This is a good thing. How Why? is this a good thing? just How is this a good thing? It's almost over. Okay, here's what I need you to do. Uh oh. The lighting, man. She knows the secret. The framing. I love this guy work. It's amazing. It's about time. Oh, it's about time. Man. When I rewatched all the episodes with the Flying Dutchman, I noticed something strange. In the season seven episode, The Curse of Bikini Bottom, the Dutchman gets a girlfriend, but starts to freak <laughs> out when she wants to get married. She wants to marry me! 
I ain't the Marion type. But the Dutchman not being the Marion type isn't entirely true. Back in season three during Ghost Host, we see that the Dutchman was once married. Is that a wedding ring? Uh oh, this shows nothing. All right, but so what? You know, yeah, this just seems gonna... like a small continuity error between seasons. No surprise for SpongeBob. But in the season six special, SpongeBob vs. the Big One, there's an mm -hmm. even stranger mm -hmm. moment like this. The Flying Dutchman bumps into Mr. Krabs and says this to him. Ah, he's a Flying Dutchman! Ah, he's some guy I've never seen before! But you've seen him before. He says he's never met Mr. Krabs before, but there are it's two obvious. whole episodes from previous seasons dedicated yeah. to the Dutchman trying to it's steal Mr. Krabs' soul for it's being too greedy. They're even on a first name basis. <laughs> Eugene Krabs! He's some guy I've never seen before! Alright, so another weird inconsistency with a Dutchman, but I'm st I had to grab a bite to eat. I'm starving, alright? So f it. fuck the rest of us, huh? Uh, yeah. They hungry, Don't not convinced that it's not just lazy writing, but back in The Curse of Bikini Bottom, there's a moment that cannot be written off as another continuity error. SpongeBob and Patrick accidentally shave off the Dutchman's beard, and the Dutchman claims the beard won't grow back for another thousand years. Your beard will just grow back. You know nothing of my facial hair! It'll take a thousand years for my beard to grow back! Hey. But by the end of the episode, we cut to several months later, and his beard is back. The curse will wear off when my beard grows back. Back. Several months later. She wants to marry me! It's not like this is just some plot point they forgot about between episodes. This several months later is in the same episode mm. where the Dutchman says the beard takes a thousand years to grow back. It'll take a thousand years for my beard oh. to grow back! Every Time is months different. Later. Why the Time fuck would they include this line if they were just gonna contradict? And like, why the fuck? <laughs> Calm down, Alec! a few minutes later in the same goddamn episode. They even blatantly mention that it's several months later twice, as if they're trying to make you realize how inconsistent it is. Several months later. Well, here we are several months later. So what does any of this mean? Why are the writers of SpongeBob intentionally making the Flying Dutchman as inconsistent as possible? Well, the only way that this makes sense to me is if we're seeing the Flying Dutchman non-chronologically. And by that I mean the Flying Dutchman is time traveling. Just, just bear with me for a second. For SpongeBob, only several months have passed, but for the Dutchman, it actually was a thousand years later. The Dutchman didn't recognize Mr. Krabs in season six because for him, this is the first time they've met. And from his perspective, the episodes where he tries to take Mr. Krabs' soul haven't happened yet. The Dutchman's not the marrying type in season seven, but he probably actually does end up getting married to the giant monster. And that's why we see him with a ring in season four, because the past is the future for the flying Dutchman. Okay. Whoa, 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 whoa. How are you gonna make okay, this work? Okay, let's uh let's calm down for Cause this uh, yeah, this is like time is linear. Time is linear. Even though they've shown time travel before in SpongeBob, how the hell is he just traveling through time willy nilly? Because if he went to one part first. How? Time travel. What you mean? How bro? how is he time traveling, Michael? I don't know. He about to That that's that's what I'm saying. It don't if make he's sense. He's time traveling, he's time traveling. What you mean? Time, but that don't make traveling. sense. The only way he what if you say his ship is a time machine, Alex, I'm gonna fucking fight you. Second there, Alex. This time travel idea does fix a lot of problems with the Dutchman's continuity, but claiming a character has time travel powers is a major leap. I I'm mean, saying. don't get me wrong, the Flying Dutchman is a very powerful ghost. He can teleport, he can shapeshift, he can grant wishes, but we've never seen him manipulate time. You get three wishes. Wishes? I wish we had known that earlier. Okay, you got two wishes left. Huh. Okay, so the Dutchman's time traveling. And you know what this means? The Flying Dutchman could absolutely be the ghost of Patchy the Pirate. And I'm gonna prove it. Let's see it! Prove it. Prove it, Alexander. If that's your real name. <laughs> <laughs> that thing got you looking <sighs> fucked up, my boy. He tired of your stuff. Help me fund my film. Help me fund mine. Oh, hey, Alex. What's up? Hey, Wes. Uh, sorry for just barging in on you like this. Um, I was actually wondering maybe if you'd want to watch my new SpongeBob theory, maybe give me some feedback. Dude, yeah, absolutely. I love those videos. Come on, man. How's the uh, film thing going? Nice. Oh, you know, uh, funding's a nightmare. Sure, figure it out. Um, so just uh, 
give it a watch. Tell me what you think. And uh, is it cool if I use your bathroom? Yeah, no problem. It's, it's just right through there. So Cool. Uh, I guess enjoy. All right. So this time, instead of ending with the big twist, I'm just going to open it. The final Dutchman is the... Oh, he's leaving it there. He's, he's giving him a muse. Mm. <coughs> So she left it with him? I don't know what I'm thinking. That's best that's messed up. Oh, I love lighting like this. It's so hard to practically light like this. Like, like I've been struggling trying to figure out how to light a certain scene. And lighting like this is so freaking difficult. Now you see. Throw it up. So, if Patchy the Pirate eventually becomes the Flying Dutchman, that means at some point in the future, Patchy is going to die. Also, Except, how does it get here's the thing. I think Patchy is already dead in present day, and mm? we have already seen his death on screen. Mm? Remember that Christmas special I told you would be important later on? It's the season 13 episode Spongebob's Road to Christmas, and as of recording this, it's the latest episode in the Spongebob timeline. Spongebob does meet Patchy in this episode, but for some reason he's fully animated instead of using the usual live action style. Ahoy, Spongebob and Patrick! It's me, Patchy the Pirate! It honestly feels kind of creepy for some reason, especially since the creators themselves said that Patchy can never meet Spongebob. Well, they can never meet, right? Well, no, yeah, they, they can, can never, meet. never meet. Is it possible that this isn't the real Patchy? Well, the last time we saw live-action Patchy was in Spongebob's Big Birthday Blowout, and that episode ended with him being fired out of a cannon and crashing into an island. Oh, oh that's where he died. <laughs> Immediately after that, Patchy's severed head shows up and meets Spongebob. But I already explained how this is clearly just another hallucination, and he's probably just gonna wake up on the island disappointed that he didn't actually meet Spongebob like every other time. But what if this is something more than just a simple dream that he can wake up from? I mean, the Whoa. last shot we saw Whoa. of the real Patchy was Whoa. him and Potty face down in the sand Whoa. struggling to get out. What if they didn't? And this is what Patchy is hallucinating as he dies. During this hallucination, he begins singing the show's theme song with Spongebob to wrap up the episode. Oh, who's having a birthday under the sea? Me, 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 me. But as they're singing, we briefly cut to this horrifying shot of Patchy's body with Potty's head lying on the island, violently convulsing in pain. Yo! It happened so quick that I didn't even process it the first time. But goddamn, that is some terrifying Whoa. imagery for a kid's show. Why the fuck did they show this? Is this some kind of PG symbolic way to show Patchy and Potty suffocating to death in the sand? Holy shit! <sighs> okay, so <laughs> let's up. say Patchy and Potty, the host of the SpongeBob SquarePants television show, <laughs> what happens now? Well, the show must go on. The SpongeBob SquarePants television show has to continue without him, but they need a new host to replace Patchy. Except, are they really gonna tell their young audience that their beloved Patchy the Pirate and Potty the Parrot are dead? No. no, they're gonna replace them with animated actors. And they're using actors. <gasps> hey, that's showbiz for you. But what happened to the real Patchy after he died? Well, he became a ghost and could finally meet his idol SpongeBob, except when he goes to Bikini Bottom, what would he see? Spongebob and all of his friends partying without him. Patchy dedicated his entire life to Spongebob. He even died for him. And Spongebob never even knew Patchy Damn. existed. And that resentment that's been building up inside of Patchy for all of these years finally explodes. And this is how Patchy the Pirate becomes the Flying Dutchman. Patchy is done pretending to be a pirate and dressing up in his fake costumes. He gets a new look, a new identity, and now he can finally live out the fantasy of being a real pirate. Remember that board game that they said was based on a real map from the right, Flying right. Dutchman? Based on a real treasure map! We never really did see the map that it was based on, 
Or did we? Remember when Patchy was looking for the lost Spongebob episode? He used this map to find it. Now at first I thought these two maps didn't look all that similar, but the more I looked at it, the more my mind was blown. Same red X in the middle, you got the compass, mm -hmm. the palm trees, mm -hmm. a turtle, mm -hmm. a fish, mm -hmm. but most importantly, they both have the forked tree. Half a league to the forked tree. Look for the deacon's goose through the fork in the old tree. That is oh a very specific God. detail. You would not just That's see that on crazy, any random map. Dude. The flying Dutchman based his map. How the hell bro. do they write this stuff? It's crazy. Like, 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 like it's insane. It, I'm, I'm just going for, you know, Idiosyncrasy idiots. I'm going for idiots. I'm going to see SpongeBob flip some cheeseburgers. <laughs> and this is yeah, right. <laughs> God off damn. of the one from his past. So he's become the Flying Dutchman now, and his main target for haunting is, of course, the one who ignored him his entire life, SpongeBob SquarePants. But how did Patchy become such a powerful ghost who can even manipulate time itself? <coughs> exactly. Well, there's actually an episode in season 12 called The Ghost of Plankton that gives us a pretty clear understanding of how ghost powers work. It basically just takes time and effort to grow your powers. Patchy's already given SpongeBob 20 years of dedication, might as well go a little further with it as the Dutchman. Patchy travels back in time to visit all of his favorite, most cherished SpongeBob episodes, including his favorite episode, Shanghai. Yep. We're gonna see me favorite show, Shanghai! Except now, now, he's not just watching the episode, he's the one in control, and he's gonna make Spongebob pay for everything he's done, and he's gonna make him pay over and over and over again. But then, we get to the episode, Ghost Host. Patchy initially moves in with Spongebob to torture him, but as much as he tries to deny it, Deep down, he's to be still that devoted fanboy who just mm -hmm. wants Spongebob to be his friend. As much as he wants to pretend to be the Dutchman, Dang. deep down, Patchy is still here. And that is why, if you go to the Krusty Krab after closing, and you go out the back to the dumpster, you can still read the words, Patchy was here. Yes, he certainly was. And this that, ladies insane. and gentlemen, is the time-traveling no ghost sense. pirate theory. Thank you very much. Oh! What about Potty? He died with Patchy too, right? What, what the hell happened to him? He just added the uh, box. Uh, I, I can figure this out. Just give me a second. Let me just quickly rewatch every single episode of SpongeBob. Ba 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 ba. Gotta watch the spinoffs too. Okay, let me see. The mother ate him! Oh. I wonder what parrot tastes oh. like! That is the time traveling ghost pirate theory, baby! I am done! Oh. Whoa. See ya! Whoa! Hey, yo! Whoa! Thank you again so much for watching. This was an especially tough one to figure out, but hey, I think it all came together in the end. If you haven't already, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and hit the bell icon for notifications. I've been your host, the SpongeBob guy, and I Okay, but he died in your basement giving you that action. <laughs> giving you that work. He died in the, uh, our attic. Hey, Alex. I finished the theory. Pretty good stuff, man. <laughs> you thought he was taking a poo? You doing okay in there? Get in there, boss. Interesting looking back. Oh, great there, shot! Great ass shot! Oh my god, that's a great shot! That is that's a great. Oh my fuck. Alex! I love you! Alex! Alex! Alex? Alex? Oh my god. Oh. Hi, Wesley. What are you doing down here? What do we see? Sorry. I must have got lost. Mm. Th that's okay. Uh, I, I finished the video. What'd you think? What's on his Good. eye? Hey, is, is everything okay? No, not... Oh, okay, nothing's on his eye. Is everything okay? Why wouldn't everything be okay? I mean, come on, dude. You're... You're acting weird. You know, you're right. I have been... feeling weird lately. Wesley, I have a... confession to make. I didn't come here to... show you a video. What did you come here to do? Well, why are you here? What's going on? Whoa. To help you. Oh my goodness. Oh, thank okay. you. 
Uh, give me I'm the sorry. muse. I'll take it. <laughs> I will take it. <laughs> Is he just putting hey, the muse in um, a trash can? Sorry he about he just threw all it that. Uh, I think I'm coming down with something. Sorry, right, man. Uh, I'll clean it up. Uh, but you should probably go, though. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll go. Um, sorry you again. just threw it up. Just... Just see the day for night. Well, the night for day. You, you, it's, no, not, it's not daytime anymore. They're making it seem like it's. That looks like lights through the window and not sunshine. It's like they, you know, they filmed too late. Yeah, she gave it to him. He gave it to her. He gave it to him. him. How you feeling? Like my stomach just got pumped. You'll feel better soon. She's a sneaky. I wouldn't she trust her. She gave all. it to him. Yeah. He gave She's, it to yeah, him. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. I don't know how to feel about what I did. I get it. But you did the right thing. And soon you won't have to worry about your muse at all. Escaped. Yeah, go find that film, my boy. Man, it, it, go find that film, me boy. It'll be hard as hell if it was me and that bitch and those others on me. I'm like, oh, yeah. hey, hey, Alex, we need to do that. Oh, my. Turn it up. Did you I like the, uh, the haircut, by the way. Thanks. Yeah. Long hair just didn't really feel like me. Thanks again for, you know, talking me through all this. Um, glad I don't have to deal with it on my own anymore. Yeah. I mean, I get how weird it all is. See you. Yeah, she gave it to you, buddy. You must have given someone else some news, too, right? Did you give me my muse? Yeah. 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 You needed help. I knew it. It worked. Of didn't course. It? <clears throat> of course. Good night, Victoria. It never lived. It never. It never left. It, it never left. Well done. That's great.